Hi guys, how are you all? I hope you all are doing great. Yes, so this video is mainly about the company law revision lecture as you can see here on the screen also. Uh, in approximately 8 hours, in approximately 8 hours we are going to uh, revise the entire company law the entire company law applicable for the november 2020 examinations we are going to do in these eight hours it is going to be chapter wise almost each and every chapter is going to be covered in the revision lecture yes and uh, as you must all have already seen the allied laws lecture in the same pattern in the same pattern the company law revision lecture is going to be there it is going to be in 100 percent english basic english understandable english language it is there and i have taken this particular lecture from the fifth edition book the latest book which is applicable for the november 2020 examinations i have taken the lecture from here itself if you have the 5th edition book, it's the best because uh, you will be easily able to correlate it from the book. If you do not have and if you wish to buy, if you wish to buy, then in that case, you can just go to the website uh, www.arpitatulsan.com and you can opt for the 5th edition from there. Right? From this particular book, from this particular 5th edition book, I have taken the entire revision lecture, entire company law getting revised, getting revised in merely 8 hours. Right? So, I hope you all enjoy, I hope you all enjoy this particular revision lecture and if it was helpful for you, do let me know, do let me know that whether this lecture was uh, helpful and useful for you or not. Thank you so much guys, all the best, enjoy, continue with the lectures now. Let's start with the super quick revision. Let's start with the super quick revision of NCLT, NCLAT. Uh, first of all, NCLT, NCLAT, full form is National Company Law Tribunal, National Company Law Appellate Tribunal. This is the full form of the chapter. Now we are into, we are into the company law, right? We are into the company law. So we are going to study, we are going to study the appeal procedure. We are going to study the appeal procedure of the company law, right? The first authority here is the NCLT. Next level of authority would be NCLAT. And the last level of authority, last level of authority would be Supreme Court, right? NCLT, NCLAT, it operates in form of benches. Right? It is going to have, NCLT is going to have a person as its head called as president within whom it is going to have judicial members as well as technical members. Okay. Similarly, for the NCLAT, the person who is the head of the NCLAT is the chairperson and it is going to have two categories of members within it that is the judicial member and the technical members. Okay. Then. Your uh, president of the NCLT and the chairperson of the NCLT, even these two, even these two would be deemed to be your judicial members only. Means even they are expected to have the uh, knowledge pertaining to law. After that, after that, few provisions from section number 408 to section number 419, few provisions have been totally omitted by your ICAI in between. Going on to the next section, whenever there is any case which is pending before the NCLT, Okay, whenever there is any case which is pending before the NCLT, that case has to be disposed of by the NCLT, disposed of by the NCLT within a period of uh, three months, within a period of three months from the date of the appeal and in, uh, if, if there is some sufficient cause that the appeal could not be completed or the appeal could not be disposed of within a period of three months, then the president that is the head of the NCLT can by reasons recorded in writing, it can allow the members to dispose of the appeal by granting an extension of maximum period of 90 days, right? So in all, the appeal has to be disposed of within three months plus an extended period of 90 days. This point I have taken, this point I have taken from section number 422, which is talking about disposal of appeal, disposal of appeal by the NCLT. Okay, and once the NCLT, once the NCLT has passed any order, once the NCLT has passed any order, if there is any mistake which is apparent from record, which is which can be uh, easily seen in the order which was passed by the tribunal, then the parties can apply to the tribunal within a period of two years and the tribunal can maximum rectify it within a period of two years from the date of passing the order. Okay, tribunal can rectify such mistake which was apparent from record so that, so that you know this rectification provision is given here so that it does not result in repetitive appeals. 
just because of a mistake which is apparent from a record once an order is passed by the tribunal okay once an order is passed by the tribunal after that after that the matter goes to after that the matter goes to the nclat okay if any party is aggrieved by the order passed by the nclat then the appeal can be filed before the nclat right the appeal can be filed before the nclat within a period of 45 days okay within 45 days we can go and file an appeal before the nclat and this time period can be extended this time period can be extended by another period of 45 days if there is a sufficient cause okay if there is a sufficient cause then this particular time period can be extended and after that once within 45 plus 45 days once the appeal is filed then the nclat should also dispose of the appeal within the same time period as was applicable to the nclt that is within 3 months plus extension of 90 days if the chairperson of the nclat is satisfied now okay if the chairperson of the nclat is satisfied then in that case the appeal may be disposed of accordingly and whenever the nclat disposes of the appeal nclat has to make sure that it has given reasonable opportunity of being heard to all the parties concerned and then either it can confirm the order or it can modify the order or it can set aside the order of the nclat right these are the powers available with the nclat once the nclat passes any order after that if we are aggrieved then we can go and file an appeal to the supreme court okay then we can go and file an appeal to the supreme court once we go and file an appeal to the supreme court that has to be done within a period of 60 days plus maximum another extension of 60 day period if if there is any sufficient cause and the appeal can be filed only on question of law okay the appeal can be filed only on matters involving question of law okay till year till year basically till section number 423 all the sections were important okay all the sections were important till section number 423 because we were getting some or the other conclusions from from each and every section now going on to the miscellaneous provisions now going on to the miscellaneous provisions nclt nclat they are again they have all the powers as uh, vested in a civil code okay they at least have all those powers which are there in the civil code but they are not just bound by those powers okay it is not just bound it is not just restricted to the code of civil procedure it has got it is regulated by its own procedure so it can have some more powers also okay just like i said that it has all the powers as vested in a civil code except for search and seizure okay except for search and seizure and every proceeding which is going on every proceeding which is going on before the nclt nclat that will be deemed to be a judicial proceed okay just like earlier just like earlier high court used to regulate the clb okay earlier uh, that is before this uh, you know nclt etc was notified before that just like high court used to regulate the clb similarly now also the high court is going to regulate the nclt and the nclat right nclt nclat it has got many work under the law it has got work under the company law it has got work under even the ibc 2016 so it can delegate its powers to any other person okay it can delegate to its employees officers or to any other person right and all these people who are sitting in the nclt all these people who are sitting in the nclat officers managers etc all these are deemed to be public servant okay all these are deemed to be what all these are deemed to be public servant as per the indian penal code this we have studied already before in our allied law then going on to the next one going on to the next one that is protection of action taken in good faith protection of action taken in good faith is if suppose any of these people any of the nclt people any of the nclat people if there is some mistake which is done by them and if they prove that this mistake was not done uh, uh, sorry this mistake was done in good faith means it was done unknowingly etc then we cannot initiate any legal proceedings against them okay we cannot initiate any legal proceedings against them if they prove that this mistake was done in good faith okay whenever in the law whenever in the company law or whenever in the ibc if the nclt or nclat wants to take the possession of our assets or of our books of accounts of any document then it can take the help of that local police okay that is it can take the help of chief metropolitan magistrate it can take the help of chief judicial magistrate or it can take the help of district collector and they shall be bound to provide the necessary assistance to the nclt or to the nclat again same provision again same provision we have been doing since surface chapter right then going on to the next section that is civil code not to have any jurisdiction again a common provision 
if we want to go under the company law we have been given a particular hierarchy nclt nclit etc we can go only to them so basically we cannot uh, you know divert and we cannot go to the civil court nor the civil court can interfere in between in the company law matter right then suppose if there is any vacancy suppose if there is any vacancy in the nclt in the nclit etc then or if there is any defect in the appointment of the persons in the nclt or nclit then in that case it is not going to affect okay it is not going to affect any decisions which have been taken by other persons it is not going to affect any decisions taken by the other persons the decision taken by others will still be valid okay and if we do not know how to represent if we do not know how to represent before the nclt and see if we know then we can go before the proceedings which are happening in the nclt or nclit if we do not know we can appoint any other person we can appoint any other person we can appoint ca cs cost auditor cost accountant or we can appoint any legal practitioner for representing on our behalf before the nclt or the nclit right and whenever wherever in the entire law okay wherever in the entire law or wherever we are talking about the appeals etc suppose if there is no time period specified suppose if there is no time period specified anywhere then in that case we will take the time period from the limitations act right even this was a common proceedings which we have studied earlier and then coming on to the last section that is section number that is section number 434 section number 434 which was talking about the transitional provision CLB was dissolved and NCLT and NCLT were notified with effect from 1st June 2016 right from 1st June 2016 as written here as mentioned here from 1st June 2016 your NCLT NCLT came into picture so all the matters which were earlier pending okay all the matters which were earlier pending before the CLB all those matters will now get transferred to the NCLT okay if there was any matter in the old law which was reserved for the high court that will still be dealt by the high court only if there was any order which was passed by the clb earlier already order was passed then in that case if you want to go and file any appeal against that then that can be filed before the high court since the order was already passed by the clb so if you want to go and file an appeal then you can go and file an appeal before the high court within 60 plus 60 right and the last one last point here is suppose if any voluntary liquidation any voluntary liquidations notice was given under the uh, uh, old law or the earlier law okay any voluntary liquidation notice if it was already given as per the old law and no dissolution order was passed before 1st april 2017 okay uh, if no uh, dissolution order was passed up to 1st april 2017 then in that case then in that case that particular dissolution or that particular liquidation will still be dealt will still be dealt as per the old law because if there is any new notice given under uh, given after 1st april 2017 then that goes totally under your ibc okay ibc section number 59 which talks about the voluntary liquidation I hope I am very very clear till here, and the chapter was a super simple chapter. Let's start. Let's start with a super quick revision of this chapter. Companies incorporated outside India. First of all, the most important thing here is about which companies are we talking about? We are talking about the foreign companies. Foreign companies, which is defined in two forty two, which is defined in section two clause forty two. uh three things three things are to be fulfilled three things everyone just try to recollect in your mind three things which are to be fulfilled so that that particular company can be termed as a foreign company first of all first of all that company should be incorporated that company should be incorporated outside india next that company should have a place of business in india that company should have a place of business in india either by itself or through an agent or by electronic mode by any mode it should have a place of business in india and the last one it should conduct it should conduct a bus some business activity in india it should conduct some business activity in india if all these conditions are fulfilled if all these conditions are fulfilled then that particular company can be called as a uh, foreign company as per section number 2 okay again, now electronic mode means it can be any b2b transactions any b2c transactions any uh, online marketing any 
ट्रांजेक्शन्स डन थ्रू सोशल मीडिया वेबसाइट्स ईमेल मोबाइल्स एक्सेट्रा एनी सच ट्रांजेक्शन्स विच कम अंडर द परव्यू ऑफ इलेक्ट्रॉनिक मोड इवन दैट इज अलाउड मीन्स इफ यू आर डूइंग द ट्रांजेक्शन एज फॉर दैट देन इट विल बी डीम्ड एज इफ यू आर हैविंग अ प्लेस ऑफ बिजनेस इन इंडिया वाया दैट इलेक्ट्रॉनिक मोड even in the term place of business even if you have a share transfer office or if you have a share registration office it will be deemed as if you have a place of business in india means your second condition means your second conditions get fulfilled and if you are conducting some business activity in india then it, you will be deemed as a foreign company okay now any company any company will be treated as a foreign company only if the provisions of section 2 clause 42 gets fulfilled not otherwise okay if there is any particular company which is formed by us which is formed by indian citizens outside india does not make that particular company as a foreign company until unless you fulfill the conditions uh, which were required by section 2 clause 42 okay that is the company should be incorporated outside india the company should have a place of business in india and the company should be doing some business activity in india these conditions must be compulsorily fulfilled so as to call that company as a foreign company as per the companies act Okay, if we if we want to call it as a com uh, foreign company as per the Companies Act, then in that case it will be uh, then only it will be treated as a this company. Now in this also in this particular type of foreign company also some things some things some applicability etc depends on some sections also right the applicability depends on some sections also. If there is if there is such a foreign company if there is such a foreign company where more than or equal to more than or equal to 50% of the paid up share capital both equity as well as preference if this is held by indians okay if this is held by indians what do you mean by the term indians here if it is held by if it is held by one or more one or more indian citizens or if it is held by one or more indian companies or if it is held jointly by both okay if more than or equal to 50% of the capital is held by indians right then in that case this particular company then this particular company will be treated then this particular company will be deemed to be an indian company and therefore all the provisions all the provisions of the companies act 2013 would be applicable to it but if this shareholding criteria etc is not there or if it is not met then in that case only some specific sections okay then in that case only some specific sections would be applicable only some specific sections would be applicable to that particular foreign company right with specific section section number as of now they say that section number 380 to section number 386 and section number 392 and section number 393 these sections these sections would be applicable to uh, these foreign company okay this is given where this is given this is given in section number this is given in section number 379 which talks about the applicability okay and in this section itself there was a note given there was a note given that whenever any particular foreign company wants to go or close its operations in india okay whenever any foreign company wants to close its operations in india it simply has to give a notice okay it will just give a notice it will just no it's not written here it's written somewhere else i think if uh, it just closes its business uh, in india then in that case then in that case it has to just give a notice to the roc any particular foreign company when it wants to close its business in india okay then comes section number 380 380 talks about uh, suppose if that foreign company wants to establish an office in india then what is the procedure applicable what is the procedure applicable let's try to understand that procedure whenever whenever a particular foreign company whenever a particular foreign company wants to establish an office in india it has to get itself registered with the roc okay it has to get registered itself with the roc roc which roc roc having jurisdiction over new delhi it is going to take certain documents it has to take certain documents and go to the roc what are those documents what are those documents first thing is it will have to take an application form it will have to take an application form which will be in form number fc1 which will be in form number fc1 along with the prescribed fees right along with the prescribed fees it has to take first of all it will take this application form along with that it will take some list of document that is first one will be the certified copy of the charter document that is moa a whatever is applicable in their own country if that is not in english then a certified translated copy will be taken along with this document another thing another thing that we are going to take is the address the address of the principal place of business or the registered office which is there outside india the full details of the address will be taken then the address of the place of business in india address of the place of business in india that we have to submit to the roc 
then the authorized person the authorized person who is eligible you know to transact on behalf of this company the authorized representative or the person in charge of this foreign company we have to submit his name and we have to submit his address this also we are going to submit it to the roc so four things done till now charter documents address outside india address of india and the details of the authorized person and the next one next one is the details of the personal details of all the directors and the secretary etc that is their name their surname their date of birth their passport number if they are holding any pan if they are a director in the, in any indian company then their din then if they are a director in an indian company then it's sin then their residential address their nationality their email address etc all these things of the directors and the secretary will have to be mentioned will have to be submitted to the roc here then in the past in the past if they had opened or closed any place of business in india then we have to give that details and then any other details as required okay any other details as required and yes one last thing here is we, they have to give a declaration they have to give a declaration that none of the directors etc are convicted or they are restricted they should not be restricted basically from opening any office or any companies in india or outside india this they have to give a declaration that they have never been convicted or they have never been debarred from doing this right so like way this way this way uh total 8 points okay total 8 points we are we had here just let's try to recollect these 8 points here first of all first of all there was a charter document so certified copy of that charter document then the address address of the office outside india address of the indian office then the details of the authorized person the name and address of the authorized person then the personal details personal details of the directors and the secretary then after that the next thing was the next thing was any details of opening and closing any place of business in india earlier then declaration that none of the directors are convicted or debarred and the last one was any other information if it is required by the roc then we have to give it okay all these things along with fc1 plus the fees that will go and submit it to the roc plus along with that we'll have to submit along with that we'll have to submit the copy of the approval copy of the approval that we have we would have obtained from the rbi okay copy of the approval that we would have obtained from the rbi as per the fema act and any other approval if required from any other regulator okay it can be telecom uh, regulatory authority or it can be your uh, fssai or it can be your sebi it can be our rsc if there is any other approval required then we have to submit the copy of that approval also but if there is no such other approval required then you'll have to give a declaration that no other approval is required right all these things all these things we are going going to go and submit to the roc within a period of 30 days from the date of establishment okay whenever you establish your office in india from that day within a period of 30 days you have to go and submit all these things to the roc right whenever you go and submit all these things to the roc you have to pay the required fees that i have already mentioned fc1 will be given plus fees will be paid plus these documents would be submitted then after that after that suppose if later on if there is any changes okay if there is any changes in the data or in the details that we have submitted to the roc then whenever that particular change happened from that day within a period of 30 days we are supposed to go and intimate it to the roc in form number fc2 okay first time application was in form number fc1 and whenever there is any change in the details then it will be form number fc2 we are going to submit form number fc2 within 30 days of the change okay and see yes that note is coming up here whenever you are closing down any business whenever you are closing down the place of business in india then you'll just have to give a notice to the roc and from that day your obligations of submitting any details to the roc etc that totally ceases right now going on to the next one going on to the next one that is accounts accounts of the foreign company and it also talks about the audit of the foreign companies which is given which is given in section number 381 right which is given in section number 381 which says which says that every foreign company okay every foreign company even it is required to maintain its books of accounts if it is required to maintain its books of accounts then in that case it will have to prepare its financials also financials pertaining to the indian operations will have to be prepared and they are telling that this has to be done first of all obviously the financials will be prepared every year right once you prepare the financials etc then in that case that will be prepared that will be prepared as per the provisions of section number 128 to 138 okay that will be prepared as per the provisions of section number 128 to section number 138 so indirectly those sections have also become applicable 
plus along with that uh, once you prepare this financial statements after that you have to get them audited also audit will be done by a normal indian chartered accountant because here we are doing the audit of indian operations so it can be done by it will be done by the indian chartered accountant and for doing the audit the provisions from section number uh, 139 to section number 148 139 to section number 148 would also become applicable okay then the copy of this then the copy of this particular financial statements will also be submitted right we are also going to submit it to the roc this has to be done within a period of 6 months Right, this has to be done within a period of 6 months from close of the financial year and if there is any sufficient cause then we can get an extension of a maximum period of 3 months if there is any sufficient cause. Right, along with this financials, along with this financials every year you are supposed to submit a form number FC3. Okay, along with this financials every year you are supposed to submit form number FC3 which is going to contain the list, list of all the other place of business which is there in India. Suppose if you have multiple place of business in India, then that list will be given in form number FC3. So since that gets submitted along with your financials, it will be done on every yearly basis. Okay, along with whenever you are submitting this financial statements, along with that, you also have to submit the details about your related party transactions. You also have to submit the details about repatriation of profits. You also have to submit the details about transfer of funds, etc. These extra things and plus, yes, the consolidated financial statements of the entire company, the CFS of the entire company, okay, that won't be audited by us, but just the copy of that CFS in English language, copy of that particular CFS in English language has to be submitted, right? So that basically they have tried to bring us at par, they have tried to bring us at par with an Indian company, even Indian companies are supposed to submit their financials, right? Similarly, here, even the foreign companies are supposed to submit their financials. Right, going on to the next section which talks about the display of certain things. Now here in the section number 382, uh, yes 382, they are, they are saying that three things, three things have to be displayed mandatorily. <coughs> three things have to be displayed mandatorily. First one, first one is your name of the foreign company. Next one, next one is the country of incorporation. And the third one is fact that the liability is limited. These three things have to be disclosed at two places. We have we had done two bifurcations while studying this. First one is it has to be disclosed outside the place of business. Right? Outside your office, outside your office, it has to be displayed in two languages. One is the English language and another one will be the local language of that particular place. Right? And another thing, it has to be disclosed. It has to be disclosed in the bills, letterheads, documents, etc. Whatever is the office stationery of your particular company, in that you have to disclose it or display it in English language. Right? This is mandatory or just for disseminating the information, just for spreading the information, this is mandatory. Right? Then, going on to the next one, going on to the next one, section number 383, which is a very simple section, which says that whenever the ROC wants to communicate, Okay, whenever the ROC wants to communicate anything with this particular foreign company, then ROC can serve notices, ROC can serve documents, ROC can give orders, ROC can, you know, issue penalty orders, etc. on this particular foreign company at the address, okay, at that particular Indian address and it will be addressed, it will be named, like it will be written to, to whom will it be addressed? It will be addressed to that particular person in charge whose details we had submitted, whose details we had submitted in section number 380. Okay, this notice, this documents etc. can be left at the office of the foreign company or it can be sent by post or it can be sent by any electronic mode. But service of notice, documents etc. can happen. Right, then we had studied section number 384 is a very simple section which was basically talking about a reference of some, some other section. That is, whenever a foreign company issues debentures, Section 71 of the Companies Act would be applicable to it. Whenever any particular foreign company uh, wants to do any CSR activity, Section number 135 would be applicable to it. Whenever it comes to annual return, Section number 92 would be applicable to it. Whenever it comes to inspection, inquiry, investigation, Section number 206 to Section number 229 would be applicable to it. And similarly, they are telling that many of the sections, many of the sections have been referred, means not only section 382, 386, apart from that also, many other sections have been made applicable to this particular foreign company, right? And one point important here is, just like every other Indian company, foreign companies are also supposed to submit some prescribed information in the 
annual returns okay even foreign companies have to file the annual returns in form number fc4 within a period of 60 days from the year end okay financials were supposed to be filed within 6 months plus 3 months annual return is to be submitted within 60 days from the year end and whenever we submit whenever you submitted form fc1 fc2 fc3 fc4 whatever documents you submit to the roc you are supposed to pay the required fees okay you are supposed to pay the required fees this is what we have studied earlier also remember at the time of fc1 i had told you at the time of fc1 i had told you that we have to pay the required fees also then going on to the next section going on to the next section that is section number 387 section number 387 talks about the prospectus that whenever any foreign company okay whenever any foreign company wants to issue wants to issue some securities in india or whenever it wants to raise some funds from india it will have to issue prospectus okay prospectus issuance is mandatory along with that prospectus along with that prospectus your application form must be attached right then along with that in that particular prospectus first of all in that particular prospectus all the matters all the matters as stated all the matters as stated in section number 26 okay all the matters as stated in section number 26 of the companies act that we have to include no doubt in that along with that some extent this is a foreign company some extra matters are also to be specified some extra matters are also to be specified by that particular foreign company okay first one first one is the law under which okay the law under which that company is incorporated okay. then the address where the documents can be inspected the address of the principal office in india if it is different right then the date and the country of incorporation when it was incorporated and where it was incorporated and the last one is the charter document that is your moa aoa kind of document all these things you have to attach all these things you have to attach to the prospectus whenever you are issuing this prospectus to the public you have to make sure that these details are also given to the public right that was your prospectus right then the prospectus should also contain then your prospectus should also contain the experts consent it should also contain the experts consent without which your prospectus is totally nonsense invalid okay so now first of all it should contain your experts consent okay if it does not contain your experts consent or if the expert has withdrawn his consent then the prospectus cannot be issued and it should be written specifically in the prospectus okay it should be written specifically in the prospectus that uh, you know experts consent should be written plus it should be written that i have not withdrawn my consent this thing should be specifically written in that particular prospectus either it can be written in the prospectus itself or a reference to some other place can be given example if you just say you can click on this particular link to view the consent then even that is allowed you are just placing the consent in some other document right then going on to the next one this particular prospectus this particular prospectus we are supposed to register okay we have we have to mandatorily register this prospectus with the roc okay before you give it to the general public you have to register it with the roc so for that what are you going to do okay you will take your entire prospectus on the face of the prospectus first of all you are going to write that it has been registered with the roc and then you will give it to the roc for registration ROC will ask for some more details. Okay, ROC will ask for five details, five details that you have to submit along with the prospectus. Okay, you have to give the uh, uh, details of the contract between the uh, company, between the company and the managing director or the manager or the manager. You have to give the details about all the material contracts which are not entered into ordinary course of business in the last two years. Okay, you have to give the copy of the underwriting agreement. you have to give the copy uh, you have to give the experts consent and you have to give the power of attorney if it is not signed by the designated person okay if your prospectus is not signed by the designated person then you have to give the power of attorney okay now this prospectus has to be signed by whom so first of all this prospectus has to be compulsorily dated and signed okay it has to be signed by whom it will be signed by the chairperson and two other directors if all these conditions if all these conditions are satisfied then in that case you can go and submit your prospectus to the roc for its registration right you can go and submit it to the roc for its registration and then the roc if satisfied it will allow you to issue that prospectus to the general public right then going on to the next concept going on to the next concept where we had studied the concept of idr where we had studied the concept of the idr IDR is also one of the way where the foreign companies where the foreign companies can raise money 
where the foreign company can raise money from the Indian investors, right? Through a depository, through a depository, they can raise the money from the investors. So for that purpose, foreign company will issue its shares to the depository. Depository will keep those shares as security, and the depository will issue the depository receipts to the in Indian investors, which will be denominated in Indian currency. For that, the Indian investors will have to pay. So they will pay to the depository, and the depository will ultimately pass it on to the foreign company. In this way, in this way, foreign company has got has raised the money, and Indian investors have invested their money into the securities which are denominated in Indian currency. For this particular purpose, okay, how to issue the IDRs, when to issue, in what denomination, what will be the rules and regulations pertaining to that, everything will be notified. Everything will be notified by the central government, right? Everything will be notified by the central government by way of your regulations. Okay, that is practically notified in your ICDR. That is practically notified in your ICDR regulations where they have given full description that. when to come with idr when to issue this idr how to issue etc everything has been specified by the central government in the regulation then going on to the next section section number 391 section number 391 has two bifurcations within it uh, 391 section number 391 has got two bifurcations within it one is subsection 1 another one is subsection number 2 subsection 1 says that if there is any misstatement in the prospectus the prospectus which we had studied if there is any misstatement in the prospectus then all the persons okay who have signed this particular prospectus all these persons who have signed this particular prospectus who say that yes the prospectus is correct those persons would be liable as per section number 34 to 36 of the companies act that is civil liability criminal liability and punishment for inducing any persons to invest these would be these, these liabilities these punishments would be applicable on all those persons right and then going on to section number 391 subsection 2 which is a very simple yet a uh, important section which says that if suppose any foreign company has raised money from india okay if any foreign company has raised the money from india and now it has defaulted in its repayment in its redemption etc then we can do its winding up as per chapter number 20 of the companies act okay because we want to now safeguard our indian investors so winding up of this particular company can happen this is told by section number 391 subsection 2 okay then going on to the next section section number 392 is a very important section very very important section because penalty from this particular chapter is tested okay i never say to by heart each and every penalty but the one which i am telling you you don't have to compromise in that okay section number 392 says that if any foreign company fails to comply with the provisions of this particular chapter then a fine would be applicable on it that is ranging between rupees 1 lakh to rupees 3 lakh if it still continues to do offense after a particular warning or after a particular date then additional fine would be applicable which can go up to 50000 per day if any officer in charge if any person in charge of that particular foreign company is liable then in that case they will be liable to fine which will be ranging between 25000 to rupees 5 lakhs or imprisonment up to 6 months or with both this can be applicable this can be applicable on that particular person and the company and this will be over and above the punishment which was given in section number 391 that is over and above that 34 to 36 over and above that section number 392 can be applicable okay and if there is a particular foreign company if there is a particular foreign company which is a defaulting foreign company then then in that case till the time it is a defaulting foreign company okay it will have to uh, it cannot first of all it cannot sue any other person okay it cannot claim any set off in respect of its debt it cannot start any legal proceedings against any other person it cannot initiate any legal suits against some other person and whatever contract it has entered into that contract will still be valid means it will have to this defaulting foreign company will still have to exercise the provisions of that particular contract right then the last section the last section here which i have just given for reference that is section number 376 which says that if suppose the principal office of the company if suppose the principal office of the company outside india has been closed has been dissolved then in that case the office which is there in india even that has to be closed down okay we'll have to wind up this particular indian office also and this is going to be done as per chapter number 21 okay this will be done as per chapter number 21 and the last last one rule number 12 Rule number twelve states that if any person pretends, 
if any person pretends to be a foreign company then to find out whether it is actually a foreign company or not we can initiate investigation we can initiate investigation under section number 210 of the companies act right these two the last one rule number 12 and section number 376 has been just given for your reference otherwise apart from this we are done okay the chapter has only one penalty that is the best part right and here at the end i have given you the summary of all the important forms form number fc1 to form number fc4 that we have studied i hope i hope i am very very clear with this particular chapter and i hope you were able to recollect the provisions so let's start with the revision of compounding of offences adjudication and special courts uh, from the companies act from the companies act 2013 first one first one is your types of offences first one is your types of offences types of offences can be of two types first one is your compoundable offences and the other one is non compoundable offences compoundable are those compoundable are those where the complainant says that okay no problem reduce his penalty okay where the complainant agrees to get our penalty reduced then in that case such offences are treated as such offences are treated as compoundable offences and any such offences where imprisonment is not mandatory okay example fine only example imprisonment or fine example imprisonment or fine or both in all these cases originally imprisonment is not at all mandatory and that's why these offenses are treated as compoundable offenses and then you have got and then you have got non compoundable offenses that is the other ones where the imprisonment is mandatory example imprisonment only or imprisonment and fine okay first one was imprisonment only the next one is imprisonment and fine where your where your uh, imprisonment is mandatory uh, example wherever there is a grievous nature of default or a very serious default which has been done generally for all those offenses for all those offenses uh, non compoundable offenses is prescribed and that's why their reduction their reduction is not allowed reduction is not possible then going on to the next one that is establishment of the special court okay just like we did it in our allied law similarly for the company law also for the company law also we have got special courts who is going to do the speedy trial of offences right who is going to do speedy trial of offences speedy trial of offences means all the cases pertaining to offences okay all the cases pertaining to offences example whenever fine imprisonment etc these things get levied the special court comes into picture just like our pmla chapter etc so your central government establishes okay central government just establishes your uh, special courts and in these and in these special courts we have two different departments we can say we can say as departments for our understanding these special courts are going to have two different departments one is who is going to handle some serious cases and the other one is going to handle all the other cases okay so now the first department which is the superior department that is going to that is going to have a session judge or it is going to have an additional session judge okay either it will have a session judge or an additional session judge who is going to do the trial of offences in this particular special court and they are going to do the trial of offences uh, in cases where the imprisonment is more than or equal to 2 years means any case which involves an imprisonment of more than or equal to 2 years those will be handled by this first department where the session judge or the additional session judge is sitting and the second department second department has metropolitan magistrate or judicial magistrate of first class who are going to do the trial of the other cases okay 2 years or more cases Uh, imprisonment of two years or more is handled by the first department, and all the other cases, all the other cases are handled by the second one, that is metropolitan magistrate or a judicial magistrate of first class, right? And all these judges, all these judges will be appointed. All these judges will be appointed by the central government, by the central government after consultation with the chief justice of high court, chief justice of high court, which high court? Obviously, the jurisdictional high court. okay the jurisdictional high courts chief justice help we are going to take while appointing these particular uh, uh, while appointing these particular judges okay so in this way in this way your special court is established so now ma'am what is the work of the special court special court special court is going to try all the offenses okay it is going to try all the offenses which was mentioned in the section number 435 that is even a larger offense or even a smaller offense all these offenses will be tried by the jurisdictional special court 
okay jurisdiction special court means where the company is registered office is situated that particular jurisdiction special court is going to handle our case if in that particular jurisdiction if in that particular jurisdiction if we have two or more special courts then to which special court the case is going to go that will be determined by the jurisdictional high court okay then whenever whenever a case is going to come to the special court okay whenever a case is going to come to the special court before that person is presented before the special court that person is taken into the custody right for questioning purpose for seeking information from him that particular person is uh, taken into custody okay if now the the custody is taken into by the magistrate okay if he is into the custody of a judicial magistrate then the judicial magistrate can retain him for a period of 15 days if he is into the custody of an executive magistrate then he can be retained into a custody for a period of maximum 7 days okay this is maximum 15 or maximum 7 days and once the questioning etc is done okay maximum within these many number of days then that particular person is forwarded before the special court for the final trial of offence and then the special court is again same it is deemed to be your session courts right it has it is regulated by the code of criminal procedure and special court special court does not only deal with the offences of the companies act it also deals it also deals with the offences of other acts as we have already studied it also deals with the offences of your pmla right then after that pmla seb etc etc there are many laws which are also dealt by the special then whenever any particular matter goes to the special court whenever there is any particular matter which goes to the special court special court has got a choice whether to do a summary trial or whether to do a regular trial okay summary trial the case gets ex disposed of in a expeditious manner okay the case gets disposed of in a expeditious manner but there are two conditions which must be fulfilled for summary trial okay first of all the case which comes into summary trial that should have an original imprisonment of maximum up to 3 years okay original imprisonment should be maximum up to 3 years and the final imprisonment that we uh, give in this particular summary trial should not exceed a period of 1 year okay original imprisonment should be of maximum 3 years and the final imprisonment that we are going to give that should not exceed a period of 1 year okay if any one of the condition is not fulfilled if any one of the condition is not fulfilled then the matter directly goes to the regular trial okay then you get uh, what do you say then you get uh, tried then you get tried as per the regular trial where any type of case where any type of case can be handled right then section number 437 says section number 437 says that just like high court used to regulate just like high court used to regulate the session courts earlier similarly high courts are going to regulate the special courts also now okay then they are talking about the application of code as we have already discussed the code of criminal procedure the code of criminal procedure 1973 is going to be applicable to all the proceedings which happen before a special court and whatever proceeding is happening before a special court that will obviously be treated as a court proceeding means that will be treated to be a judicial proceeding and the person who is going to do the prosecution okay listen as of now the person who is going to do the prosecution before the special court that particular person is treated as a public prosecutor okay later we might name that particular person as company prosecutor also but as of now we will just say that that particular person will be treated as a company prosecutor uh, as of now we can say that that person will be treated as a public prosecutor right then comes section number 439 section number 439 says that all the offences okay all the offences under the companies act listen all the offences under the companies act will be non cognizable will be non cognizable means we will require we will require arrest warrant if we want to uh, uh, arrest any particular person except for one offence okay except for one offence that is the sfio section 212 subsection 6 serious fraud investigation office if it's an offence relating to sfio then in that case then in that case uh, it is it will be a cognizable offence that is arrest can be done without an arrest warrant also otherwise in the company law otherwise in the company law each and every offence will be a will be a non cognizable offence okay this was one thing which was talking about cognizable or non cognizable another thing which comes into picture is cognizance of offence okay cognizance of offence is nothing but taking note of the offence okay cognizance of offence is nothing but taking note of the offence whenever we want the case to be taken up by the special court 
okay whenever we want the case to be taken up by the special court then in that case someone has to go and file the complaint before the special court then only the special court will try our case okay if there is if it pertains to any offense okay if it if the default pertains to any offense or if any offense has been done then the complaint can be given in writing by the roc it can be given in writing by a shareholder or a member of the company or it can be given in writing by any member authorized any person authorized by the cg okay when it pertains when the offense pertains to securities example proper issue of securities is not done transfer of securities is not done dividend was declared but not paid then in that case cognizance can also be taken on a return complaint of a person authorized by sebi okay cognizance may also be taken by such a person when the application is made by such a person okay when we go for government cases okay when we go for a government company cases then in such cases for any offense any offense the cognizance can be given by any person who is authorized by the cg okay any person is authorized by the cg and when it comes to securities relating thing then it can be any person authorized by the cg or any person authorized by the sebi okay whatever name i have told you till now these people can go and give the cognizance before the special court and then the special court is going to take our case ahead right and suppose uh, suppose if there is any default which has been done any offense which has been done by the liquidator against the company then we can use this particular section but if any offense has been done by the officers of the company employees of the company then section number 439 does not apply okay because section 439 does not apply for prosecution by the company against its officers okay that is that section is not applicable since liquidator is not a employee of the company so we can use this particular section okay then going on to the next one going on to the next one that is section number 440 440 talks about the transitional provision which is very very simple just be just before okay i am combining this with section number 435 just before section number or uh, just before your special court came into picture okay just before your special court came into picture or till the time your special court comes into picture the case can be tried by the session court or the case can be tried by the those magistrates metropolitan magistrates or the judicial magistrate of the first class till the time the special court is established okay then we have got then we have got something called as mediation and conciliation panel okay just like we had studied this in arbitration also that the uh, authorities are trying to reduce the burden on the courts right authorities are trying to reduce the burden on the courts so what they have done is central government is going to maintain a panel okay a group central government is going to maintain a panel which will be called as a mediation or conciliation panel where where a particular number of experts would be there who will act as mediators or conciliators between the disputed parties okay so whenever whenever there is any particular dispute okay whenever there is any particular dispute between two parties then they can so more to apply to the you know nclt etc that we wish to before coming to you that is before coming to the nclt we would first go for the mediation or the conciliation panel okay or in that case the authority can also say even the nclt can say that instead of uh, coming to me please first go to the mediation or the conciliation panel so it can be both ways either we can go or even the authority can tell us that you first go to the mediation or conciliation panel and whenever the matter goes to them then they have to dispose of the matter within a period of 3 days okay uh, sorry 3 months they have to dispose of the matter within a period of 3 months and once they dispose of the matter it will be subject to approval by the nclt okay whoever is the first authority it will be subjected to uh, what do you say supervision subjected to supervision by that particular authority okay and if the final decision is not workable if the final decision is not workable then in that case we can go and uh, we can again start with a normal appeal procedure which starts with your ncl right so basically they are just trying to reduce the burden on the nclt because there might be some matters right there might be some matters there might be some matters which can be discussed there might be some matters which can be discussed and which can be solved at the mediation or conciliation level itself right so in that case the burden to the nclt would ready then whenever whenever central government wants okay whenever central government wants whenever any case is going on before any particular court on behalf of the department okay then in that case central government can appoint a prosecutor called as a public prosecutor Called as a public prosecutor to fight for the 
fight on behalf of the government or to represent the government the company the central government can appoint company prosecutor okay company prosecutor is such a person who has got all the powers of a public prosecutor only it's just that he has got the company law related knowledge okay he has got company law related knowledge experience etc then comes an ex section which talks about the appeal against acquittal okay which talks about the appeal against acquittal now what does this section say appeal against acquittal means whenever whenever say for example the court has passed any order in my favor declaring me as innocent okay declaring me as innocent that as if i have not done any default the court has given the judgment okay means i have got an acquittal order okay or an acquittal order has been passed for me then in that case can the other person can the roc or can the central government be aggrieved who was there in the dispute with me obviously they would be aggrieved obviously they would be aggrieved so in that case so in that case they can they can apply for filing an appeal against my acquittal order that how did you release arpita how did you acquit uh, how did you pass an acquittal order against arpita they will go and file an appeal to the next appellate authority against me okay but the only difference here was they cannot go against the high court's order they cannot go and file an appeal against the high court's order otherwise every other authority against every other authority's order they can go and file an appeal from this particular acquittal okay next one next one was compensation for accusation without reasonable cause say for example if i was accused if i was held guilty initially but later on i was declared clean and clear then in that case then in that case i can claim for compensation right i can claim for compensation that i can claim for compensation that was i have lost my goodwill i have incurred so much of expenses so please compensate me for that and in that case in that case if the authorities if that particular special court authorities etc are satisfied then they would definitely compensate us the amount of compensation the amount of compensation is not specified in the companies act but that is given in the code of criminal procedure then going on to the next one that is application of fines okay whatever fine is collected by the court okay whatever fine is collected by the court that can be used for uh, meeting the expenses the proceeding expenses and it can be used as payment of reward to the whistle blower okay the person the person on whose complaint we started the entire case on that to that particular person we can give a reward okay to that particular person we can give a reward okay so that basically is motivated that in future also if he comes to know about any default then he is readily willingly come uh, right like what uh, they are um, available and they would like to at least come and come forward and file the complaint right next one next one is a nice answer uh, which talks about the factors for determining the level of punishment okay whenever whenever any particular uh, fine imprisonment or penalty etc are determined okay then in that case the authority the adjudicating authority or the court in case of fines they consider they consider certain matters okay they consider certain things example which type of company is this what is the size of the company what is the nature of default that has been done by this company how much loss has been caused to the general public how much injury has been done to the general public okay what is the repetitive nature of default what is the type of default that has been done how much amount of gain has he earned by doing this default etc if we consider all these things if we consider all these things then we will come to know should we levy the penalty on the lower side should we levy the penalty on the higher side or how much penalty should we levied ultimately that can be decided on the basis of those factors right next one they have given they have given certain relief okay they have given certain relief to the opc and the small company okay ma'am what relief have they given now they are telling that if say for example opc or small companies one person company or small company if they have done any kind of default say for example of section number 92 annual return or section number 117 that is filing of resolutions with the roc or section number 137 which talks about filing of financial statements with the roc then in that case uh, uh, since these are small companies having less capacity etc then we can reduce their penalty okay we can reduce their penalty to half of the original one okay we can reduce their monetary penalty to half of the original one to any amount but um, maximum up to half of the penalty right example example if the original penalty is 10000 then we can levy penalty on them uh, up any amount up to rupees 5000 okay this is nothing but a relief this is nothing but a relief which has been given to the opc and the small company 
right going on to the next one that is section number 454 454 talks about adjudication of penalties okay adjudication of penalties whenever just try to understand here whenever any penalty whenever any contravention of the provision is done which attracts any penalty then in that case that penalty amount penalty amount is determined by the adjudicating officer ma'am who are these adjudicating officers adjudicating officers are nothing but the cg officers only who are appointed by the central government to do this particular activity okay so jurisdictional for every particular jurisdictional the, uh, every particular jurisdiction these particular adjudicating authorities are appointed okay whenever the adjudicating authority comes into picture whenever the adjudicating authority comes into picture he is supposed to first give a show cause notice okay he is supposed to first give a show cause notice to the defaulters and it will tell to those particular defaulters that please reply within 15 to 30 days it will give a specific period but which will range between 15 to 30 days within a period of 15 to 30 days we should receive the reply to our show cause notice that why the penalty should not be imposed on you right and it will be a detailed notice that you have done a default of so and so section etc so please reply us within a period of 15 to 30 days okay so that within a period of 15 to 30 days we have to reply to that particular show cause notice and we can get an extension of maximum we can get an extension of maximum 15 days in filing a reply okay once we file the reply then within 10 days then within 10 days the adjudicating officer will determine whether physical appearance is required or not okay if it is required then within 10 days itself it should issue a notice that you have to be present in our office on so and so date and once all these things are done whether physical appearance is done or not done in such case in such case uh, the adjudicating authority will finally pass after considering all those things it will finally pass the order it will finally pass the final order that order that order can be either the final order or it can be an adjournment order also and whatever suppose if it passes the final order then in that case that has to be properly dated signed and it will be given to each and every authority uh, each and every person example it will be given to the defaulting person it will be given to the central government it will be put on the website etc also basically the information is disseminated or uh, spreaded that uh, so and so penalty has been levied on so and so person okay ao has to pass the final order see now there are two possibilities here if suppose physical appearance is not required then then the date the date which the uh, the last date of submitting the last date of submitting the reply to the show cause notice either before extension or after extension as the case may be okay the last date of submitting the reply if no extension is provided or if extension is provided then such extended date from that particular day within a period of 30 days ao should complete the case okay it should pass the final order and suppose if the physical appearance is required then the date when we issued the show cause notice from that day within a period of 90 days the adjudicating officer must complete the case and it, it should pass the final order okay now while doing all these things it has got all the powers similar powers similar powers as that of civil court it will consider those factors while determining whether lower penalty should be levied or higher penalty should be levied right then in that case then in that case whatever penalty is finally levied by the adjudicating officer that will be collected through the mca portal from that defaulting person and that gets credited to the consolidated fund of india right acha now whenever this penalty is imposed whenever this penalty is imposed they say that they say that we will impose this penalty we will impose this penalty obviously as per the principles of natural justice if we say as per the principle of natural justice means it will be it will be uh, imposed only after giving a reasonable opportunity of being heard okay once it is imposed once it is imposed adjudicating officer will tell us to pay that penalty and it will tell us to rectify the default okay it will tell us to rectify the default if we are not satisfied with the amount okay which with the amount which is levied by the adjudicating officer's order then in that case we can go and file an appeal before the regional director within a period of 60 days okay as soon as we receive the aos order from that day within a period of 60 days we can go and file an appeal before the regional director and regional director will consider the case it will give roboh then it will pass the final order which can be a confirmation order which can be modifying order or which can in which it can set aside okay rd will pass the final order 
then if we do not listen if we do not listen to the ao's order if we do not listen to the rd's order if we do not rectify the mistake which the ao had told us to do or if we do not pay the original penalty etc then in that case the company the company and its defaulting officers can be liable for some offence okay they will be liable for some offence and that offence i had told you even if you don't buy hard these figures it's absolutely all right and then coming on to the last section of the chapter that is section number that is section number 454a which talks about repeated default say for example if once you have done if once you have done a particular default okay if once you have done a particular default then in that case then in that case if you do such similar default again within a period of 3 years if you do a default again within a period of 3 years then the next time whenever the like whenever you have done that repeated default that is the second time when you have done in that case in that case double amount of penalty will be applicable on you because you have done a repeated default within a period of 3 years i hope i am very very clear with uh, all these provisions and i hope i have helped in making you understand this particular chapter and at least after doing the revision the chapter seems to be a simple and a smaller chapter in with the revision of prevention of operation and mismanagement everyone with me everyone with me okay uh prevention of operation and mismanagement containing sections from section number 241 to 246 246 is to be done later so effectively effectively we are supposed to do from sections section number 241 to section number 245 now the first of all first of all the meaning the meaning of the term operation meaning of the term operation is any case where the affairs of the company any case uh, uh, where the affairs of the company are being conducted in such a manner which is creating an unjust treatment or which is creating an harsh treatment on the members of the company that uh, treatment that might be called as operation when we go to mismanagement mismanagement we had considered two things we have to consider two things in case of mismanagement first of all the affairs are being carried on in an improper manner which is prejudicial to the public interest prejudicial to the interest of the company prejudicial to the interest of the shareholders or where a big change has taken place in the management a material change has taken up in the management and because of which because of which it is likely to happen that the interest of the shareholders interest of the public interest of the company would be affected and that can be treated that can be treated as mismanagement now if at all if at all in our company there is operation or mismanagement or we can say operation and mismanagement then in that case what is the recourse available to us that is what is the option available to us let's discuss about that okay when we talk about section number 241 then we have an option we have an option that we may go and apply that we may go and apply to the tribunal for seeking a relief from this operation or mismanagement in that the first sub subsection says that members okay the members or the shareholders have the right to apply they may go and apply and they can file an application before the tribunal they may go and file an application before the tribunal if if provided the numbers minimum number of members given as in section number 244 given as in section number 244 if that gets fulfilled then the members if they want they can go and apply to the tribunal second point says about the central government second subsection says about the central government that if central government thinks that affairs are being carried on in a prejudicial manner then in that case it may apply then in that case it may apply to the tribunal suo moto right and the third one third one says that in some specific four cases okay in some specific four cases if cg thinks that if cg thinks that we come somewhere in these four cases then the cg may tell to the tribunal to take up the case for investigation and then the tribunal will give the final decision that whether that defaulting managerial person should continue in the office or not so basically the four cases where the cg will go and refer the matter to the tribunal are first one if the person who is interested in the management okay if that person is guilty of fraud he has done some breach of trust he is continuously doing some negligence there is a constant or consistent negligence etc or if the business is not carried on as per the sound business principles we can say example in example we can say that the business is carried on as per unethical business practices or if or if the business is being carried on in such a manner which is causing an interest to the entire trade industry market etc 
not only our company is getting affected but the entire market entire industry is getting affected and the fourth point fourth point says that if the business is being carried on to defraud its creditors members etc or the business was formed or the business is going on for some un, uh, for some unlawful or fraudulent purposes right if any one of these case gets attracted then as per section number 3 as per subsection number 3 as per subsection number 3 to section 241 central government can go and make a reference to the tribunal it can tell to the tribunal to do the inquiry in all these matters and to decide whether this person who was engaged in the management of the company whether that person is a fit person or not to continue the office as a director right whenever this goes whenever this matter goes to the uh, tribunal from the central government then a case becomes formed okay when well, and in that one of the party would be that defaulting company or the defaulting manager Uh, who would be questioned now and who would be inquired whether he is a fit person or not right now in all these cases in all these cases for all of these cases like entire section 241 there are some common points which are coming up here uh, they have just considered some cases they have just considered some cases and they are just trying to discuss those with us and these have come from the case laws which uh, have been given in our book at the end now say for example if we are a shareholder in a particular company and if our company issues some more shares then can i say effectively our percentage holding gets reduced in that particular company so that does not amounts to oppression okay my share holding getting reduced as compared to my previous share holding does not lead to oppression if there are continuous losses in the company that is not treated as an oppression the company has not at all declared the dividend it is not mandatory so it is not treated as an oppression similarly uh, this section or this chapter can be made use only by the member okay only by the shareholder and not in any other cap capacity okay example if there is a particular person if there is a particular person who is a member also who is a uh, director also and is aggrieved in the capacity of a director then no he cannot make use of section number 241 right and then uh, nowhere they have told that this chapter can be made used only by minority shareholders or by the majority shareholders no it's not that way if any shareholder wants to go and make an application it has to check the eligibility given in section number 244 okay the uh, 244 section that we are going to study that numbers those numbers must be fulfilled and only then we can go and make an application right then after that after that next one once we have gone and made an application maybe under section 241 1 that is by the members or under section 241 3 that is specifically in some cases by the central government and in all the other cases also central government can make an application under 241 2 right 241 2 was miscellaneous residuary so whenever the application goes to the tribunal now the tribunal will consider the facts okay now it will start the inquiries it will give the reasonable opportunity of being heard it will determine whether the business is being conducted in a pre judicial manner or not and it will pass the necessary orders okay tribunal will pass the necessary orders ma'am what type of necessary orders can be passed by the tribunal what type of necessary orders can be passed by the tribunal it can be it can be maybe it can remove such defaulting managerial personnel right it can it can uh, decide how the business will be conducted in the future how the affairs will be conducted in the future is there any reduction in capital required is there any external reconstruction required right the existing persons contract existing persons contract should it be terminated should it be modified right all these things all these things or any such thing which may lead which may lead to a change in uh, moa aoa then after that if any fraudulent property transactions have been done in the last 3 months then those can be set aside that is those can be reversed that is one possible option available any managerial personnel can be uh, removed if any managerial personnel if any managerial personnel has earned wrongful gains if any managerial personnel has earned wrongful gains then in that case that particular person can be that particular amount can be recovered from such person okay tribunal can appoint a person to supervise uh, on this particular company tribunal can impose cost that is pen fines penalties on our company these are the powers these are the powers available with the tribunal when the ball comes in its court under section 242 right and whatever is the order of the tribunal obviously that will be full and final and that will be binding and we have to go and file the company has to go and file that particular order with the roc within a period of 30 days right 
and similarly similarly when it was a case of section number 241.3 241.3 means where the central government had applied in some special cases then in such cases then in such cases then in such cases tribunal will hear finally take a decision that whether that uh, defaulting person is a fit person or not or whether he is a defaulting person or not and whether he should still be sitting in the management of the company or not right similarly it uh, the about about pointers that we had seen that is uh, you know removal of managerial person etc any of those points like example change in the shareholding pattern etc it can lead to a change in moa and aoa also right so whenever there is any change in a moa aoa we have to do that change and then we have to go and file it with the roc within a period of 30 days just like every time whenever normal in company law also whenever we do any changes we have to go and file it with the roc within a period of 30 days and if you do not do this okay if you do not do as directed by the tribunal if you do not alter your your moa aoa as directed by the tribunal then in that case punishment would be applicable on us right next one next one next uh, section number 243 this talks about the termination or modification of the agreements with the managerial personnel okay example if there is any director manager officer in charge etc if their office has been terminated okay if they have been terminated basically then in that case section 243 makes one thing clear that if you have been terminated then you won't be liable for any compensation for loss of office okay whatever are your dues that is okay that's a different thing you will get your dues but if there is any if you seek for any compensation for loss of office then no you will not get that compensation for loss of office okay and if you are say for example uh, suppose if your agreement has been terminated then in that case by default they are telling us here that such person will not act as a md manager director etc for a period of 5 years okay for a period of 5 years in this particular company if you want to start acting before a period of 5 years then simply go and take the approval of the tribunal and then you can start acting okay but if it was a case of section 2413 okay if it was a case of section 2413 where the cg in those special cases it has gone and made an application if the person has been uh, you know terminated because of section 2413 then he cannot act as a md officer manager or any particular person in any company in any company for a period of Five years, okay. But again, there also, if you want to start working, if you want to start working, then you can take the leave of the, you can take the permission of the tribunal, and if the tribunal is satisfied, then it can allow you. Right? Again, here, again, here. If you knowingly act, okay, you know that there is a rest. I know that there is a restriction on me. Then too, I still act in a particular company. Then penalty punishment would be applicable on. Right? Going on to the next section, second last section of the chapter, section number two hundred and forty-four. Section number two forty-four talks about the minimum number of members who have to go and make an application. Okay, who are eligible to go and make an application under section two forty-one one, right? They can go and make an application under section two forty-one one. Okay, so they have divided it basically into two parts. They have divided in basically two parts. First one is where the company is having share capital, and the second one is where the company does not have a share capital. Okay, if the company does not have share capital, then it's very simple. That is not less than one fifth of the total number of members. Okay, that is at least twenty percent of the total number of members should be there so as to go and make an application. If the company does not have a share capital, if the company if the company has a share capital, then in that case, then in that case, not less than hundred members or not less than one tenth of the total number of members. Okay, either hundred members or one tenth of the total number of members, whichever is lower. Okay, if we talk in numbers, then whichever is lower, or one member or members holding holding at least one tenth of the issued share capital, one tenth of the issued share capital, and the entire amount. Okay, if whatever whoever are holding this one tenth of shares etc., their entire amount should be fully paid. right so these many members these many members should be there minimum when the company is having share capital who can go and apply to the tribunal under section 241 right so, uh, and in this case also all the members need not go any one person who has taken the consent of all of them can go and make an application to the tribunal in certain circumstances even if my requirement my eligibility of the section does not get fulfilled then too if i make the tribunal satisfy that sir then too uh, there is an operation or mismanagement etc then the tribunal will allow you to make an application even if you are less in numbers 
okay even if you guys are less in numbers then also the tribunal will allow you to make an application right and later on one more one more important thing here see once say for example we have gathered the required number of members and then we go and make an application later on if some people want to withdraw from the application it is not going to affect because they say because they say that we check the numbers we check the numbers as on the date of filing the application or the date of filing the petition we check the numbers if on that day the numbers are satisfied but later on some people have withdrawn it is not going to affect the application meaning that the application will be accepted right and then and then the next one section number 245 section number 245 talks about section number 245 talks last section which talks about the class action okay it is such a case where the shareholders or the depositors okay where the shareholders or the depositors when they know about the problem which is happening in the company okay this is very very important in section 241 they did not know the root cause they just knew that there is operation or mismanagement something wrong is happening with them right but in section number 245 they know the root cause of the action they know that the problem is from the below given list then in that case required number of members or the required number of depositors can go and make again they will go and make an application to the tribunal for varied things okay to stop the company from doing wrongful activities example to stop the company from acting on a void resolution to stop the company from committing some ultra virus act to uh, stop the company to restrain the company from doing any activity which is against the resolution which has been passed by the members means it is not in lines with the resolution which has been passed by the members it is going to stop the company from acting on a void resolution it is going to stop the company from violating any other law etc okay so basically here it is going to go to the tribunal and it is going to request to the tribunal that sir please please ask the company not to act on the void resolution sir please ask the company not to contravene any particular law that way okay then another thing that it can do is it can go to the tribunal request the tribunal to declare a particular resolution as void if the company is not listening to us then we can go and request this particular fact to the tribunal and then to seek damages and compensation from some people who have done something wrong with us okay example it can be the company example it can be its directors example it can be the auditors example it can be the valuers example it can be the uh, experts advisors etc right if they have because of them if we have suffered any amount of losses then in that case we can go and make an application and we can Uh, seek the amount of damages, compensation, etc. And whenever, whenever we are seeking any damages or compensation from from the auditors, okay, then in that case the auditors as well as the audit firm both will be jointly and severally liable. Okay, don't forget that. Next, after that, after that, now here how many members should go and apply, ma'am? Okay, suppose if the company is having share capital, okay, if the company is having share capital, then in that case at least at least hundred members. or at least 5% or at least 5% of the total number of members earlier it was 10% now it is 5% okay 100 members or 5% of the total number of members whichever is lower or member or members holding at least 5% of the issued share capital of the company so basically till now whatever we have done that was a clear cut replacement of the past uh, numbers that we had studied in section 244 there it was 10% here it is 5% okay but this 5% of the issued share capital 5% of the issued share capital that is applicable in case of an unlisted company and in case of a listed company instead of 5% okay the uh, about two limits would remain the same okay these would remain the same only year when it comes to the issued share capital year it would be 5% in case of an unlisted company and 2% in case of a listed company again with the same again with the same condition that the entire amount must be fully Pay. Okay, this was in which case? This was in the case of the number of members. Okay, where the number of shareholders are going and apply, uh, and where the company is having a share capital. Now, what if the company does not have a share capital? Then no issues. It will be same as the previous one. That is, that is uh, one fifth or at least one fifth of the total number of members. See, it's return here. Okay, one fifth of the total number of members. Then going on to the number of depositors. Okay, going on to the number of depositors. It is just like your unlisted company. so at least 100 depositors or 5% of the total number of depositors whichever is lower or depositor or depositors 
who hold at least 5% of or who owe basically total uh, who are owed basically 5% of the total value of deposits these many of them these many of them can go and make an application to the tribunal okay once we go and make an application to the tribunal then in that case tribunal will see the application whether it is acceptable or not whether it is done in good faith or not and then simply it will accept it right then then going on to the next one going on to the next one when we go and make an application after that the tribunal gives a public notice that so and so application has been done by someone in section number 245 then uh, the similar type of applications will be consolidated into one but if we have received two class action two class action then applications then in that case uh, the second one would be rejected and only the first one would be accepted because anyway now the relief will be given by the tribunal to each and every okay and for all these things the expenses will be initially incurred by the applicant but later on it will be reimbursed by the defaulting person okay ultimately whoever is held liable that person is going to reimburse back the cost to the applicant right then after that uh, what will be the remedy here what will be the remedy the remedy here would be that whatever we had requested the tribunal to do okay maybe to claim damages to claim compensation to declare a particular resolution void etc tribunal will pass the necessary orders and just remember that auditor example remember uh, if whenever we are claiming any damages or compensation from the auditor then in that case then in that case both the auditor as well as auditor as well as the audit firm would be jointly and severally live okay and whatever is the order passed whatever is the order passed by the tribunal that will be full and final and that will be binding on everyone if not followed then there is a punishment which is applicable on the company also and it is applicable on the person in charge also right and if anyone has filed the application for time pass okay if any person has filed the application for fun for any vexatious or frivolous application has been filed then in that case the person who is doing this that person would be liable to pay up to rupees 1 lakh to the company okay because it also affects the goodwill of the company so that particular person has to compensate back to the company of an amount up to rupees 1 lakh and the section is not applicable to a banking company because they say that otherwise it would create a chaos because in banking company etc whenever the defaults happen the direct uh, de depositors are the people who ultimately suffer right so it, it uh, if we make this particular section applicable to them it becomes very simple for them uh, the, considering the numbers it become very simple for them to you know go and make an application to the tribunal so all those things are anyway covered in your banking regulation act so that has been removed from this right and again whenever we are going okay whenever these numbers whenever these number of members are going whenever these number of depositors etc are going then <clears throat> in this case also a representative member a representative member can go can go on behalf of all of this who can go and make an application who can go and make an application to the tribunal right and then we had certain case laws here we had certain case laws coming up majority of the points we have already covered in the notes that we have studied one or two important points here where or one or two other points here where first of all there is an established rule that majority rules the company okay decision making of the majority becomes applicable on the minority so that does not create an oppression by itself okay it does not create an oppression by itself but if uh, something unjust is happening with the minority then yes we can say that majority is doing some oppression or uh, some mismanagement is happening with the minority right and the next one if the company denies everyone if the company denies the shareholders for inspection of books of accounts which is anyway not allowed by the law then that does not amount to oppression because legally it is not allowed for the shareholders to inspect the books of accounts okay financials is a different thing but the books of accounts cannot be inspected by the shareholders I hope I am very very clear till here and with this we are done with the revision of prevention of oppression and mismanagement. Simple, short, sweet, simple chapter. So let's start, let's start with the super quick revision of inspection inquiry and investigation chapter which ranges between section 206 to section 229. First of all, section number 206, section number, uh, first of all, uh, section number 206 talks mainly about your inspection and the inquiries where in 206 ROC has the power ROC has the power to do the inspection ROC has the power to do the inspection on mainly two bases okay which two bases first of all uh, whenever we furnish any information whenever we furnish any information to the ROC 
okay or wherever we furnish any documents to the roc and when roc does the scrutiny of that particular document after that the roc can call for inspection or when the roc receives any information okay roc receives information from any other person then in that case the roc can call for inspection of books of accounts okay in inspection it will ask us to furnish some books of accounts it will ask us to provide some explanation on the matters or the or on the things which are written in those books of accounts right now whenever the roc calls for that inspection or whenever it calls for those books of accounts etc then it becomes our duty right it becomes our duty it becomes the duty of the company it becomes the duty of the past officers it becomes the duty of the existing officers to provide the necessary information to provide the necessary information to cooperate with the roc appointed person right now suppose if suppose if the information which was called by the roc suppose if i did not submit that information or if i furnished the information but still that was inadequate or if roc thinks that there is some unsatisfactory affairs which are existing in the business then in that case roc can give an additional notice on us okay roc can call for more information from us it can uh, give an additional notice on me to furnish all the books of accounts all the documents all the registers anything else whatever is required by the roc it can ask us to do that right now this was about your inspection now similarly for inquiry whenever see inquiry means uh, roc is going to question a particular person and inspection whenever we talk about inspection it talks about the inspection of books of accounts right so say for example if roc has reasons to believe that we should question any particular person okay or if roc has received a representation that the that our business is being carried on in a fraudulent manner or if roc comes to know that the grievances of the investors are not addressed okay these are the three bases then in that case then in that case roc can do the inquiry right roc can do the inquiry also also in that case roc will intimate the company also just like your robh it will intimate the company about the allegations made against the company and then and then in that case even the cg can come into picture, picture even if the cg comes to know about any such things it will direct the roc to do this inquiry done and after the inquiry is done whoever is held liable whoever is held liable that person would be punishable that person would be punishable under section 447 right that is your punishment of fraud similarly inspection can be done by any other statutory authorities also any other statutory authorities any other government authority any other cg sg person any particular person can uh, do this particular inspection and inquiry so that was a very general section 206 was a very general section which was just giving the power to the roc to do the inspection and the inquiry right now whenever whenever any inspection or inquiry has been called for uh, under section 206 that is the previous section and obviously you already know that this is our duty this is the duty of the company to provide the necessary information to produce the necessary books of accounts to provide the necessary statements to provide the necessary explanations and and to uh, provide all the cooperation to provide all the help to the roc or the inspector so that he can so that he can conduct the inspection in a efficient manner then after that another thing is roc roc has got roc has got as we already know it has got all the powers as vested in a civil court right the one which we have been already studying roc has got all the powers as vested in a civil court roc inspector okay once he is done with this inspection etc after that after that he can take the copies of books of accounts obviously see he cannot take the original one but he can take the copies of the books of accounts and before returning it back to us before returning it back to us he can place some identification mark on it just like we put an audit mark etc proving that proving that inspection or investigation uh, inspection or inquiry has been done in this particular case right similarly now comes your specific sections now the specific sections from here are going to start section number 208 which talks about your inspection report okay once the inspection inquiry is done under section 206 and 207 we can say after that after that the inspector okay the roc person or the inspector will submit a report okay he is going to submit a final report inspection or inquiry report basically to the central government along with the recommendation that whether investigation is required or not okay whether investigation is required investigation means further detailed analysis whether it is required or not this will be uh, done there right now here the powers of the central government have been delegated to the regional directors that is instead of submitting instead of practically submitting the report to the central government it will be submitted to the regional director but it will contain a recommendation that further investigation is required or not
so this becomes the turning point okay section number 208 actually becomes a turning point that this is the point where we are, we are going to get to know whether investigation whether investigation will be done or not right then going on to the next one going on to the next one section number 209 which is an important section this says that if during your inspection inquiry or we can say just before your investigation okay if the roc or the inspector of the roc thinks that this particular company or the persons who are there in the company they may destroy the books of accounts they may alter the books of accounts they may mutilate the books of accounts they may falsify the books of accounts they may secret the books of accounts etc then in that case then in that case uh, this roc or the inspector of the roc whoever is the authorized person there that particular person can have to first take a order have to first take an order from the special court that is one we can say that it has to take a permission from the special court then it can enter that particular place it can search the place where the books of accounts are kept and then and then it can seize the books of accounts etc after allowing the company to take the extracts okay or we can say after allowing the company to take the copies of the books of accounts and this particular see here why are we taking we are not taking for the purpose of investigation or inspection etc no we are not doing that here why are we taking the books of accounts etc in custody so that so that we don't want we don't want the company to alter these books of accounts and we can take it for 180 days plus if required then we can even keep it with us for another 180 days okay so 180 plus 180 is the total period uh, for which these books of accounts can be seized and then after after 180 plus 180 obviously we'll have to return it back obviously we'll have to return it back to the uh, roc uh, sorry uh, we'll have to return it back to the company at that time the roc or the inspector can take the copies or the extracts of the books of accounts and yes again they can place again they can place an identification mark on right so just remember section 209 was your search and seizure before investigation okay that was your search and seizure before investigation now going on to the next section that is section 210 which talks about investigation into affairs of the company just like we saw on the basis of report on the basis of report that we obtained now under section 208 on that basis also the investigation can be done right on that basis also the investigation can be done so that is one basis second one is if suppose the shareholders themselves pass a special resolution that we want the investigation to be done or if they feel that it is or if the central government thinks that it is in the public interest to do the investigation or if an order has been passed by the court or tribunal okay if an order has been passed by court or tribunal then in that case the cg has to mandatorily cg has to mandatorily do the investigation right and now for this particular purpose these are basically the four bases on which the investigation can be started by the central government obviously central government is going to appoint some inspectors to do this investigation and the central government in the second case that is where the sr has been passed by the company in that case the central government can take a deposit central government can take a security deposit up to rupees 25000 we are going to study in detail about that when we go to section number 214 okay going on to the next section going on to the next section that is section 211 and section 212 section 211 says section 211 what are we going to do in that we are going to establish sfio Okay, ma'am, what is SFIO? SFIO stands for Serious Fraud Investigation Office. We are going to establish this particular office. This is established by the central government. It is mainly headed. Okay, it is headed by a person called as director who is, who is not below the rank of Joint Secretary of the Government of India, who has the knowledge in corporate affairs. And then we are going to have as many experts as we want from different, different fields. Okay, it can be relating to law, finance, accounts, cyber crimes uh, or uh, we can say forensic audit information technology capital markets it can be any particular field that we require okay so basically it will be headed by a person called as director and within that we are going to have many experts right and then their terms conditions the employees uh, officers in the SFI etc will be prescribed by the cg from time to time so that is not to be by heart okay then after that after that going on to the next section after that going on to the next section that is section number 212 okay section number 212 is talking about how is the investigation going to be done by the sfio okay how the investigation will be done by the sfio see now the first obviously the case is going to come to the cg only first the cg is going to determine whether investigation is required or not after that it will as per their parameters it is going to determine whether it is a whether it involves a serious fraud or not if it involves a serious fraud or uh, something like that then in that case then in that case the matter goes to the SFI. 
Okay, again we are going to have four bases here on the basis of which the SFIO is going to do the investigation or the case will be handled by the SFIO. In that the first three cases, in that the first three cases remain the same. Okay, the first three cases remain the same that is report under section 208 SR passed by the company and if CG feels that there is a public interest. But the last point is if any request has been received from any central government or state government department. Okay, only the last one changes just remember that. Right, if, if, that, if that thing is done, then in that case, the central government is going to assign the work. It is going to assign the work to the SFIO. SFIO says that whenever it comes into picture, okay, whenever it comes into picture, at that particular point of time, no other investigation can happen. Means if SFIO wants to work, then alone SFIO is going to work and any other investigation, first of all, any new investigation cannot be started. And if already some investigation was going on, then that will pause for the moment. Right, then after that, after that, this particular SFIO, okay, this particular SFIO is going to appoint experts, officers from itself to do the investigation. They have all the powers as vested in the civil court. SFIO is going to do its work and it is going to report to the central government, right? It is ultimately going to report to the central government only. There can be two types of report. There can be interim report. There can be final report here also. Whenever the SFIO comes in your premises, whenever it questions any particular person, then this is our responsibility. Then this is our responsibility that we have to furnish all the required information, explanation and we have to cooperate with them. Right? Whenever any particular person has been held guilty, whenever any particular person has been held guilty as per section 212, that is we come to know that the person has done a fraud, then that person would be liable under section 447. And here if under section 212, if he is liable under section 447, then in that case they say that all these offenses are cognizable and non-bailable just like our PMLA chapter. Right, if it is cognizable and non bailable means that person cannot be released on bail. Right, that uh, uh, non bailable means that person cannot be released on bail. And cognizable means we can arrest that particular person even without an arrest warrant. Right, so if you want to release that particular person on bail, then there is an exception that public prosecutor should be given an opportunity to oppose this release. And if he opposes, but still the special court is of the opinion that no, this person will not commit any new offense while on bail. Right, then in that case that person can be released or if that accused person is a woman, is a sick, is an infirm person uh, or that person is under the age of 16 years, then that particular person can be released on bail. Okay, just like your PMLA, even these offenses, uh, the, of, uh, the cognizance of these offenses must be taken. Okay, cognizance of these offenses must be taken means before the special court takes up the case from us. Okay, before the special court takes up the case from us, then in that case, before that, someone has to go and file the complaint. Someone has to give the note of that particular complaint before the special court. Who can do that? The director of the SFIO. See, because we are doing about SFIO, the most important person here is the director or any other authorized officer of the central government can go and give the complaint. Right? Okay. So now whenever this particular person is arrested, okay, whenever the defaulting. So here, because it is a cognizable offense, that person can be arrested without an arrest warrant. Right, so whenever this particular person is arrested by that specified authority within a period of 24 hours just like earlier within a period of 24 hours he has to be presented before the JM or MM or the special court whichever is there in that particular jurisdiction right and then after that after that after that once finally everything is done okay once finally everything is done the report also goes to the central government see uh, one thing is 447 will be applicable imprisonment etc will be applicable these were applicable when the cognizance was made to the uh, special court, right? When we finally determine that yes, there is a fraud. Also, also any persons, any persons that is the employees, officers, etc. of the company, if they have earned any undue advantage, if they have, uh, you know, uh, taken any undue advantage from the company by using their personal, by using the company's assets for their personal purpose, etc. Then in that case, the central government can go and make an application to the NCLT for disjudgment of such gain right disjudgment of such wrongful gain and the sfios sfios report is treated sfios don't forget this sfios report is treated as a police report okay so it can be used in the so it can be used in the court of law for the purpose of some proof or some for the purpose of some investigation in the near future okay sfio can seek information from any other authorities sfio can uh, provide it can also share the information with any other authorities okay just like we studied about exchange of information or when we studied about the term confidentiality confidentiality means it cannot be given to the public but yes definitely it can be shared with the other authorities 
okay and whenever there is an arrest happening in case of a government company then or foreign company then they say that you have to take a prior approval of the central government also and whenever whenever arrest uh, is happening in case of a government company we have to intimate to the md or the person in charge of such government company but if the md or person in charge itself is getting arrested then in that case you have to intimate to the secretary of uh, administrative ministry Right. This was a specific different point that is while writing also we had written it separately. Right. Then this was your 212 that is where the SFIO came into picture. SFIO did the investigation and then a prosecution happened against us. Then going on to the next section that is section number 213 which was talking about investigation into affairs of the company when the order is made. When the order is made by the tribunal. Okay. So now, now just try to understand. Just try to understand here. Uh, in section 213, the application can be made uh, by the tribunal, means it can be done suo moto by the tribunal. Tribunal can order to do the investigation, right? Or the application can be done by certain number of members to the tribunal, or any other person can go and make an application. Any other person can go and make an application to the tribunal. Okay, there must be four. Okay, whenever the case goes to the tribunal, the tri any of the four circumstances must exist. Okay, example, example. The business is being carried on in a fraudulent manner. Okay, the company was formed. Initially itself, the company was formed for a fraudulent purpose. Promoters are guilty. Okay, or the members of the company are not getting the required information which they are reasonably expected to get. If any one of the conditions are fulfilled, if any one of the conditions are fulfilled, then in that case, then in that case, the tribunal can order. The tribunal is satisfied. It may order. And it can give a reasonable opportunity of being heard to the company and then it can order for the investigation. Right. So this was a specific thing. This was a specific thing where the tribunal thinks, where the tribunal thinks that yes, investigation is required. So we can say that this is a continuation of section 210 last point. Remember in section 210 in those four bases, the last point was on the order of court or tribunal. So we can say that this is a continuation of that particular Okay, required number of members coming and making an application year is 100 members or member or members holding at least 10% of the voting power. If the company is having share capital and if the company is not having share capital, then it will be one fifth of the total number of members. These many people, these many people have to go and make an application to the tribunal or any other person has to go and make an application to the tribunal or tribunal suo moto or tribunal suo moto if it thinks that any of the four circumstances exist then in that case it can uh, order the central government to conduct the investigation okay and whenever the investigation is conducted and if they come to know that yes business is being carried on in a fraudulent manner the company was formed for this particular purpose or uh, when the promoters are guilty etc then in that case whoever is that guilty person later on section 447 punishment will be applicable on them. right going on to the next section that is section number 214 214 talks about your security cost. Okay, whenever any application has been done by the members, just like it was done in section 210 also, that is where the SR was passed by the members. And in the just previous section, that is section number 213, section number 213, where uh, the, some number of members ca came and they made the application. In such cases, in such cases, the central government will ask them to furnish a security deposit of up to rupees 25,000 so that, you know, genuinity of the case is proved basically. And suppose if it results in prosecution, then in that case, yes, it will be refunded back to the applicant. So now why are we using the uh, term 25,000 man? Because, because there is a range. Okay, it depends on the turnover of the company whose investigation is to be done of the last year. We'll check their turnover and in that particular, as you can see here on the board, there is a particular, uh, you know, uh, brackets given here or a particular bifurcations given here. If the turnover falls in the, which in whichever bracket the turnover falls, accordingly the security deposit amount will be applicable here. Okay, but anyway, the maximum amount is rupees 25,000. Then section 215, section 215 says that, section 21, uh, sorry, 215, yes, 215 says that only an inspect, only an individual, only an in individual can be an inspector, okay, means a firm, body, corporate, associations, etc., those cannot be the inspector. Going on to the next section, that is section 216, which talks about your investigation into ownership of the company. That is, if CG, if CG thinks that we should check the ownership of the company, we should check who are the true persons who are controlling the company, then in that case, CG can do the investigation or CG can order for the investigation into some specific thing. That is to find out 
who are those people who are financially interested in the success or failure of the company who are the people who are influencing the policies of the company or who are controlling the policies of the company or any other person who have or had any beneficial interest in the shares means who are the beneficial owners who are the owners who are significant beneficial owners in the company right then then in that case in that case central government will appoint the inspectors to do this particular investigation okay so basically we checked what we checked the ownership of the company ownership of the company we checked three things who was financially interested in the success or failure of the company who was influencing or controlling the policies of the company and the last one was identify identifying who is the owner and who is the beneficial owner of those shares right then section 217 is a one time read which can be managed on your own section 217 is a one time read going on to section 218 218 was talking about the employees protection okay whenever the employees okay whenever the employees are uh, say for example whenever any investigation is going on in the company then it can so happen that the company decides to remove the employees or terminate the employees or uh, you know change their position which is to their disadvantage okay it can be by it can be due to two reasons one is that particular employee himself is involved in the uh, fraud maybe so that can lead that can lead to a goodwill uh, thing which can affect in the company and another one is the employee has some crucial information about the company who has done the fraud right so in these cases the company can remove the employees but they say that whenever the investigation is going on okay whenever the investigation is going on at that time if you want to remove any particular employee then you have to take a prior approval of the nclt okay you have to take a prior approval of the nclt basically you have to give a notice to the nclt that you wish to remove this particular employee if the tribunal sends his reply within a period of 30 days accordingly we'll have to act okay within a period of 30 days the tribunal will send you a reply okay if suppose uh, the tribunal replies within a period of 30 days and if the tribunal says that okay remove then you can remove that particular employee but the employee has still got a right to file an appeal to the nclat within 30 days okay if the tribunal replies within a period of 30 days and says and says that no you cannot remove then you cannot remove then in that case the company gets aggrieved and then the company can go and file an appeal before the nclat within a period of 30 days okay if the tribunal does not reply at all within a period of 30 days then in that case then in that case uh, there was no order of the nclat that was passed so in that case the com company can remove its employee okay company can remove its employee and in this case no appeal is possible reason we have not received any order from the tribunal so again what are we going to file an appeal right this is your section number 218 next one going on to the next one that is section number 219 where we were doing the investigation into affairs of the related companies or related parties we can say okay in these there are four points which are applicable first of all we can do the investigation into our past subsidiary company holding company or another subsidiary of our holding company or it can be our present subsidiary company present holding company present another subsidiary company of our holding company that is basically we are doing the investigation of our group company similarly we can do the investigation similarly whenever the cg thinks that you know the information is available in such other company then in that case the investigation can be done of such a company which is controlled which is commonly controlled by our company's md or manager or which was commonly controlled by our ex md or manager okay as of now our uh, there is a particular person who is a md in our company also and who is a md in some other company also so we are also doing the investigation of such other company because the controlling person controlling person in the management remains the same okay or suppose if there is a, such a company who is uh, forced to act as per the directions of our directors okay there is any other company who is forced whose board is forced to act as per the directions of our company then in that case then in that case we can do the investigation of such other company also and the last point last point is this is not last point is not talking about the company but it is talking about the persons okay the ex employees of the company ex md of the company ex manager of the company or the present employees present md present manager of the company we can do we can do their investigation also but all these things okay all the four things can be done only after the cg okay only after the cg tells to the inspector that yes you can do this means the inspector suo moto cannot do the investigation into affairs of some other company right see investigation of this particular person which was going on that is okay that is not the problem but if you want to do the investigation of some other person some other third party then in that case cg has to give its approval going on to the next section that is section number 220 
220 talks about seizure of documents okay 220 talks about seizure of documents by the inspector means what seizure of documents by the inspector now during investigation okay during investigation if during investigation suppose if now the inspector thinks that okay the first one that section 209 that we had studied there the search and seizure was happening before investigation this is happening during investigation if during investigation the roc or inspectors of the opinion that we may alter destroy modify mutilate destroy the books of accounts etc then it can then it can your special code approval is not required so here it can enter the place it can search the place and it can seize the books of accounts it will allow the company to keep the extracts of the books of accounts and it can keep into its custody till the conclusion of the uh, investigation right and after that obviously we will keep the copies and we will place the identification marks and we will return back the originals to the company then section 221 and uh, section 221 first of all it talks about freezing of assets okay whenever the tribunal thinks that whenever the tribunal thinks that the company can sell investigation etc is going on and we don't want the company to sell off its assets so in that case if the tribunal is of the opinion that the company might sell off its assets and we need to put a restriction order on it then it will pass a freezing order on such company for a maximum period of 3 years okay it can pass a freezing order for a maximum period of 3 years whenever it thinks that okay uh, selling if the company sells off its assets then in that case it can uh, badly affect the interest of the company it can affect the interest of the shareholders it can affect the interest of the creditors then in such cases then in such cases tribunal can pass an order of freezing okay freezing the asset it can be whenever the cg tells the tribunal to do so whenever the investigation is going on and when the tribunal thinks that we should pass a freezing order whenever any operation mismanagement application was done in the previous chapter or whenever any amount due to the uh, creditor is more than or equal to rupees 1 lakh and that creditor has come and filed a complaint that sir my asset actually this asset belongs to me but my asset is getting misused in all or any other complaint is filed in all such cases whenever the tribunal is of the opinion that yes this complaint is valid this complaint is valid then in that case the tribunal can pass a freezing order okay the main important thing that you have to remember here is the tribunal can pass a freezing order of a maximum period freezing order of a maximum period of 3 years similarly whenever they want to find out okay whenever the tribunal whenever the tribunal or whenever any particular person during investigation if they want to find out anything about the securities okay or whenever they want to find out anything about the shareholding okay if this is a continuation of section 216 that is when we were investigating into the affair uh, when we were investigating into the uh, ownership of the company after that if we want to find out about any shareholding pattern we want to find out about the true owners etc then in that case the tribunal has got the powers okay all these restriction things are done by the tribunal tribunal has got a power that it can impose a restriction on the securities that no trading should happen okay no trading etc should happen some restrictions are there we are going to study that no trading can happen or uh, you know no new shares can be issued no buyback etc can be done etc uh, during a period okay or for a period of maximum 3 years just like your freezing your also the restriction can come for a maximum period of 3 years okay what are restrictions can come Ex a transfer of shares is not allowed bonus shares if it were to be issued it will not be issued right shares if it were to be issued it will not be issued new uh, share issue was going to come but it should not come okay no voting rights can be exercised apart from liquidation nothing else can be paid to the shareholders these are the possible these are the possible uh, restrictions that can be placed by the tribunal on that particular come similarly similarly now once everything is done okay till your everything all your investigation etc is done freezing order was passed if required the imposition of restriction on securities was done if required after this after this finally finally the inspector is going to prepare okay the inspector is going to prepare his report again there can be two types of report there can be a final report and there can be an interim report also and this copy this copy of report can be obtained first of all inspector is going to submit it to the cg and from the cg we can go and make an application okay any member any creditor or any person who has been affected any person who has been affected those people can go and make an application to the cg and they can obtain a copy of the report but the copy of report from the cg cannot be obtained in case of sfio that is sfio's report which was submitted to the cg we cannot go and obtain it from the cg we have to go and make an application to the court okay we'll have to go and make an application to the court and only then we can obtain the copy of the report and again here also the inspector's report is treated just like your police report and therefore it can be used in the court of law again 
then what are the other steps that we are going to take take uh, what are the other steps that we are going to take once the inspector's report is received okay now first most important thing is after the report is received we will determine whether prosecution is required or not okay if prosecution is required then in that case that particular person will be criminally liable and that person will be and that person will be uh, prosecuted further that is fine imprisonment etc will be levied on him if the state of the affairs is really very bad then in that case the tribunal can even or the a uh, cg can even think that let's wind up the company right it can think that let's wind up the company if suppose it's a solvent company then winding up they can take up under your ibc section 59 also okay or if it's an if uh, the case is not of that that is if, if it's not a solvent company then in that case the winding up can happen under the company is act 2013 right similarly if they think that okay we should we should provide some relief okay if the cg thinks that the tribunal should provide a relief to the company then it can take it under your operation and mismanagement also and there the tribunal can provide a relief also okay uh, just like we do an application for operation and mismanagement under section 241 so the relief is provided by the tribunal in the very next section that is section number 242 so those powers can also be exercised here okay if the company has suffered any particular damages okay if the company has suffered any particular damages and those damages have been ca uh, caused by the promoters or any officers etc then that has to be recovered back okay that has to be recovered back from the defaulting person then whatever are the investigation expenses remember from some people we had taken the security deposit but for others so the expenses were initially made by the cg only so cg is going to now re get get it reimbursed from the ultimate defaulting person okay whoever is the defaulting person cg is going to get it reimbursed from them and if any particular person if any particular person has taken any undue advantage of the company then we are going to discharge the gain by making an application to the nclt because this dischargement work is of the nclt only going on to the next section that is section 225 which talks about your investigation expenses the same thing that we just studied now in case of uh, you know in case of shareholders making an application or some numbers member uh, some number of members coming and making an application at that time at that time we took the security deposit from them okay but if it resulted into prosecution then we'll have to refund it back to them this we have already studied so in those cases the cg is going to ex uh, meet the expenses and then it is going to recover it okay then it is going to recover it from the defaulting person it is going to recover it from the defaulting company if any or it is going to be recovered we were doing section number 225 we were doing section number 225 which was talking about your expenses of investigation in some cases as we had already seen it before that uh, in case of shareholders passing a special resolution or in case of some number of members going and making an application to the tribunal then in that case we recover the security deposit from them but we have to refund it back to them if it results in prosecution so ultimately the expenses are borne by the central government first first initially the expenses are borne by the central government and central government then recovers it back okay it can recover it back from the defaulting person or it can recover it back from the defaulting company or it can be recovered back or it can be recovered back from any person who has tried to take any undue advantage of that particular company so that uh, recovery of expenses or meeting of the final expenses that was explained in section number 225 going on to the next one that is section number 226 section 226 talks about uh, that whenever any uh, investigation proceedings are going on whenever any investigation proceedings are going on in this particular chapter against the company or whenever whenever any relief from oppression or mismanagement application is going on before the tribunal as we had studied in the previous chapter in such cases in such cases okay uh, the if the company thinks that let's voluntarily exit the company okay if during investigation of the company thinks that let's voluntarily uh, exit the company that is exit the company means let's voluntarily wind up the company let's voluntarily close the company so that we'll get rid of all these inspection things investigation things etc so they say that yes you can go and make an application for voluntary winding up but voluntary winding up is not going to happen okay voluntary winding up is not going to happen or even though the tribunal will pass a stay order on that particular winding up proceeding but then to your investigation will still go on right next section section number 227 section number 227 talks about your uh, sharing of information when it comes to legal advisors okay when it comes to legal advisors when it comes to bankers etc 
then they are allowed to disclose only only certain specific information okay when it comes to legal advisors they can just disclose the name and address of the client nothing else okay if suppose say for example if the investigation is of reliance then the legal advisors of Re reliance can uh, to the cg to the inspection officers etc they can just disclose the name and address of the client no other details of the client to be disclosed okay and when it comes to the bankers okay bankers can give the information only about that person whose investigation is going on means the banker cannot give the information about the related person of the person whose investigation is going on okay say for example if it's reliance investigation is going on then the banker can give the information only about reliance and not about its group companies not about its subsidiary companies etc no then we had studied section 228 we had studied it earlier also 228 says 228 says that the entire chapter the entire chapter is applicable the entire chapter of inspection inquiry which we started studying from section number 206 that is applicable to your foreign companies also okay that this we had studied in the foreign companies chapter also and it is getting repeated here and then the last section section 229 says section 229 says that whenever the inspector called for any information whenever the tribunal called for any information whenever the cg called for any information documents etc from you and if and if you purposely give on purpose if you give any false information if you give any false explanation if you make any false entry in the books of accounts you help to destroy the books of accounts to alter falsify mutilate the books of accounts remember we have studied about this then in that case that put this they are treating this as a fraud okay they are simply treating this as a fraud and in such case in such case that particular person will be liable or punishable under section 447 that is your punishment for fraud. right so this was this was all about this was all about your inspection inquiry and investigation chapter the chapter in terms of pages is a very big chapter but if you go on uh, if you go and see then in that case you will find that uh, almost 40 percent almost 40 percent of the chapter is a very general thing is a very miscellaneous thing and only few things only few things are very very specific yes let's start let's start with the revision of miscellaneous provisions let's start with the miscellaneous of uh, with the revision of miscellaneous provisions chapter first point first point is about the government companies first of all the definition of government companies it is defined in section 2 clause 45 it is defined in section 2 clause 45 which says that if there is any particular company in which just try to recollect along with me if there is any such company in which at least 51 percent at least 51 percent of the share capital both equity as well as preference if this is held by if this is held by either by central government or it is held by state government or it is held jointly by both then in that case such a company will be treated as a government company and every subsidiary every subsidiary of a government company will be deemed will be deemed to be a government company right we take we take generally we take 51 percent of the paid up share capital generally we take 51 percent of the paid up share capital for determining whether it is a government company or not but if but if differential voting right shares with differential voting rights have been issued then we are supposed to take at least 51 percent of the total voting power at least that much voting power should be there with central government state government or jointly by both then in such case then in such case that particular company then in such case that particular company is treated as a government company as per the companies act section 2 clause 45 okay now we just have to study two provisions about the government companies here one is section number 394 and the other one is section number 395 both of which are going to talk about the annual reports only okay first of all annual report of a government company okay annual report of a government company now whenever in a uh, i am making three bifurcations okay imaginary three bifurcations i am making first of all it is such a government company it is such a government company where only central government is having the holding okay where only central government is having the holding then in that case then in that case cg is going to prepare this annual report which is a booklet consisting of which is a booklet consisting of your annual report audit report and the cag's comment right cag's comment all these three things uh, cumulatively we can even call it as an annual report or a booklet of the annual report this will be prepared by the central government only because now in the first bifurcation that i have made here the shareholding is only of the central government so central government is going to prepare this within three months from the date of agm 
okay within 3 months from the date of agm central government is going to prepare it and it is going to present before both the houses of parliament okay preparation has to be done by the cg and the presentation also has to be done by the cg before both the houses of parliament right going on to the next case going on to the next case where cg as well as sg are the members where cg as well as sg are the members here the report will be prepared by the cg only okay preparation work is still to be done by the cg only but laying down will be done respectively <coughs> example cg is going to lay down before both the houses of parliament central government is going to lay down before both the houses of parliament and state government state government is going to lay down before uh, the state legislature okay it is going to lay down before the state legislature but in both the cases it is the same common report which has been prepared by the central government okay and the last case and the last case that is section number 395 where only central government or one or more central governments are the members in this particular government company then obviously the report has to be prepared the report has to be prepared a single report will be prepared by the uh, central uh, by the state government it will be prepared by the state government uh, combined mutually and then it will be uh, placed before the state legislatures respectively before respective states legislature it will be presented separately and even this will be prepared within 3 months from the date of agm and it has to be laid down as soon as possible okay these points 394 and 395 is even applicable it is even applicable to the cases where where the government companies into liquidation okay even if the government companies into liquidation then also these provisions are applicable means same way the report has to be prepared same way the report has to be laid down this was all about the first part this was all about the first part that is your government companies going on to the next one which was talking about the miscellaneous uh, punishments and the penalties etc in which we just studied two of them first one is section number 447 and the second one is section number 450 447 447 is universal section which you already know which talks about punishment for fraud okay so first of all we have to quantify this particular fraud okay first of all we are going to quantify this fraud where they say that if any person who is involved in the fraud okay any person who is involved in the fraud and if he has done a fraud of at least at least a particular limit how much is that limit at least to be 10 lakhs or 1% of the turnover of the company whichever is lower okay this is the limit 10 lakh rupees or 1% of the turnover of the company whichever is lower this is my limit if the amount involved in the fraud is at least this much at least this much or more than this then in that case that particular person will be punishable with imprisonment and fine that person will be punishable with imprisonment and fine imprisonment which can range between 6 months to 10 years 6 months to 10 years and fine which can range from amount which was involved in the fraud and which can go up to three times which can go up to three times the amount involved in the fraud but just remember this is a non compoundable offense and that's why the word used here is and in between okay and suppose if this big fraud involves public interest also okay if it has affected public interest also then in that case the minimum tenure of imprisonment minimum tenure of imprisonment would be 3 years instead of 6 months okay just now i told you that it will range between 6 months to 10 years but if it involves public interest then instead of 6 months it will be 3 years 3 years to 10 years will be the minimum imprisonment and the fine will remain the same that is the amount involved in the fraud which can go up to 3 times the amount involved in the fraud okay then next one if suppose if suppose the amount involved in the fraud is lesser than the limit amount involved in the fraud is lesser than that limit ma'am what was that limit 10 lakhs or 1% of the turnover of the company whichever is lower if the fraud is of a smaller amount that is it is even lesser than the limit then in that case it is a compoundable offense so here that person will be punishable for imprisonment up to 5 years or fine up to rupees 50 lakhs or both okay so this becomes this becomes a compoundable offense because here the word you used here is or and the imprisonment is not mandatory okay but this one will be applicable this one will be applicable and it never involves public interest just try to understand here the amount involved is small okay the fraud amount is small so the mca assumes your ministry of corporate affairs assumes that here the amount involved uh, does not involve the fraud involved here does not involve any public interest okay then going on to the next one that is section number 450 which was a residual punishment which says that if in any provisions of the companies act if any punishment is not mentioned if any punishment is not mentioned the company and every defaulting officer of the company would be liable for a fine up to rupees up to rupees 10000 and in case of a continuing offence it will be liable for fine up to rupees 
thousand per day, thousand per day during which the contravention continues. So up to rupees ten thousand is a particular amount, and after a particular day also, if you are continuing with that particular offence, then it will be thousand rupees, right? Then going on, this was the second part. This was the second part. Total there are six parts in the chapter. So this was the second part that is your punishment. Going on to the third one. Going on to the third one, which talks about your dormant company. Okay, dormant company is given. Dormant company is given in section number four fifty five. Dormant company is explained in section number four fifty five, where where they say that if the company, if the company uh, is formed, is formed for a future purpose. Okay, the company has been incorporated, but it has been formed for a future project. Then in that case, it can go and make an application to the R O C for getting the status of a. dormant company or alternatively if the company is an inactive company if the company is an inactive company then the company can go and make an application to the roc for getting the status of a dormant company ma'am what do you mean by the term inactive company inactive company means if the company is not doing any business the company is not doing is not carrying on any business or operation or it has not made any significant accounting transactions during the last Two years, or the company has not filed its FS or annual returns, FS and annual returns, FS and annual returns during the last two years. Then, as of now, suppose it is not doing any business or operation, it has not done any significant business transaction during the last two years, or it has not filed these documents, these uh, uh, returns, etc. during the last two years. Then, in that case, the company is deemed to be an inactive company. and if the company is deemed to be an inactive company then it can go and make an application to the roc for getting the status of a dormant company but one thing important here is see when we go and make an application to the roc we have to use a form called as msc1 okay we have to use a form called as msc1 in which we are going to go and make an application to the roc and along with that along with that we have to attach the sr that is the special resolution passed by the members or if we could not pass the resolution but we have the consent of at least 3/4 of the shareholders in obviously in terms of rupees that is in value then in that case then in that case roc will accept your application roc will check roc will check whether you should be granted a status of a dormant company or not okay now once the application reaches the roc in form number msc1 if roc is satisfied then it will grant you the status of a dormant company in a certificate in form number msc2 okay in form number msc2 it will grant you a certificate okay once you are treated as a dormant company once you are treated as a dormant company then your name will be placed your name will be placed in the register of dormant company okay now here too many compliances which were generally applicable to a normal company those gets reduced in case of dormant company but yes uh, following the minimum number of directors criteria paying the annual fees filing the dormant company return some provisions are still applicable but that then too it is too less in in terms of compliances if we talk then it is too less as compared to a normal company Okay, then every year this particular dormant company has to file a return of dormant company. Okay, it has to file a return of dormant company, which is going to be filed within thirty days from the year end. Whenever the year is going to end from that day, within a period of thirty days. See why thirty days? Because the transaction there are no transactions as such, right? There are no significant accounting transactions as such. So that's why the time allowed here is too less. That is within thirty days the company has to the company has to file. the return of dormant company in form number msc3 msc1 was where we made an application msc2 was where they told that okay you are a dormant company msc3 is the return for the dormant company where uh, you have to go and file this with the roc every year within a period of 30 days from the end of the financial year okay now till now we were simply going and making an application to the roc that sir please treat us as a dormant company similarly if we haven't filed our fs or annual returns for the last 2 years then roc can also put our name in the register of dormant company after giving us a reasonable opportunity of being heard okay suppose if you fail to make an application to the roc for putting your name in the register of dormant company then roc can simply do that roc if it thinks that you haven't filed your fs annual returns for the last 2 years it can make an you know it will give you an opportunity and it will put your name in the register of the dormant company Okay, so now see, uh, dormant company is such a company where there are actually no transactions, right? There are actually no significant transactions. So in that case, they are telling that the provision for rotation of directors are not to be made applicable here. Why? Because there is no need. The directors are actually not doing any work as of now here. 
so rotation of directors is not at all required here okay in future if any particular dormant company wants to come back if any particular dormant company wants to come back and get the status of an active company now if it wants to start its own business or restart its business etc then in that case then in that case it can again go and make an application in msc4 okay it can again go and make an application in form number msc4 to the roc and satisfy the roc that we want to start our business again if roc is satisfied that yes okay no problem no problem then roc will grant you the status of an active company in msc5 okay it will grant you the status of an active company in form number msc5 msc5 it will grant you the certificate right so in this way from form number msc1 to form number msc5 this way you went from a active company to a dormant company and then from a dormant company to an active company and then the conclusion of this important note conclusion of this important note here is there should be no default done by the company there should be no outstanding dues of the company right the company should not be a listed company if these conditions are fulfilled if these conditions are fulfilled then only you can apply for the status of a dormant company otherwise you cannot become a dormant company right this was all about this was all about your dormant company 3 out of 6 done okay 3 out of 6 done now coming to uh, nidhi companies coming to nidhi companies that is your nidhi section number 406 as well as the as there are some important pointers from the nidhi rules okay let's try to revise all the important pointers here let's try to revise all the important pointers here first of all in case of a nidhi company uh, nidhi or a mutual benefit society nidhi or a mutual benefit society first of all they have to get declared okay once it is incorporated under the companies act after that they have to be declared as a nidhi or a mutual benefit society by the central government okay central government will declare us as a nidhi or central government will declare us as a mutual benefit society and it will tell us that all the provisions of nidhi will be applicable to you or it will say that okay all provisions are applicable except for these few that is it can grant you some exceptions modifications etc also okay and once you are declared as a nidhi or a mutual benefit society then it is placed then it is placed before both the houses of normally you know, whenever the central government passes a notification it will be placed before both the houses of parliament for 30 30 days each right now now listen just try to understand just try to understand here every nidhi or every mutual benefit society which was exist, existing under the old law that is under section 620a of the companies act 1956 or any nidhi which was incorporated in the 406 of the companies act etc to all these nidhis to all these nidhis your company or to all these nidhis your nidhi rules would become applicable okay nidhi rules would become applicable to every every other nidhi company or the mutual benefit society nidhi company is such a company which <clears throat> the main objective of which is it cultivates a habit of saving among its members it asks its members to save some money so that they can lend that money to the nidhi company and nidhi company can lend money to its needy members right to its needy members the nidhi company can lend its money and every time just try to recollect just try to remember this nidhi company always works for the benefit of its members it takes money from its members it lends the money to its members it provided it provides other services also only to its members and that's why that's why we say that it works on the concept or it works on the principles of mutual benefit okay then uh, next thing next thing coming up there is now a few important pointers about the incorporation of nidhi company nidhi company first of all whenever it is incorporated it is in form of a public company so if it is a company then in that case it should have a share capital compulsorily it should have only equity share capital preference is not allowed it should have a minimum share capital of at least rupees 5 lakhs it should have at least 200 members at any point of time at any point of time during the year it should have 200 number of members its name should contain the word nidhi limited at the end so as to identify that this is a nidhi company it cannot engage itself into chit fund business it cannot engage itself into any other finance business it cannot engage itself into higher purchase finance business it can get merged it can get merged with another nidhi company but only after sr is passed and approval from the rd has been taken approval from the regional director has been taken nidhi company can give locker facility on rent to its members but there is an important condition here that is 
the rent that you are receiving from this locker facility that should not exceed 20 percent that should not exceed 20 percent of the total income okay means this should not be a key activity this should not be an key activity okay it should have a net owned funds it should have nidhi company should have net owned funds of at least rupees 10 lakhs it should have net owned funds of at least rupees 10 lakhs these are the four conditions which must be fulfilled within one year they have given a buffer period that at least within a period of one year from the date of incorporation these conditions must be fulfilled first of all 200 number of members we are still given one year to fulfill this condition then net own fund should be at least rupees 10 lakhs okay then your ratio of equity to debt should be 1 is to 20 should be maximum 1 is to 20 and then you should have some debt free unencumbered term deposits in your banks in your banks etc other than cooperative banks and the regional rural banks of at least 10 percent of the total out payable deposits okay whatever is your liability type side deposit into 10 percent this much amount should be kept in your term deposits as a security okay then after that after that this we have already done that it cannot engage in itself into any other business like chit fund etc but yes merger can be done as i have marked that point as important it can acquire any other company it can merge it can get merged with any other company only after passing a sr and after taking the approval from the regional direct right then then another thing another thing here is about the share capital another thing here is share capital generally they are telling generally they are telling that whenever an idi company issues shares right we had just studied it should have a paid up share capital of at least 5 lakhs etc then its share face value should be of at least rupees 10 okay one share should be of at least rupees 10 okay and if nidhi is issuing shares to any other members any other members then they are telling minimum 10 shares must be issued okay see what is their basic focus here is minimum rupees 100 value shares must be issued okay so say for example if the shares face value is 10 then at least 10 equity shares must be issued minimum okay if the shares value is say for example 100 then even if you issue one share to that particular member then that would suffice but if there is any such member if there is any such member who has put the money in our saving scheme who has put the money in our rd scheme then he should even if he is given one share of 10 rupees each that would be sufficient means 100 rupees requirement is not applicable your uh, 10 rupees share would be sufficient okay then uh, as we have already studied that there should be 200 members right at any point of time there should be 200 members in this nidhi company deposit can be accepted in the name of minor but minor cannot be a member right our parents can give the deposits in name of minor child but minor cannot directly become a member in the nidhi company coming on to the directors coming on to the directors now since nidhi is a company it should have directors also these directors should also be the members of nidhi if they are appointed at once then they can hold office up to 10 consecutive years there is no issue in that okay up to i am not telling that it is fixed 10 years but it can be any period up to 10 consecutive years if they want to come back again in the company any time then in that case after a cooling period of two years they have they can come back in the company right rotation of directors rotation of directors was not applicable in case of dormant company but it would be normally applicable here also okay din provisions would be applicable for director the din provisions would be applicable here disqualification of director provisions would so this everything would be applicable here because this is a normal company this is an active company right then going on to dividend going on to dividend in case of dividend in case of dividend nidhi company since it is having share capital it can pay dividend right it can pay dividend of maximum 25 percent it can pay dividend of maximum 25% or any higher sum as approved by the regional director 25% or any higher sum as approved by the regional director but there is one important clause here or we can say there are three uh, conditions which are to be fulfilled here first of all equivalent amount must be transferred in the general reserve as security okay as a reserve equivalent whatever amount of dividend you are paying equivalent amount must be transferred to the general reserve okay second one second one there should be no default in repayment of deposits or its interest and it should comply with all the provisions relating to nidhi then and only then it can pay the dividend okay then and only then it can pay the dividend exceeding that particular percentage okay going on to the next point which is talking about the auditors in case of nidhi company if an individual auditor is appointed then his tenure will be one term of five years 
firm of auditors two terms of five years after that if they want to get reappointed there will be a cooling period of two years and normally the auditor is going to submit his audit report and in that there has to be a specific point there has to be a specific point that all the provisions relating to nidhi have been complied just like auditor is giving a certificate that all the provisions provisions relating to nidhi have been complied okay and the last point is if nidhi company fails to comply with any of the provisions nidhi company or its officers in default or and its officers in default they will be liable to a punishment that is half of what we had studied in section 450 that is up to rupees 5000 and in case of continuing offence it will be up to rupees 500 per day right going on to the next one going on to the next one that is your registered valuers going on to the next one that is your registered valuers registered valuers uh, most important thing here is your section number 247 that is the act okay that is the provisions of the act where they say that if in a particular company if the company wants to get its assets liabilities property net worth goodwill if the company wants to get all the securities etc whenever the company wants to get these things value then the company shall appoint an experienced and a qualified person called to be a registered valuer and this appointment this point which i am going to tell you now this is super super important if in a company if we want to appoint a registered valuer then in that case the appointment has to be done by an audit committee if if we have an audit committee in the company and if we do not have an audit committee then in that case it will be done it will be done by the board of directors right now it is the responsibility of the registered valuer it will be the responsibility of the registered valuer to do it in a true manner to do it by an impartial way to do it by following all the relevant rules and regulations to exercise due diligence this is the responsibility this is the responsibility of the registered valuer he has to make sure that he complies with all these things okay and one important point here is as of now he cannot do any valuation of any asset in which he was interested in the last 3 years okay also the asset of which he is doing the valuation today he cannot get interested in that particular asset in the next 3 years so 3 years before 3 years after there should be no interest in any such asset of whose the valuation has been done right if any of the provisions have been contravened the normal penalty would be uh, normal punishment would be applicable if he has done purposely to defraud the company creditors etc then uh, different punishment or grievous punishment will be applicable there right and if he is convicted here then if he is convicted here then he will have to refund back his remuneration and he will have to compensate the uh, people who have suffered the losses right he will have to compensate the uh, persons for the losses that has been suffered because of this particular registered value right and the examination for this registered valuers etc is being conducted is been conducted by the uh, ibbi okay this i had mentioned in the regular batch also this is conducted by the ibbi right so this was this was of uh, all about your registered valuers this was all about your registered value section number 247 and the last point which is coming up here is talking about the removal of name of the companies from the register okay now here what are they telling everyone just concentrate here just concentrate here last few sections here now in section number 248 in section number 248 roc has the power to remove the name of the company on four grounds okay roc has the power to remove the name of the company from the register of the companies on four grounds first of all first of all if the company has had in had been incorporated but for a period of one year it did not do any business okay a second one second one if the company was an ongoing company but all of a sudden it stopped for a period of two years no business operations for the last two years and the company did not even obtain the status of a dormant company then the roc will give me a uh, show cause notice and i'll have to reply within a period of 30 days right next one next one is the subscribers to the moa who said that we will pay the money for the shares they did not pay the money within 180 days from the date of incorporation or if they, the roc comes to know after physical verification that the thing the object clause which was written in the moa that is different and the physically the company whatever business the company is doing that is altogether different then in such cases in any if any of the one cases are attracted then the roc has got the power that after giving us a reasonable opportunity of being heard roc can cancel the name of the company from the register of the company 
okay this the, in the first point roc was taking the steps similarly even we the company can pass a special resolution or it can take the consent of 75% of the members and it can say that yes sir a default has happened from our end and if any of these grounds are applicable then we can sue or motor go and make an application to the roc that please remove my name okay that please remove my name from the register of companies and if you are such a company if you are such a company which is regulated by a special act if you are such a company which is regulated by a special act then in that case then in that case we have to take the approval we have to take the approval from that regulatory authority also okay now suo moto thing is not applicable to section 8 companies because the provisions of section 8 company totally uh, restrict this particular matter that we cannot go and suo moto make an application for removal of name of the company then once all these things are done once all these things are done there is a public notice which is given that either roc is removing our name or we are suo moto going and making an application to the roc that our name be removed okay this is given to the general public so that even they come to know maybe if there are any shareholders maybe if there are any other creditors etc who are still not aware about this fact even they will come to know that the name of the company will be removed from the register of the company okay after after the roc has given us a reasonable opportunity of being heard after there is a communication between us and the roc if roc is satisfied that yes removal is justified if roc is satisfied that removal is justified then in that case roc will straight away strike off our name from the register of the companies it will issue it will issue an official it will issue a notification basically central government does it a uh, central government and below that we have the roc itself so roc gets it done through the central government central government publishes this notice in the official gazette and finally it is confirmed that yes the name of the company will be striked off and ultimately dissolution okay basically winding up is going to happen that is first liquidation is going to happen and then dissolution is going to happen but this does not relieve the directors from the liability which might arise in future okay if there are any liabilities which can arise in the near future the directors cannot say at that particular point of time that we are not liable okay directors managers etc officers in charge will still be liable they will still be liable for any liabilities which arise in the near future right then there were five cases then there were five cases where we cannot go and make an application basically it is a contra, uh, it is an opposite thing of section 248 subsection 2 in 248 to remember we were going and making an application to the roc that we want to remove our name now here they are telling that for a period of 3 months from a specific event you cannot go and make an application to the roc for removal of name okay suppose if you have changed your name or if you have changed your address from one state to another then wait for 3 months then go and make an application okay if you have disposed of majority of assets but you say that you have done in good faith or if you have done in ordinary course of business then wait for 3 months then only go and make an application or if there is a change in major change in the object clause major change in the object clause or if you have made an application for compromise or arrangement that is internal external reconstruction or if the company is already being wound up under companies act or under ibc if already winding up proceedings have been initiated then why to go and make an application here okay let's wait for the conclusion there so these were the five cases these were the five cases where you cannot go and make an application for a period of 3 months if you still go and make an application then either you will have to withdraw it or the roc is going to reject it and plus it is going to levy a punishment on you up to rupees 1 lakh okay fine up to rupees 1 lakh fine this punishment is to be remembered okay this punishment is to be remembered i have already star marked here uh, punishment fine up to rupees 1 lakh would be applicable there right and once once my name has been removed suppose assuming chalo assuming continuation of section 248 that is the first section assuming our name has been removed then in that case my certificate of incorporation will become invalid right my business operations will have to cease to operate now and and later on later on if any person claims any liability okay if any person claims any money from the company then the directors managers etc would still be liable they they cannot get relief from the liability that will be lifetime okay that will be lifetime and if you have made any application if you have made any fraudulent application because you wanted to defraud the creditors because you wanted to run away from them because you did not want to pay the money to them because you wanted to do window dressing before the creditors you wanted to show you wanted to show that no the company's position is very bad and that's why you made an application for removal of name then in that case boss this is treated as a fraud 
this is treated as a fraud and if it is treated as a fraud if it is treated as a fraud then in that case punishment under section 447 punishment under section 447 would be applicable okay punishment under section 447 would be applicable and going on to the last section going on to the last section that is appeal to the tribunal okay there are there were three ways there were three ways in this case in uh, appeal to the tribunal first case first case is when any particular person is aggrieved because of this ROC's order of striking of the name if any person is aggrieved and that person says that sir there were no grounds for removal of name there was no ground of section 248 which was present then to ROC removed our name then in that case you can go and file an appeal before the tribunal within a period of three years okay you can go and file an appeal within a period of three years before the tribunal and if the tribunal is satisfied it will order for restoring the name okay that was one thing second case second case if the roc itself thinks oh there was there was a mistake done from my end if the roc himself thinks that there was a mistake done from my end that i removed the name on some wrong information then roc so moto can go and make an application before the tribunal that sir please restore the name okay in the first point it was any person other than roc in the second one roc itself realized its own mistake so it is going and making an application it is going and filing an appeal within a period of three years or it is going and making an application basically if the tribunal is satisfied it will order the name to be restored and once the tribunal's restoration order is out then we have to go and submit it with the roc as usual everything has to be submitted to the roc within a period of 30 days and the last cases last cases where the company the members of the company where the creditors or the workmen if they are aggrieved and if they convince the tribunal that sir our name was wrongfully struck our company was into existence the business was going on in a decent manner and if the tribunal is satisfied then in that case if these people go and make an application within a period of 20 years 20 years from the striking of date okay or 20 years from the date when the order was published in the official gazette within 20 years if they go and make an application then in that case then in that case the tribunal can order for restoration and the company will send the company will be sent back the company will be sent back to the original position right so 252 is a resort available against the roc's order in which we went and we filed an appeal to the tribunal okay and with this with this we are done with the revision of the miscellaneous provisions Let's start with the revision of compromises, arrangements and amalgamations. In this particular chapter, first of all, the chapter is going to range between section number 230 to section number 240. The, the chapter is between, the chapter is between section number 230 to section 240 in which we are going to talk about the procedures, in which we are going to talk about the procedures of internal reconstruction as well as your external reconstruction. External reconstruction meaning your mergers, amalgamations, takeovers, etc. and as well as your internal reconstruction wherein the company where, wherein the company does some compromise, wherein the company does some kind of arrangement with its members internally or with it with its creditors internally. The most important section in the chapter is section number 230, the very first section. Now, if suppose the company wants to do any compromise or arrangement, if the company wants to do any compromise or arrangement, then that is that can be between the company and its members, it can be between the company and its creditors. Right? So, whenever uh, these people want to do any kind of arrangement, they'll have to go and make an application, they'll have to go and make an application to the tribunal along with the necessary documents. Okay, the broad three things in the necessary documents is first one, first one is the material facts about the company important facts about the company then if the scheme includes any scheme for reduction of share capital and whether the scheme if the scheme includes the details about the corporate debt restructuring then all these three details have to be included in that particular document that you are submitting it to the tribunal and then basically you are going and making an application to the tribunal for seeking their approval for seeking their approval for calling the meeting Okay, you are going and making an application to the tribunal so that the tribunal allows you to call a meeting for this particular compromise or arrange. Okay, when it's a case of corporate debt restructuring, first of all, the scheme must be approved by at least 75% of the secured creditors. And in that, you have to also submit some extra five things, which is first one, the creditor's responsibility statement in CAA1. Then the availability of, uh, then the liquidity report, which is to be submitted by the auditor. Then what about the 
position of other creditors are we going to protect their interest have we followed the rbi guidelines have we followed the rbi guidelines if the if this thing involves your banks etc and the valuers report okay even these things are to be submitted even these things are to be submitted to the tribunal when you are seeking the approval from the tribunal for calling a meeting for this particular purpose for this particular purpose if suppose the tribunal agrees then it will allow you to call the meeting if you want to call the meeting if you want to call the meeting then you'll have to give the notice you'll have to give the notice to every person it will be the creditors it will be the shareholders it will be the debenture holders all the members you will you're going to give them the notice at their individual addresses okay whatever is their individual addresses you'll have to give their the notice then you'll also advertise your notice by putting it on your company's website you are going to put it on uh, you you are going to give it to the sebi for putting it on their website you are going to give it to the recognized stock exchange wherever if your shares are listed all this you are going to do for advertisement of your notice so that everybody should come to know that our company is going to do this compromise or arrange okay whenever you are sending this notice to their individual addresses you have to give some annexures also okay the, the list is given here you can just refer it you have to give the annexure also example you have to give the details about the scheme you have to give the copy of the valuers report you are going to submit what is going to be the effect of this particular compromise or arrangement okay you have to give it along with the notice but when the notice is advertised on any website obviously then it is not possible to give the annexures along so then you can give a facility that you can collect these particular annexures from the registered office of the company right then after that after once the notice is given once the notice is given after that they can vote for this particular uh, resolution that is for this compromise arrangement these people can vote okay and if they want to raise any objections then the objections can be raised in case of shareholders objections can be raised by at least those who are holding 10% of the share holdings and in case of debt it can be raised by those who are holding at least 5% of the total debt only only then only then we are going to consider their objections otherwise we can go ahead okay also we are going to raise the objections from all our regulators okay example central government roc income tax authority sebi competition commission of india etc we are also going to ask them to raise their objections within a period of 30 days if they do not raise any objections within a period of 30 days then we'll assume that okay they do not have any objections after that after that after that we are going to call a meeting and then we are going to take the approval and in the approval for this particular scheme we are going to take a dual majority okay dual majority dual majority means when we talk about the numbers okay number of people who are voting in the meeting in that at least a simple majority of them should say yes for the meeting okay and then and then uh, once you get in terms of numbers then you have to go in the value and you'll have to check at least the people who have said yes are they holding at least 3/4 of the value are they holding at least 3/4 of the value of members or creditors who are voting in the meeting okay in the regular batch we have done a question on this also when you go and try the question answers you will get it there also once this dual majority thing has been done after that it is assumed as if the scheme has been approved and the uh, tribunal is going to pass the tribunal is going to pass the final order which will consist of the details of the scheme that what is going to be the effect of this compromise or arrangement okay example what are to be done with the preference shareholders what are to be done with the other creditors the other small creditors what if what are you are you going to issue shares with differential voting rights what are you going to do with the dissenting shareholders all those things you know whatever thing is supposed to be implemented now all those will be returned in this particular scheme and this will be approved by the tribunal okay then even the auditor has to give a statement that yes the accounting treatment has been given as per the respective accounting standard as per section number 133 even that is important and the tribunal's order tribunal's order has to be passed has to be filed with the roc just like every important document we file it with the roc similarly here also this particular tribunal's order we are going to file it with the roc within 30 days so that the roc can register this particular scheme right now try be uh, when we were calling for the meeting of if you remember when we were doing this dual majority thing etc uh, if at all any creditors meeting was required and uh, in that they have given a substitute that if suppose the tribunal if if not the tribunal suppose if the creditors if the creditors if initially itself they have agreed by uh, way of affidavit okay by way of affidavit if that has been signed by at least 90% of the value of creditors that they are agreeable to the scheme then they need not call for the meeting and take this dual majority of the creditors etc the meeting can be dispensed of okay means you can dispense of with calling the 
meeting there is no need to call the meeting because anyway here you have got 90% of the value of the creditors approved right when it comes to buyback suppose if your scheme contains any provision for buyback then you have to follow section number 68 when your scheme consists of any reduction of share capital then in that case then in that case then in that case section 66 is not applicable which talks about reduction of share capital means the tribunal's order is going to override section number 66 in case of section number 230 if suppose a listed if suppose an unlisted company is taking over any listed company then in that case this company automatically does not become a listed company it will have to go and make an application for this listed right and in the entire in the entire uh, section wherever we use the term tribunal if the compromise or arrangement is happening of a government company we are instead of tribunal the term that we are going to use the term that we are going to use that will be the central government means everything will be done by the central government like it was done by the tribunal in your section number 230 okay once the scheme is approved once the, once the scheme is approved in section number 230 as we just studied now once the tribunal or the central government as the case may be once they approve the scheme after that they have all the powers they have all the powers to supervise the implementation whether the implementation is done properly or not and they can also give directions that okay do implementation in this way don't do this do that etc the supervision and the directions can be done by the tribunal or the cg as the case may be and if at any time if the tribunal thinks that no this is not at all workable if the tribunal or the central government thinks that no this is not at all workable then in that case then in that case it can simply order it can simply order for winding up see internal reconstruction is one such way where we try to revive the company where we have already decided that we don't want to close the company but we want to revive this particular company if that does not work if that does not work then the last option that we have got then the last option that we have got that is your winding up then the tribunal can order for winding up in the section number 231 okay going on to the next section that is section number 232 which is talking about mergers and amalgamation whenever any particular company wants to uh, do any merger or amalgamation which includes any transfer of property then that can be done again we'll have to you know go to the tribunal we'll have to go to the tribunal we'll have to take the approval from the tribunal we'll have to give just like section 230 subsection 3 to 230 subsection 6 those provisions will be applicable that is we are going to give individual notices to everyone we are going to do the advertisement of our notice we are going to tell them to raise objections those 5% and 10% people we are going to tell them to raise objections we are going to tell the regulators to raise objections within a period of 30 days and then we are going to take a dual majority if it is approved by way of dual majority then the tribunal's order for merger and applic a merger and amalgamation is full and final right in this one extra thing that gets incorporated here is that whenever you were giving this particular notice okay whenever you are giving this particular notice advertisement of notice etc at that time you also have to intimate about the share exchange ratio that you would have adopted right the draft scheme of merger and amalgamation that you would have adopted the exchange ratio supplementary accounts have to be attached if your accounts are six months older right all these there are some extra documents there are some extra documents that you have to attach along with the notice because see in case of merger and amalgamation what will the shareholders see first they will first see that how much is the exchange ratio how many new shares are they going to get instead of the old shares they are holding so those respective things are to be attached along with the notice right once all this dual majority thing is done then the order of the tribunal is finalized tribunal will say that okay now the assets can be transferred liability can be transferred employees can be transferred legal proceedings can be transferred any charge which was there in the old company that will be transferred right then after that uh, what to, what is to be done with the dissenting shareholders how to pay them when to pay them all these things will be uh, decided by the tribunal and it will be documented by the tribunal in the order right similarly here also suppose if uh, just like i mentioned in the previous section in section 230 if section 230 consists of a scheme of merger or amalgamation then in that case if the taking over company okay the company which is taking over another company i mentioned it in already section number 230 if the purchasing company is an unlisted company and the selling company is a listed company then automatically the purchasing company does not become the purchasing company does not become a listed company it will have to go as per the process and it will have to get itself listed then ma'am what to do with the unlisted company uh, what to do with the um, descending shareholders what to do with the descending shareholders in case of descending shareholders you will have to pay them the amount the predetermined amount or the amount which is determined by the value will have to pay them 
and if at all that company was a listed company if at all that selling company was a listed company then we'll have to pay at least that much amount which is determined by the sebi okay ma'am why sebi has come into picture here because here the selling company was a listed company and if selling company is a listed company then maximum things will be regulated by the sebi similarly in case of fees in case of fees on the authorized share capital now since we are going to issue more shares maybe it can so happen that we'll have to increase our authorized share capital also if we want to increase our authorized share capital if we want to increase our authorized share capital then in that case then in that case we'll have to pay some fees to the roc to the central government etc then they are telling that whatever fees was paid by the selling company then that can be set off okay that can be set off here and you can take the credit of that particular amount and here also the auditor will have to certify that all the effect of the accounting standards or the relevant indices whatever is applicable that has been given as per section number 133 and again just like your section number 230 here also once the tribunal passes the final order we are going to go and submit we are going to go and submit it to the roc within a period of 30 days and we are going to fix a particular date we are going to fix a particular date and that date will be treated as a date as if on this date the amalgamation and merger was done see amalgamation or merger is a big process okay so we cannot write, write a range of the dates that from 1st april to 31st march the amalgamation was done we have to choose a specific date we have to decide a specific date that yes on this particular date my merger or amalgamation was done right and then uh, every year every year till this entire scheme is implemented uh, every year within a period of 210 days from the end of the year okay this is important from mcq point of view i had told in the regular lecture also within a period of 210 days from the end of the year you have to file a statement of compliance that all the compliance of the scheme has been done properly right and in this also in this case of merger amalgamation also in this case of merger amalgamation also wherever the term tribunal was used basically tribunal was coming into picture for supervising everything for giving the approvals So, in case of government company, everything will be handled by the central government. So, two thirty was a general section which was talking about compromise or arrangement. Two thirty one was talking about supervision and implementation. Two thirty two was talking about merger and amalgamation. Two thirty three is a specific section which is going to talk about. Two thirty three is a specific section which is going to talk about merger or amalgamation in certain cases where there is a merger or amalgamation between two or more small companies. when there is a merger of or amalgamation of holding company and wholly owned subsidiary company then they can make use of the section number 233 but there is a particular process which is applicable for that first of all first of all we are irrespective companies okay both the companies will issue the proposed scheme to the roc to the official liquidator and all those people who can be affected because of the scheme and it will tell them to invite uh, it will tell them to raise any objections etc within a period of 30 days Okay. After that, once they raise the objections, we are going to consider their objections, and then the scheme will be approved by shareholders who are holding at least ninety percent of the total number of shares. Okay. Once respectively the scheme is approved by uh, the shareholders of the respective company, then we are going to file a statement of solvency with the ROC. Both the companies are going to file the statement of solvency with the ROC that even after this merger or amalgamation, we are going to be a solvent company only, or our financial position will be. well enough good enough after that we are going to call the meeting of the creditors by giving them at least 21 days notice in writing and then in the creditors meeting also it should be approved by at least 90% of the value of the creditors okay this is one such level this is one such level basically where your scheme gets approved at least in house okay at least in house the scheme gets approved after that we are going to go and okay once the creditors meeting is done and it is approved then within 7 days we are going to go and file this particular scheme with the cg roc and the official liquidator in form number c double a 11 okay if roc and the official liquidator are satisfied then well and good the scheme gets approved immediately if they are not satisfied then they can raise objections before the central government okay they can raise the objections before the central government within a period of 30 days if central government thinks that yes the objection is sustainable means the objection of roc og uh, uh, roc and the official liquidator is sustainable then uh, central government will take this matter before the tribunal okay it will take the matter before the tribunal within a period of 60 days from the date of filing the cwa 11 right from 60 days from the date of filing cw11 it will take the matter to the tribunal and now finally the tribunal is going to decide whether it should be approved under 233 only 
as you had told me here whether it should be approved in 233 only or whether it should be taken under section 232 that is the general section okay and after that suppose now assuming assuming if, if the scheme is approved okay assuming the scheme is approved then after that the copy will be sent to everyone okay dissolution of the selling company is going to happen transfer of assets liabilities etc is going to happen legal proceedings will get transferred again that point of authorized share capital fees that set of thing that same provision will become applicable here also okay the most important thing here is the two companies about which we spoke that is the small companies and the holding and the wholly owned subsidiary company basically those two companies have an option whether they want to go for fast track merger under section 233 or whether they want to go under the normal merger and amalgamation procedure procedures under section 232 so basically there is no hard and fast rule for these two companies to go under 233 only or to go under 232 only right they can choose they can choose depending upon the subject or circumstances which exist in every company on those basis they can choose that they want to go under which section right then going on to the next one going on to the next one that is section number 234 which talks about merger and amalgamation with any foreign company okay if an indian company is getting merged or if a foreign company is getting merged with an indian company right your foreign company means any company which has been incorporated outside india irrespective of its place of business okay we don't have to see the definition of 242 which we had seen in the first chapter or second chapter here right but your foreign company means any company which has been incorporated outside india okay if suppose if suppose our indian company is getting merged with that or if suppose a foreign company is getting merged with an indian company then in that case three things are important here first of all first of all cg approval must be taken right cg rules must be complied rbi approval must be taken and then they are talking about the consideration the consideration can be in form of uh, cash the consideration can be in form of depository receipts also okay all the rules as specified by the central government all the rules as specified by the central government would be applicable going on to the next section going on to the next section that is section number 235 for section number 235 section 235 is very very simple section very very simple section 235 says that 235 talks about the scheme whenever whenever any transfer of shares happen okay say for example whenever um, a particular company is acquiring another company okay whenever a purchasing company is acquiring the selling company can i say the purchasing company will have to give the offer to the shareholders of the selling company because now the ultimate people who would be uh, uh, affected here is the shareholders of the selling company they their shares of the selling company will become of zero value and they are going to get new shares now so first of all we are going to give the offer okay this a purchasing company is going to give the offer to all the shareholders of the selling company okay it is going to give the offer to all the shareholders of the selling company and it will give 4 months time period to approve this particular uh, exchange ratio okay and within this period of 4 months within this period of 4 months at least 90% of the value of shareholders must be agreeable to the fact that yes they are okay with this particular exchange ratio okay now at the end of 4 months at the end of 4 months suppose if we get suppose if we get at least 90% of the approval see if we do not get 90% of the approval then in that case we'll have to prepare a new scheme but assume if we get 90% of the approval then in that case for the next 2 months we are also going to give more time more 2 months time we are going to give to the dissenting shareholders that we give you more 2 months time to accept our scheme okay two months time two months extra time see four months was given common for everyone to accept the scheme in this four months 90% assume they have ac uh, uh, accepted the scheme but still there might be some there might there may be some shareholders who are still not agreeable to this particular exchange ratio so we give them extra two months okay take more two months and then agree to the scheme if they do not agree again within a period of two months then within the next one month within the next one month we are going to acquire their shares okay within the next one month we are going to acquire their shares we are going to register their shares okay uh, we are going to basically compulsorily acquire their shares and then we are going to pay off the money by putting the money in a separate bank account okay the day when we acquire their shares the day when we acquire their shares we have to immediately transfer the money for their shares they are obviously going to get the consideration we are going to transfer their consideration in a special bank account in a separate bank account and from that separate bank account it will be paid to them within a period of 6 weeks 
so this is the treatment this is the treatment that is happening this is the treatment that is happening with these particular dissenting share okay going on to the next section which talks about section uh, which talks about purchase of minority share holding okay which talks about purchase of minority share holding say for example say for example if there is a particular group of shareholders who are holding at least 90% of the issued share capital now they already know that major decision making powers is in their hand only because if we want to pass sr also they can pass if they want to take any important decisions they can take etc so if there is a particular group of shareholders who are holding at least 90% of the issued share capital they can give a proposal to the minority shareholders they can give a proposal to the minority shareholders that you would like to acquire your holding also okay or alternatively even the minority shareholders can go even the minority shareholders can go and make a proposal to the majority ones that okay you can acquire our shares okay anyway we are we do not have any stand in the company you can acquire our shares right in this case in this case this particular process can be done this process can be done as per the provisions of section 236 here the valuations etc for the value of shares will be done this will be done the valuation etc will be done by the registered valuer as we have already studied in section number 247 that particular person is going to do the valuation of these shares okay so the consideration consideration will be paid by the majority to the minority and shares will be given by the minority to the majority and then once this is decided once this is decided the money will be transferred by the majority in a separate bank account and it has to be paid within a period of 60 days okay it should be paid the disbursement should happen within a period of 60 days the day when you the, the day when the shares are acquired okay the day when the majority gets the shares from that day within a period of 60 days the disbursement should happen if not done within a period of 60 days then it can be done within a period of 1 year okay it's not 60 days plus 1 year it is 1 year including this period of 60 days means we can get an extension we can get an extension of total total period of um uh one year including this original period of 60 days right acha similarly at the time of negotiation okay similarly at the time of negotiation similarly at the time of negotiation in case of minorities okay in case of minority if there is a majority in case of minority if there is a majority that is a particular person is holding at least 75% of the minority share capital see majority was holding 90% at least 90% suppose if in the minority we have 10% in that 10% also someone is holding at least 75% then in that case that particular person can have a good bargain that okay uh, i can give you the shares if you give me so and so extra amount so whatever extra consideration is received by this particular person that will be shared amongst all the minorities not only with this big minority it will be shared amongst all the minorities on pro rata basis okay i have given an example here i have given an example here you can just refer this example once so if suppose any minority person any minority person is negotiating okay if any minority person is negotiating here then that particular uh, consideration will be shared among all the minority shareholders right that will be shared among all the minority shareholders going on to the next section going on to the next section which talks about section number 237 which talks about act, um, merger or amalgamation by the central government in public interest merger or amalgamation by the central government in public interest if cg is of the opinion okay if cg is of the opinion here if cg is of the opinion that amalgamation should be done in public interest then in that case central government will prepare the scheme including the assessment and it is going to give to both the companies okay cg is going to wait cg should wait for a period of at least 2 months cg should wait for a period of at least 2 months for considering the objections and to decide on that particular thing if cg thinks that something should be changed then cg is going to change that in the scheme and then cg is going to uh, put the scheme of a uh, scheme including the assessment that is including the calculation for the exchange ratio it is going to publish it in the official gazette right if any person if any member of the you know the selling companies agree with this particular calculation then they can go and file an appeal before the tribunal within a period of 30 days once the decision of tribunal is out okay once the decision of tribunal is out that is full and final and then only cj will publish the final scheme in the official gazette and then only the merger amalgamation can happen that is transfer of assets liabilities legal proceedings etc only after that it can 
right so this was the procedure this was the procedure applicable for this was the procedure applicable for merger or amalgamation which is done by the central government in public interest then next section section number 238 section number 238 which says that when you were giving an offer when you were giving an offer in section number 235 that is this one 235 remember when you were given where you were giving 4 months time plus extra 2 months time etc before doing this before giving the offer to the shareholders before giving the offer to the shareholders you have to make sure that first of all your scheme is proper your scheme is proper it should contain the full exchange ratio details it should contain a good offer for the shareholders it should be appealing i had told you this word it should be appealing it should be attractive and it should contain a recommendation that yes the scheme is a very good scheme right it should be return it should be return in that particular offer that even uh, that uh, if the amalgamation etc happens then the cash necessary cash will be available for payment to the shareholders if any right then this particular scheme this particular scheme has to be registered this particular scheme has to be registered with the roc means before giving it to the shareholders in section 235 before giving those four months time to the shareholders before that you have to present it before the roc for its registration okay and if the roc is not satisfied with this particular scheme then the roc will raise the objection within a period of 30 uh, 30 uh, you, roc can raise an objection within a period of 30 days within a period of 30 days and if if you are aggrieved if you are aggrieved by the order of the roc that why is it rejecting it it should not reject our uh, scheme etc then you can go and file an appeal to the nclt you can go and file an appeal to the nclt so basically before giving the exchange ratio offer to the shareholders first give it to the roc take their approval if roc is not satisfied then appeal to the tribunal and then whatever is the decision of the tribunal on that basis only section 235 can become applicable after that section number 239 after that section number 239 239 says that whenever uh, the company uh, which was a selling company in case of merger or amalgamation the company which was a selling company in case of merger or amalgamation once it has been taken over it leads to dissolution of the selling company but what about the books of accounts etc so they are telling that the books of accounts can be disposed of no issues in that but that can be disposed of only after taking the prior approval of the central government okay once the central government allows you to dispose of then only you can do it and central government can it can it can appoint any person to do the inspection in the books of accounts to check whether any fraud etc was not done earlier now if central government is satisfied that okay we cannot there there was no fraud done etc if central government is satisfied relating to the uh, fraud relating to the formation of the company fraud relating to uh, uh, affairs of the company if cg uh, thinks that okay there was nothing the books of accounts etc is very clean okay then in that case then in that case then in that case central government will allow you central government will allow you to dispose of central government will allow you to dispose of the books of account and then section 240 says section 240 says that section 240 says that suppose if after amalgamation in case of a selling company if later on any liabilities arise if any liabilities if any offenses etc if something arises then also the directors officers managers of the old company they will still be liable and they will have to pay for that they will have to compensate for that particular liability they cannot say that our company has been dissolved now their liability is going to be an ongoing liability and the two case laws here from the old law the two case laws here from the old law is first one was uh, it was decided under your companies act 1956 that whenever whenever you want to raise any objection regarding the exchange ratio okay whenever you want to raise any objection regarding the exchange ratio then in that case only if you have a good reason for raising an objection then only you raise it before the court otherwise the court is not going to consider it okay you simply come and say that i have a problem that is not sustainable but if you justify that why this exchange ratio is not sustainable sustainable then only the court is going to you know interfere in the process and it is going to allow that particular person to raise an objection basically any baseless objections will not be considered by the court and the second one is just like earlier all the valuations etc were allowed to be done by the chartered accountants etc then if suppose the valuation has been done by the chartered accountants and if it has been agreed agreed by majority of the shareholders 
if it has been agreed by majority of the shareholders then in that case then in that case the small group of shareholders or some number of shareholders cannot raise any objection okay or if they even if they raise any objection but if it has been confirmed by the chartered accountants if it has been agreed by majority of the shareholders then their objection cannot be sustained right so this was this was all about this was all about your compromises arrangements amalgamation chapter whatever we have done in the revision even if you do this much even if you do this much it would be more than sufficient considering the weightage of the cap let's start let's start with the super quick revision of winding up chapter we are going to cover all the important sections we are going to cover all the important sections in this particular chapter uh first of all winding up first of all winding up is stretching from section number 270 from section number 270 to 365 but however from these from these particular sections some from this particular range some sections have been omitted some sections have been omitted by the mca itself that is few sections have been deleted by the mca and then further from the filtered section some sections have been deleted by the icai also okay now starting with starting with section number 271 starting with section we are as already mentioned we are going to do all the important sections which you have to remember on your exam day okay since this is a super quick revision so we are doing from the exam day point of view so first of all section number 271 states the cases section number 271 states the cases when 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 the company can apply when the company can apply or when the petition can be filed by any other person for winding up of a particular company there are there are in all five cases there are in all five cases where the petition for winding up can be filed first of all first of all when the company itself has passed a special resolution and the company wants to uh, wind up the company okay when the company wants to wind up itself basically at that time the company will pass a special resolution that is one option available another thing suppose if the company is acting against the interest of the country against the sovereignty of the country against the security of the country or it is uh, you know it is uh, affecting the friendly relations of our country with another state then in that case then in or the, the there is no decency etc when it is trading with some other country etc then in that case any person like your roc or your central government or your state government can file a petition with the tribunal for winding up a particular company or if the tribunal is of the opinion okay if the tribunal is of the opinion okay if the tribunal is of the opinion that the affairs of the company are not being managed properly it is managed in a fraudulent uh, manner or it is uh, going on in an unlawful purpose or some unlawful work is going on and it is better or it is proper to wind up the company then in that case then in that case the tribunal can wind up this particular company if the company has not filed its fs and the fs or the annual returns for the last 5 consecutive years okay for the last 5 years it has not filed its fs or the annual returns then in that case generally roc will come to know about this so roc can file a petition with the tribunal for winding up of this particular company and the last point is an extra point which says that if the tribunal thinks that it is just and fair that it, if it thinks that it is just and fair that the company should be wound up then in that case the company can be wound up these are the five cases this is the most important answer here these are the five cases these are the five cases uh, given under section 271 in which the petition for winding up can be filed okay now you would have understood by this time you would have understood by this time you would have understood that who all can go and file a petition before the tribunal see the company can go and file a petition company or we can say the shareholders if they pass a special resolution the roc can go and file a, a petition the central government or the state government can go and file a petition etc these are the people these are the people who can go and file a petition before the tribunal that yes we want to wind up this or we wish that if you can wind up this particular company okay now listen if the company goes and files a petition suo moto then company will have to submit a statement of affairs along with it statement of affairs was nothing but your rough balance sheet okay company will have to submit its rough balance sheet along with that petition but if but if but if suppose a petition is filed suppose if the petition is filed by any other person that is your roc central government state government then later on later on we will tell the company later on we will tell the company that it is required to submit that it is required to submit its statement of affairs to the tribunal so basically whenever the whenever the company suo moto goes and files a petition company will have to file the petition plus it will have to attach the statement of affairs 
right if any other person goes and files a petition with the tribunal then later on the company will be asked to submit the statement of affairs so that we come to know so that we come to know about the financial position of the company right now listen once the petition is filed once the petition is filed with the tribunal what steps can be taken by the tribunal either the tribunal can accept it and say yes we should wind up this company or it can say no it is utter nonsense you should not wind up the uh, you should not wind up this particular company right or it can appoint it can appoint just to determine a few things primarily it can appoint a provisional liquidator provisional liquidator is just like your irp interim person is there or when it is sure that yes winding up should happen then it can appoint a liquidator the final liquidator also which can be a company liquidator that is from the database of the ibc or it can be from the government servant that is the official liquidator we can appoint any particular liquidator and whatever decision is taken by the tribunal tribunal has to take that decision within 90 days okay once the petition was presented once the winding up petition was presented from that day within a period of 90 days the tribunal will have to take a final call that yes what are we supposed to do should we accept it should we reject it should we dismiss it what are we supposed to do that has to be done that has to be decided that has to be decided by the tribunal within a period of 90 days okay and the last point which was there na under section 271 that is the out of those five points the last point that is if the tribunal thinks that it is just and equi, uh, just and equitable that the company should be wound up then uh, see see, uh, see say for example if the company is nearly insolvent does not mean that the company should be wound up we should give some opportunity to the company to revive itself okay so basically the concept remains same as that of your ibc the first resort should not be liquidation the first resort should be revival okay the first resort should be revival and only after that only after that only after that if it is not possible then only liquidation winding up etc should come into picture okay <clears throat> now listen say for example say for example if say for example if the petition was filed if the petition was filed by the roc means or if it if it was filed by the cg or sg etc that is any person other than a company okay if suppose roc filed a petition against me that my company should be wound up then in that case now now the tribunal will tell me that against your company we have received a petition so please file your objections that what objections do you have against this particular petition and please file the statement of affairs okay now we are supposed now we are supposed to prepare this particular statement of affairs and we'll have to submit it now we'll have to submit it before the tribunal we have to submit our objections also and plus we'll have to submit the statement of affairs also so basically till now what has happened was in which circumstances the winding up can happen right then who all can go and file the petition then in which case statement of affairs is to be given when when the company files a petition company will give it immediately if any other person files a petition then we will have to submit the statement of affairs later on at a particular date right then comes your liquidator liquidator comes under your picture just like i told you if you want to appoint a temporary person you can appoint a provisional liquidator if you want to appoint a, a permanent person then you can go with the company liquidator or the official liquidator if i say company liquidator then he is a professional independent person we, which we are going to take up from the insolvency and bankruptcy uh, code and uh, or uh, uh, suppose if it's an official liquidator then we are going to take it from the government's database okay so basically we appoint a liquidator this person should be an independent person he should have proper knowledge about this particular industry liquidation right say for example if you are doing the liquidation of a company who is into telecom sector then that person should be having adequate knowledge about that particular sector right then this liquidator can be removed also suppose normal answer huh? suppose if he is, he is if he is not independent suppose he was indulged in any misconduct if he was convicted of any fraud if he is not capable of acting as a liquidator of this particular company if there is any lack of independence if there is any conflict of interest then this particular liquidator can be removed and if he is removed then his work will be transferred to some other liquidator who is going to continue with the work and if suppose our company has suffered any losses because of this particular liquidator then this liquidator will have to reimburse those losses right so all these all these things were happening here now listen as soon as as soon as your uh, liquidator is appointed we'll first intimate the liquidator that boss you have been chosen you have been chosen as the liquidator of this particular company we are going to intimate it to the roc that this particular company is going into liquidation we are going to intimate the stock exchanges wherever the securities are listed okay we are going to notify it in the official gazette suppose if the company is not a listed one then we are going to notify this in the official gazette that this particular company is going to be wound up so that basically everyone becomes aware so that basically everyone becomes aware that 
this company is going to go into liquidation and yes this is going to be a discharge notice to all the employees etc okay this is going to be a discharge notice means what means that now you can go tata bye bye now you can go out from the company see if the if we want to continue the company as a going concern then that's a different thing altogether but if you are going to ultimately wind up the company then this acts as a discharge notice to all the employees workmen etc that boss now your tenure in the company has got over now the company is going to close and now you can go out from the company okay then once the liquidator is appointed once the liquidator is appointed after that we are going to appoint a committee or we are going to form a committee we are going to form a committee called as winding up committee okay we are going to form a committee called as winding up committee which contains three people okay first one is the official liquidator second one is the nominee of the secured creditor and third one is a professional person and these three people will be sitting in the winding up committee the committee meetings etc will be convened by the company liquidator only and the main purpose of forming this particular committee is to monitor the proceedings okay this committee is going to this committee is going to monitor the proceedings that is the liquidator working properly or not okay are the assets rec getting recovered properly or not are the liabilities being paid properly or not is the valuation being done properly or not are the claims being settled in a proper manner or not all these will be monitored okay all these will be monitored by the winding up committee okay so we can say we can say at the lowest level at the lowest level we have the company liquidator above that we have the winding up committee and above that we have the tribunal okay at the lowest level at the lowest level we have the company liquidator then we have the winding up committee and then we have the tribunal so if the company liquidator wants to communicate with the tribunal okay then it has to go through the winding up committee okay so first the company liquidator will submit the draft to the winding up committee winding up committee will approve it and then only it gets submitted to the main committee um, it will get submitted to the tribunal right okay now listen now listen suppose if once the winding up starts okay once the winding up starts just like your moratorium okay just just like just like your moratorium okay just like your moratorium you are also if there are any legal cases if there are any legal cases which are going on if there are any legal cases which are going on by the company or which are going on against the company then all will pause remember moratorium all will pause here also and but but what they are telling is if suppose if you want to continue with any particular case then you can take an approval from the tribunal okay you have to take the tribunal's permission then only that case can continue but for supreme court uh, supreme court case or the high court case no approval of tribunal is required that case can continue as it is so basically they are trying to say if any case is going on in any lower court and if you want to continue that case even during the winding up is going on that time you'll have to take the approval from the tribunal right okay then now now here they are talking now they are talking about now they are talking about some duties powers etc of the liquidator that what all things are supposed to be done by the liquidator okay what all things are supposed to be done by the liquidator now once the tribunal once the liquidator comes into picture he will now start seeing he will now start checking everything okay he will now start checking everything that uh, you know uh he will start taking the value he will start doing the valuation of the assets he will start checking the contracts entered into by the company he will start checking the liabilities of the company the contingent liabilities of the company he will start valuing the assets like we already discussed he will start checking the guarantees given by the company he will start checking the list of the contributors who are the shareholders from whom we can call the money in case of any shortfall who uh, in which all companies has our company invested that is our subsidiary companies our joint ventures etc or who is our holding company etc it is going to find each and every fact it is it is going to try to find each and every fact about the company and a report upon all these things will be submitted to the tribunal so that you know we are keeping the tribunal in the loop we are keeping tribunal in the loop that whatever done work is done by the company liquidator a report of that has to be submitted to the tribunal mandatory okay a report on that has to be submitted by the company liquidator to the tribunal mandatory also the company liquidator will write in that particular report whether it has found any fraud or not okay whether it is viable for the company to continue in the future or not if it is viable then yes we can plan for revival and right? all these you know its opinion the company liquidator's opinion can be written in that particular right and now once the tribunal receives this report once the tribunal re receives this report from the company liquidator then it will decide that whether it's a small company whether it's a medium sized company whether it's a large company how much time will it will it take for winding up the process etc so now the tribunal is going to fix a time period it is not fixed for every company yeah? 
it is not same for every company so it is totally subjective the tribunal is going to fix a time period that within so and so time within so and so time the winding up should get over and the time period can be extended also no issues in that in india this is a very common thing so it can be extended also suppose if investigation is required then tribunal can order for investigation if it thinks that there is any fraud etc involved and all those things will follow after that okay now we're talking about the physical custody of the company's assets okay talking about the physical custody of the company's assets whatever assets were kept in the company okay whatever assets were were kept in the company all those assets will now vest with the company liquidator means basically the custody comes with the company liquidator okay if the company's assets were kept with the director of the company if the company's assets were kept with some shareholder of the company everything will now come everything will now come in the hands of the liquidator just like your insolvency okay just like your ibc everything all the control all the control now comes okay all these uh, administrative controls now comes in the hands of the company liquidator and suppose if the company liquidator needs more information if it needs more information about the things which are written in the books of accounts then it can seek the information it can call for the information from the promoters of the company from from the directors of the company from the officers of the company and it is their responsibility to cooperate with the liquidator and to provide with the necessary information we okay, to cooperate with them and to provide with the necessary information if not done then penalty will be applicable no issues in that okay now the next section section number 285 this is an important section which says that how do we settle with the contributories or how do we you know call the money from the contributories from whom are we supposed to call the money etc this is the same thing which we had studied in our ipcc now just try to understand i'm just revising i'm just revising this entire section for you say for example if it's a company say for example if it's a company which is limited by shares okay if there is a particular company which is limited by shares and now that company goes into liquidation then the shareholders liability will be limited up to the unpaid amount the shareholders liability will be limited up to the unpaid amount so whatever is their unpaid amount on the shares that much amount they have to bring now at the time of liquidation okay this we are talking about the present contributories now let's go to the past contributories first we are going to try to recover the money from the present ones only if that money is insufficient then only we go to the past contributories if we go to the past contributories we go to only those shareholders who have who have left our company during the last one year we cannot go to the old ones okay only the ones who had left our company during the last one year we can go to them and if there was any unpaid amount on those shares then we can call the money from them okay this happens in case of unlimited uh, this happens in case of a company limited by shares okay and yes one more important thing to be checked here is suppose if the person the past contributor left our company say for example 6 months back okay but the liability for which we are raising the money that arised now that just arised then we cannot call the money from that past contributor because he was not at all liable for that particular liability which is arised now okay so two conditions should be there first of all at the the time when he left the company at that time the liability should be due and he should have some unpaid amount only then we can call the money from the past contributor okay so basically if a company is limited by shares then the liability of the shareholders is restricted up to is restricted up to the unpaid amount or the proportionate liability that is due from him whichever is lower when it's an unlimited company which generally nowadays no one forms but then too if it is an unlimited company then we can call whatever money from the present shareholders whatever we want to call we can call from them okay then if it's a company which is limited by guarantee okay if it's a company which is limited by guarantee then whatever amount whatever amount was guaranteed by that particular person okay whatever amount was guaranteed by that particular shareholder we can call that much amount plus plus if there is any unpaid amount on the shares we can call that much amount also okay in case of guarantee what happens is whenever they had subscribed to the shares okay whenever they had subscribed to the shares they would have guaranteed that at the time of liquidation i will pay 25000 for example so now it's time for them to give that 25000 okay okay now now say for example say for example suppose if later on during this particular process of liquidation during this particular process of liquidation uh they say that by default rule is the directors of the company the officers of the company the managers of the company they are liable Un, in an unlimited manner okay directors managers etc they are liable in an unlimited manner because there is an inherent assumption that if the winding up is happening in the company that is because of this mismanagement which is done by the director so their liability is unlimited see if they are having any shares in the company then that liability is separate but because just because they were the directors managers in the company so their liability so their liability becomes unlimited but if they prove that no i was not liable 
if they had left our company in the last before the last one year then they are not liable if the liability arises after they cease to hold the office then they are not liable so these are basically the exceptions apart from that apart from that apart from that if you are simply the director or manager of a particular company then you are by default liable in an unlimited okay then comes another company uh, committee then comes another committee called as advisory committee called as advisory committee as you can identify from the name itself advisory committee is the committee which basically it can it you know it uh, holds the meeting of the creditors it holds the meeting of the contributories and then it hears it listen to their wishes okay it listens to their wishes and then it advises the company liquidator it advises the nclt that what is to be done an advisory committee actually advisory committee constitutes of 12 members which are selected out of the members and the credit uh, members and the creditors only so basically we are selecting the representatives from the creditors and the contributories we conduct their meeting the meeting is chaired by the company liquidator etc and then we decide that what is their wishes what are we supposed to do are we getting any new idea from them or not and then after that after that considering after considering their views only the company liquidator takes any further decision okay suppose if there is any conflict suppose if there is any conflict between the advisory committee and the other creditors and the members then in that case we are going to listen to the creditors and the members because in the advisory committee we just have a small portion of that we just have 12 members but if the other members say that no the decision of the advisory committee is wrong then it is wrong advisory committee is just a representative okay it's just a small portion of the members or the creditors and the advisory committee has got all the rights to you know inspect the books papers of the liquidator to check the custody of the assets etc they have got all the rights okay and whatever work whatever work is done by the tribunal whatever work is done by the tribunal tribunal has to keep on reporting okay tribunal has to keep on reporting to the uh, uh, company liquidator has to keep on reporting to the tribunal from time to time okay generally it is on quarterly basis but time to time the company liquidator has to report it to the tribunal that what kind of work is going on what things have been completed what things are still left etc those things have to be reported on quarterly basis by the company liquidator to the tribunal right now now listen uh, can i say can i say company liquidator works on the directions of the tribunal company liquidator works on the directions given by the tribunal so what all powers what all powers can be exercised by the company liquidator after taking the approval from the tribunal it can sell off the movable asset it can sell off the immovable property it can it can raise some short term funds if required it can handle any legal cases just like we had studied before it can handle the high court supreme court cases it can invite people for their claims whose all money is pending come and tell me just like in ibc like we used to do public announcement okay it can settle the claims okay if it thinks that it is possible to run the company for a for a particular period it can run the affairs of the company right if it thinks that if it thinks that if it thinks that we require a professional advice from the valuer we require some professional advice from a chartered accountant we require a professional advice from a company secretary it can seek those advices etc these are the powers these are whose powers these are the powers of the company liquidator which it can exercise but only after taking the approval from the tribunal okay these are very very these are very very general answers and see now you are they have elaborated on their professional advice that cl can appoint the company liquidator can appoint professional uh, it can appoint a chartered accountant it can appoint a cs it can appoint a legal practitioner etc to assist him okay in the above we were just taking their advice here we are appointing that particular person in the company just like we can say that he he is going to act for a uh, for a larger period okay in the above point the, the thing that we studied that is to obtain professional advice that is we will submit a particular matter we will take the advice and here we are appointing them here we are appointing them for a longer period where we are going to seek their advices on various matters okay but again we have to just check again we just have to check that there is no conflict of interest okay there is no conflict of interest there is no problem of independence etc and just like i had told you just like i had told you in advisory committee in advisory committee we have the creditors and contributories only right so whenever required see i ideally advisory committee consists of the creditors and the members only so we listen to them we take their we uh, consider their views etc okay alternatively alternatively if we want more people to give their views we can even call the meeting of the creditors and the contributories etc 
See, in advisory committee, the numbers are restricted. It is restricted to twelve. But when we go to the creditors and contributors, the numbers increases. So we can call their meeting also to ascertain their views, to ascertain their views, or to listen to their views, or to listen to their ideas. We can call their meeting. Also. Right? Then the next thing, section number two hundred and ninety-three, which talks about the books of accounts of the company liquidator. Okay, now the company liquidator, if he is selling any particular asset, he will record it in the books. If he is paying to any creditors, he will record it in his books, etc. So these books have to be properly maintained by the company liquidator. Okay, and these books can be inspected. These books can be inspected by the members, by the creditors, by the advisory committee, etc. Subject to the rules. Okay, generally what happens? We are going to study it further. Generally, what happens when the creditors, members, etc., when they come and inspect, then there are certain rules applicable. But when there is CG or SG inspecting the books of accounts, then no rules will be applicable for. Them. Okay, and once they inspect the books of accounts, suppose once the company liquidator maintains the books of accounts, they are also required to get it audited. Okay, CL also has to get his books of accounts audited, and the report will be submitted. One copy will be submitted to the tribunal. Another copy will be submitted to the. I will see this audit report copy will be submitted. Okay, this will be submit to the tribunal, and another copy will be submitted to the IRS. Right now, listen. Now listen. One important point here, which I had already marked in our batch was, if suppose the company which is into liquidation is a government company. Okay, the, if the company into liquidation is a government company, then along with your tribunal, along with your ROC, you are also required to submit the report of this particular audit. This audit report is also supposed to be submitted to the member of that government company. If CG is a member, report has to be submitted to the CG. If SG is a member, report has to be submitted to the SG. If both of them are the members, then the report has to be submitted to both of them. Right? Then the next thing that they are telling is, suppose if, suppose if this is a very simple section which they say that. Suppose if uh, uh, you are a company and you have a contributory, okay, you have a shareholder from whom you are supposed to take the money, okay, from the contributory you have to receive the money. But suppose if you already have his advance money kept with you, then you can set it off. Okay, then you can set it off. Okay, suppose suppose if uh, your company is into surplus, even during liquidation, suppose if your company is into surplus and if you want to distribute the surplus to the contributory, if you want to pay any amount to the contributory. And if any amount was due from the contributory, then even that can be existed. Okay. Similarly, it can happen in case of a director who is also a shareholder. If there is any amount which is due, then that can be set off against the amount which is paid. But the one thing, one thing which cannot be set off is the dividend. Okay. One thing which cannot be set off is the dividend. Say for example, say for example, if you have to take some amount from the contributory. Say for example, if you have, if you want to take ten thousand rupees from the contributory. And now the contributory says, no, no, I have not received the dividend for the last five years, so I am not going to pay this ten thousand. So is it allowed or is it not allowed? Obviously, it won't be allowed because, ah, uh, provided it is an, provided it is an undeclared dividend, ah, uh, provided it is an undeclared dividend. Suppose if it's a declared dividend, then yes, it is a liability of the company. But if it is an undeclared dividend, then the contributory cannot say that it, my money will, my uh, amount will be set it off against this particular dividend because announcing of dividend or payment of dividend is not. Right, and the next one, next one that they are telling us here is whenever, whenever the company faces any deficit at the time of liquidation, maybe because the liability is more. Okay, maybe because the liability is more, maybe because of the liability is more, then the company can call for the money. Or whenever there is any calls in arrears, whenever there is any calls in arrears, at that time also the company can call the money from the contributory. It has got the rights. Okay, the company law says that there is no specific provision required for that, but the company has got the rights that it can call the money from the contributors. Okay, and if at all there is any surplus, suppose if at the end if there is any surplus after do, after making payment to all, then whatever is the surplus left is distributed amongst all the equity shareholders in the ratio of their paid up share capital. Okay, the surplus gets distributed among the equity shareholders. This we already know, but this gets distributed amongst all of them in the ratio of the paid up share capital, right? Then after that, after that, say for example, if if the company liquidator is of the opinion, suppose if the company liquidator is of the opinion that the books of accounts of the company is kept with a particular person, or if the property of the company is kept with any particular person, then we can call that particular person before the tribunal. Okay, we can call that particular person before the tribunal. The tribunal has the right to question that particular person about: Do you have the books of the company? Do you have the assets of the company or not? And accordingly, the decision accordingly the uh, or not decision accordingly the steps will be taken by the tribunal. 
Suppose if the tribunal comes to know that yes, this person is in possession of the books of accounts of the company, then the tribunal will recover. The tribunal will take, will try to seize the book, the books of accounts of the company. If the tribunal thinks that this particular person is having the assets of the company, which actually belongs to the company, then it will try to recover those assets from that particular person. Right? Similarly, similarly, if the tribunal is of the opinion, or if the company liquidator is of the opinion that the promoters, directors, etc. they are involved in some fraud okay or some assets are there with them or some books of accounts and papers etc are there with them then also the tribunal can call them for inspection etc will call them for inspection etc and it will make sure to give a final decision that whether they are having the books of accounts in their custody whether they are having the assets in their custody or not okay and if suppose these people if suppose any of these people are trying to run away or if any of these people are trying to leave india if any of these people are trying to leave secretly absconding okay then in that case if we come to know about them okay if suppose a particular person is trying to avoid the call money payment if a particular director is trying to run away from his unlimited liability and if we come to know then we can we can seize that we can arrest that particular person okay we can uh, stop that particular person from leaving india okay i don't know how much practically it is happening but anyway we can stop that particular person from leaving india similarly if that person is leaving with some assets we can seize the assets of that particular person if that person is leaving with the books of accounts of the company we can seize those books of accounts of the company so basically tribunal has given the uh, the company law has given the powers to the tribunal that all these things can be done okay and once the winding up happens once the winding up happens once the winding up is over after that ultimately the company is dissolved the dissolution order is passed by the tribunal just like every other law the dissolution order is passed by the tribunal once the dissolution order is done after that the company liquidator is supposed to submit it to the roc basically we are intimating it to the roc that boss liquidation of this particular company has been complete right then going on to the next one what is the priority of payment okay going on to the next one that is what is the priority of payment how are we supposed to make the payment what is the sequence of payment in case of winding up so first of all we are supposed to pay first of all we are supposed to pay uh, to the overriding or we are supposed to do the payment for the overriding preferential payments okay overriding preferential payments in that in that i am combining the provisions as well as the proviso in that first we are supposed to pay uh, the dues to the uh, we are supposed to pay the wages and salaries to the workmen and the compensation to them under the industrial disputes act for the last 2 years for the last Two years we are supposed to pay, and we are supposed to pay the accrued holiday remuneration to the workmen. Okay, this is the first thing. This is the first thing that we are going to pay in full to the uh, employees or to the workmen under this Industrial Disputes Act, etc. Right. After that, after that, after that, we are supposed to make the payment in pari passu to the workmen, to the other workmen who could not be paid in the first point. We are supposed to make the payment to the workmen, and we are supposed to give the money to the secured creditor. Okay, just remember one thing: all this money, whatever we are studying in section number three hundred and twenty-six, all this is paid out of the secured asset only. All this is paid out of the secured asset which was given to a secured creditor. So this money not only belongs to the secured creditor; this has to be shared by the workmen also. Okay, just like IBC year also they have given priority. Year also they have given the priority to the workmen. Okay, so first we are going to pay to them under section three hundred and twenty-six. then we are going to go then we are going to go and make the payment of all the winding up expenses okay all the expenses and cost of the winding up will be paid then okay after that comes section number 327 where we are going to do some preferential payments that is we are going to pay the government taxes for the last 12 months we are going to pay the wages or the salaries for the last 12 months and out of that also we are going to pay only for the 4 months in preference in priority okay then we are going to pay the accrued holiday remuneration to the employees earlier we paid to the workmen now we are going to pay to the employees okay similarly if any employers contribution was due to any fund like provident fund e esic etc if any contribution was paid if any contribution was due then we are going to pay that if any compensation was payable under the compensation act workmen compensation act then that has to be paid here if any money was due from the provident fund to the employee then we are going to pay that to the employee first and any other investigation expenses which were due from the company we are going to pay these seven points proportionately okay as it is written here as it is written here all these will be ranked equally all these will be ranked equally means all these will be paid in proportionate all these will be paid in pari pass right 
and all these are paid in the priority okay all these are paid in priority to all the unsecured debts so first we paid 326 then we paid the winding up expenses then we made the preferential payments under 327 then we are going to pay to the creditors who are secured by the floating charge then we will go to the other unsecured creditors then preference shareholders and then equity shareholders okay this is the sequence this 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 particular thing this particular thing is the sequence that we have to apply whenever we are doing winding up as per the companies that please do not mix up please do not mix this up with the ibc schedule ibc is to be followed when we are doing liquidation under ibc this is to be followed when we are doing liquidation under the companies right then going on to the next section next section is a little important section number 328 which we have studied in ibc again fraudulent preference that is if the company in this subsection one says that if suppose the company has given preference okay if suppose the company has given preference to any creditors of the company and it has put that particular creditor in a better position in the six preceding six months before the winding up had commenced and if later on we come to know that no this is not in a ordinary course of business then this will be totally then this will be uh, the position will be totally restored okay the position will be totally restored the tribunal will say that please reverse back the transaction if you have given any wrong preference to any creditors during the last six months and similarly if you have fraudulently transferred the property of the company to any person which is actually not done for a proper consideration or which is not done in ordinary course of business and if it was done during the last six months then again the transaction will be treated as invalid the tribunal will simply declare the transaction as invalid and once the tribunal declares the transaction as invalid then even the company liquidator treats that transaction as void okay now now the powers with the tribunal is there for all the transactions which were done during the last six months but the company liquidator can treat that particular transact all those transactions which were done during the last 12 months as void ab initio if they were not done in ordinary course of business and if they were not done for a valuable consideration then the company it, it the transaction becomes void against the company liquidator that is the company liquidator will treat the transaction as void ab initio as if the transaction has never ever Okay, now suppose if, suppose if, suppose if the company wants to transfer any assets. Okay, if the company wanted to, see now we have already studied that company cannot give any preference to its creditors. Okay, okay now is suppose, suppose if it is done in ordinary course of business, then, there's, then there is no problem. But if it is not done in ordinary course of business and if it wants to give the preference to the creditors, then that was totally prohibited as per section 328. So the company devises another method, the company transfers the assets to the trust or the company transfers the money to the trust and then the trust gives it to the creditors. So they say that this is also not allowed. First of all, first of all, fraudulent preference is not allowed and you cannot even involve any trust in between and you cannot pay to them also. Okay, and listen one more thing, suppose if the transaction gets reversed. Okay, suppose you were trying to give any fraudulent preference to the creditors and if the tribunal says that no, this transaction is invalid then the transaction will be reversed okay but then too then too the amount which was due to the creditor he will still receive it okay whatever amount was due to the creditor he is still going to receive right his interest won't get affected the only person actually who is getting punished is the company who was trying to give the fraudulent preference now similarly for the floating charge similarly for the floating charge if suppose the company had created any floating charge okay if uh, suppose the company had created any floating charge on the assets of the company during the last 12 months before the winding up then they are telling that that floating charge will be treated as invalid okay that floating charge will be treated as invalid but the money of those creditors i had given the example of the debenture holders the money of those debenture holders will be secured to the extent of the principal amount plus interest at the rate five percent on it five percent per annum interest on it but if the company proves that at the time when the charge was created, at that time the company was solvent, then the charge will be treated as a valid charge. Okay, means basically they are trying to say if the charge was created in good faith, then no problem. But if the charge was created when the company was insolvent, then in that case that charge will be treated as invalid. And now, but the money of the creditor will be secured. The principal amount plus the 5% interest per annum will be secured. This amount he is 100% going to get then the next concept that we did was onerous property suppose if the company liquidator comes to know suppose if the company liquidator comes to know that that uh, a particular property which is there in the liquidation estate that is a burdensome property 
okay this property is going to give us a heart attack this is a burdensome property because of this property our liquidation estate is not going to increase but it has reduced then in that case the tribunal can decide to disclaim that property okay it can say that i withdraw all my rights i withdraw all my rights from this particular property so now you are the tribunal so now you are the liquidator can make an application to the tribunal within 12 months from the date of commencement of winding up or 12 months from the date when the liquidator becomes aware about this owner's property whichever is later within this time within this time it can make an application to the nclt and it can make an application for disclaiming of the property if the tribunal is satisfied it will allow the liquidator to disclaim that particular property okay it will generally happen when when the property is burdened with debt if the property title is not clear if the uh expenses are more than the benefit that we are going to get from this particular property if the contracts in which we have entered if the investments which we have done in the joint ventures etc if those are loss making then in that case we can disclaim those properties right acha similarly similarly if this property was a mortgage property then suppose if it was mortgaged with a bank then bank becomes a interested party interested party will get a heart attack if this property is now treated as an onerous property so it will get go and make an application to the cl asking that boss are you going to disclaim this property or not and the liquidator is supposed to reply within a period of 28 days plus the extended period that what call it has taken whether it wants to disclaim the property or whether it is going to keep the property and accordingly later on the decision will be taken to disclaim either to disclaim or to keep the property with the liquidity similarly here suppose if you want to exit from any contract okay contract is also your asset contract is also your property suppose if you want to exit from any contract and if that contract asks you to pay any penalty if that contract asks you to pay any compensation then you'll have to pay that from the liquidation estate and then only you can exit from there okay then only you can exit from am i very very clear with this this this, uh, this was this was all about the most important point this was all about the most important points about your onerous contracts or disclaimer of the onerous property okay now now just try to understand once the winding up has started company loses all the rights okay once the winding up has started company loses all the rights for you know doing any major change for doing any major change in the company example change in its share capital okay selling of any assets change in its assets etc no the company cannot do now because now there is a shift of control so if the company does any such thing without tribunal's permission then that will be treated as void okay if the company does any such thing without the approval of the tribunal then that thing will be void okay that cannot be done now once the winding up has started your asset cannot be attached by any other person okay your asset cannot be mortgaged by any other person except for the government taxes for government taxes they can attach your property no issues in that but any say for example you want to raise some short term funds for that bank ask for any property etc no you cannot give any mortgage but if the government wants to okay if the government wants to attach your property for recovery of the tax due yes it can be done yes it can be done okay then next section is talking about the penalties etc suppose if suppose if any particular person in the company does any default with the liquidator ma'am what kind of default he does not give all the information to the liquidator he does not disclose everything to the liquidator he does not gives the books of accounts books and papers to the liquidator he does not he does not uh, gives the assets to the liquidator etc he omits some very important thing about the company he gives any false information about the company and that particular person would be liable with a with a non compoundable offense okay that particular person will be liable with a non compoundable and then once the company is into liquidation okay once the company is into liquidation whatever office stationery is there of the company okay whatever office stationery is there of the company its bills documents letter heads etc everywhere it should be written everywhere it should be written that yes the company is into liquidation so that everyone so that everyone comes to know about it that yes the company is going to go into liquidation or the company is into liquidation okay and whenever you want to find out any fact about the company okay whenever you want to find out any fact about the company the first thing the first thing that you are going to check is the books of accounts of the company okay that is a prima facie evidence for each and every matter see if you want to go into detail then you can you know gather the things from different different sources but the prima facie the primary uh, place is nothing but the uh, uh, the books of accounts of the company 
okay and these books and papers this i had already mentioned earlier books and papers of the company can be inspected by creditors contributory subject to the rules and regulations and it can be inspected by the government with no rules and regulations means if the government wants to inspect it then no rules and regulations will be applicable okay once the company is wounded up once the dissolution etc is done now the company can dispose of its books of accounts and papers you had told me that it can dispose of the books of uh, books of accounts papers etc first it will preserve for some number of years that is 5 years okay the company liquidated has to preserve the books and papers of the company for a period of 5 years after a period of 5 years <coughs> sorry after a period of 5 years no one would be liable for those books and papers means after a period of 5 years even if you don't preserve it properly or even if you destroy it that's absolutely all right okay now listen the next important thing here is on which a question can be tested that is suppose if once a liquidator decides that okay so and so amount is payable to the creditor so and so amount is payable to the contributory etc now at the time of payment if the company liquidator thinks that oh this creditor is untraceable this contributory is untraceable this is possible okay this is 100% possible then the company liquidator will keep on trying will keep on trying for a period of 6 months it will try to find out that creditor it will try to find out that contributory for a period of 6 months if within a period of 6 months also it is not able to pay to the creditor and the contributory it will deposit their due amount in a special account called as company liquidation dividend and undistributed assets account it is going to transfer in that particular account okay the money will be kept the money will be kept in this particular account for a period and uh, the, uh, the money will be kept in this particular account for a period of 15 years okay and if later on that creditor or the contributory comes in the picture and he says that i want my money then he can go and claim it from the roc okay because this account this company liquidation dividend blah 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 account is under the control of the roc so that person that creditor or the contributory can go and make an application to the uh, to the roc and then the roc can pay the money out of that particular account okay if the money is kept in that particular account for a period of 15 years then after that it gets transferred to the general reserve account of the central government from that also the money can be taken no problem in that but the account changes okay and in is, uh, the primary responsibility is with the liquidator liquidator cannot keep the money with him uh. he can keep it for a period of 6 months no doubt in that but later on he has to deposit in that special account and then from the special account it goes to the general reserve account if he retains the money with himself he can be liable for expenses he can be liable for termination he can be removed his remuneration can be seized plus he can be also liable for interest at the rate of 12% on the money that he had wrongfully retained with himself okay and all these just to keep a control on all these things liquidator is supposed to submit returns okay liquidator is sub supposed to submit returns to the tribunal from time to time okay if the liquidator does not sub submit it with the, uh, before the due date then it will get a uh, what do you say a warning it will get a warning from the tribunal to submit it within a period of 14 days if it still does not submit the returns etc within the 14 days from the due date then it will be liable for the penalties no issues in that right then again a general section general section said that if suppose whenever we are calling the meeting of the creditors whenever we are calling the meeting of the co contributors etc and whenever we take their vote then how are we supposed to ascertain their vote so the answer is in case of creditors we are going to take the value we will take their value value of the debt and in case of contributories we are going to take their voting power so as to give a proper fair fair uh, treatment to the voting which is done by the creditors and the contributor okay again a general section which says that whenever you are preparing any affidavit okay before whom are you supposed to go and swear okay before whom are you supposed to go and swear so it can be before it can be before the court it can be before any government servant it can be before any authorized person just like notary or before any gazetted officer when it's outside india it can be before the dip, uh, before an indian diplomat or it can be before any consulate officer before these people you can go and sign these people can attest it which means that yes the affidavit is certified okay similarly similarly now last point here suppose if suppose if the winding up is done the dissolution order was passed by the tribunal but later on if any person thinks that no this dissolution was not correct it should not have happened 
then in that case that person can go and make an application to the tribunal within a period of 2 years from the date of dissolution and if the tribunal thinks that yes the dissolution order was not proper then the tribunal can restore the position means it can say that the dissolution is void and now the company becomes an active company and this order we are supposed to go and file as usual this order we are supposed to go and file with the roc so that even the roc comes to know that yes now this company has been deemed as an active company okay and in the entire chapter wherever they are using the word the winding up has commenced winding up has commenced is nothing but the date when we had filed the petition under section 270 uh, 271 the circumstances in which the petition were filed or the people who had who had filed the petition under section 272 whenever that was then that was the date when it will be deemed as if the winding up had commenced okay so this was this was an overview this was an overview of all the important sections of all the important sections of this particular chapter even if you do this much even if you do this much and plus if you practice the back questions at least the subjective ones okay even if you do this much plus if you practice the back questions from the chapter it would be sufficient okay it would be sufficient it would be more than enough so with this we are done with the revision of finding up chapter let's start with the super quick revision of appointment and remuneration of managerial personnel which is ranging between section number 196 to section number 205 section number 196 to section number 205 first of all three terms three terms are very very important three terms are very very important the first one first one is your managing director the first term important here is your managing director managing director is basically first of all he should be a director first of all he should be a director that is he should be appointed to the board of directors of the company and he should be entrusted he should be entrusted with the substantial powers of management if he is entrusted with the substantial powers of management then such director can be uh, called then such director can be called as a managing director okay the power of doing routine work or the power of doing administrative activities which can be done by every other director those powers are not given those powers are not given to a managing director because because specifically they have specified in this definition section that he should be entrusted with substantial powers of management okay now this particular this particular uh, managing director a particular person a particular person can be a managing director in maximum two companies this we are going to study in the kmp section okay a particular person is there he can be a managing director in maximum two company and a particular company a particular company can have a particular company can have any number of managing directors it can have one it can have two it can have more than two also it can have any number of managing directors in its company okay this was the most important these were the most important pointers for the managing director second point second point which comes up there second thing that comes up there is the definition of the term manager okay manager is also having similar powers manager is also having similar substantive powers of management which was there with the managing director the only thing here is the only thing here is if in a company if we are appointing any particular person in the place of a manager then there can be a single manager only okay there can be only one manager unlike md in md we can we were allowed to appoint any number of managing directors but if you want in your company that even one person who is having the substantial powers of the management is sufficient then you may appoint you may appoint any person as a manager and this manager can be a director or this manager can also not be a director okay unlike md md full form of md was your managing director means that person was compulsorily supposed to be a director but in case of manager it's not necessary for that particular person to be a director okay so he can be a director he cannot be a director but again he is having the substantial powers of manager going on to the, th the third definition and the last definition that is your whole time director whole time director is such a person whole time director is such a person first of all first of all he is he is such a director who is in whole time employment of the company and he is managing all the day to day affairs of the company okay he is entrusted with all the administrative powers which are not there with the managing director okay the powers which were not there with the managing director those powers come to the whole time director that is all the administrative powers okay if there is a particular first of all in a particular company we can have any number of whole time directors okay in a company we can have any number of whole time directors it can be one it can be two or it can be any number and then a particular person a particular person can be a whole time director in he can be whole time in one company 
ओके ही कैन बी अ होल टाइम पर्सन इन वन कंपनी हाउ एवर ही कैन बी अ डिरेक्टर ही कैन बी एन ऑर्डिनरी डिरेक्टर इन अनदर कंपनी ओके वी आर गोइंग टू स्टडी वन और टू पॉइंट्स ऑफ एक्सेप्शन इन द के एम पी सेक्शन दैट इज सेक्शन नंबर टू जीरो थ्री विच इज गोइंग टू कम लेटर ऑन बट दिस इज मेनली दिस इज मेनली वॉट वी वेर वॉट वी आर सपोज टू नो अबाउट द होल टाइम डिरेक्टर ओके सो ही इज अ नॉर्मल डिरेक्टर ही इज इन टू होल टाइम एम्प्लॉयमेंट ऑफ द कंपनी एंड द कंपनी कैन हैव एनी नंबर ऑफ होल टाइम डिरेक्टर now going on to the next section the important section section number 196 which talks about appointment of the manage, managerial personnel okay all these three people uh, managing director manager whole time uh, director all these people are cumulatively okay cumulatively these people are called as managerial personnel okay so we are studying the appointment of managerial personnel the first thing the first thing which comes up in this particular section is a company at a particular point of time or at a same time a company can either have mds or a company can have a single manager remember manager we can have only one so at any point of time we can either have md or we can have manager we cannot have md as well as manager in the company no that's not allowed okay and whenever you are appointing any managerial personnel they can be appointed for a single term they can be appointed for a single term up to 5 years they can be appointed for a single term up to 5 years they can be reappointed also they can be reappointed also immediately after that there is no issue in that but the reappointment cannot happen too much in advance the reappointment can happen in the last year of expiry okay that is just one year before the expiry during that last term only during that time the reappointment can happen okay if you want to do it in advance or else alternatively you can do the reappointment once the tenure is over now section number 196 sub section 3 which is very very important which talks about the disqualification we are going to get four points here if any of the one, if any of the pointers are attracted then that particular managerial personnel is disqualified for appointment okay first of all if he is below the age of 21 years or if he has attained the age of 70 years if he has touched the age of 70 years or if he is below the age of 20, 21 years then he is not eligible for appointment okay but here we have certain exceptions we have two exceptions here first exception is if suppose the company passes sr okay this exception is first of all for the for the people who have touched the age of 70 years if you still want to appoint that particular person then your company can pass a special resolution and that particular person can be appointed and for the special resolution when you are giving the notice to the shareholders for this meeting then you have to attach an explanatory statement that why you still want to appoint the 70 year old person in your company in the position of managerial personnel if if you are not able to pass sr if you are not able to pass sr but you have passed a resolution where you, where the votes casted in favor is more than the votes casted against it okay where the votes casted in favor is more than the votes casted against it and plus you have taken the cg approval okay in this case you have to in extra you have to take cg's approval if you have taken that then in that case appointment will be valid of this person who has already attained the age of 70 years okay second point second point of disqualification is if that particular person is an insolvent or is adjudged to be an insolvent if this particular person has not made the payment to his creditors he has suspended the payment to his creditors he has compounded with his creditors etc and the last point if he has been convicted by any court be it indian court or be it foreign court and he has been sentenced he has been sentenced to imprisonment for more than 6 months for more than 6 months if any one of the pointers are attracted here then in that case that particular person is disqualified for appointment and then he cannot be appointed as a managerial person okay whenever any person suppose if suppose if these disqualifications are not attracted suppose if these disqualifications are not attracted means he is qualified for being appointed so in that case first you will have to take the board's approval then you will have to get it ratified then you will have to get it ratified from the shareholders in the immediate next general meeting and in some cases in some cases we require to take the approval of the central government okay we are going to study those cases also one case we have already studied that age of 70 years and more three cases we are going to study where we are supposed to take the approval of the central government okay only then only then that particular person can be appointed once that person is appointed by the board within 60 days we have to, we have to go and file a return in form number mr1 with the roc about the appointment of such managerial person okay then if suppose cg approval is required then we have to uh, we have to file form number mr2 with the central government within 90 days from the date of appointment okay if you want to take the cg's approval then that has to be done within a period of 90 suppose if the board has done the approval of a managerial personnel and later when we took the ratification in the uh, by the shareholders in the general meeting 
suppose if the shareholders did not ratify it suppose if the shareholders did not approve it then this managerial personnel was anyway acting in between then the acts done by this particular managerial personnel in between will be deemed as valid as if he has worked in good faith the acts done by him in between will be Okay, now four cases, four cases where we are supposed to take the CG approval. Okay, four cases where we are supposed to take the CG approval by making an application in form number MR2 within a period of 90 days from the date of board's approval. Right, first case, first case is suppose if he is imprisoned, imprisoned for any period or he is liable for any fine of more than rupees 1000 under any specific act. Then in that case, we have to go and take the approval from the CG. If CG approves, then this particular person can be appointed. Or if he has been detained under conservation of forex and prevention of smuggling activities act if he is detained for any period then in that case we have to take cg's approval if we want to appoint this particular person okay if he has attained the age of 70 years and if sr is not passed then in that case you have to go and take the cg's approval remember votes casted in favor should be more than votes casted against it and we have to take the cg's approval and the last point, if that person is not a resident of India, okay, if that person is not a resident of India, means for the last 12 months, he was not staying in India continuously, then in that case, you have to take the CG's approval. If CG says okay, then it will be okay. Okay, and this residence point is not applicable for the companies which are located in SEZ because in that, because in that, we can have, we can have managerial personnel who are not residents in India. Right, so this was this was all about your section number 196. Okay, this was all about your section number 196. Now going on to the most important section of the chapter, that is section number 197. Okay, section number 197 talks about what? Section number 197 talks about remuneration. Okay, 197 talks about the remuneration. We are going to study different things here. The first thing that we have to take up here is the first thing that we have to take up here is the case where the company is having sufficient profits, the case where the company is having adequate profits. Okay, now suppose if it is a public company, first of all, this point is applicable only for a public company. If we have a public company and if it is having sufficient profits, then it can pay remuneration to its managerial personnel and to other directors, managerial personnel and to other directors up to 11%, up to 11% of the net profits and net profits will be determined as per section number 198. Right, net profits will be determined as per the next section that is section number 198. Okay, now in this 11% also has a particular bifurcation. 11% also has a particular bifurcation. Now in that the second proviso, second proviso says that, second proviso, first of all they have given a limit and if those limits are exceeded, if those limits are exceeded then we'll have to pass a special resolution. Okay, we'll have to pass a special resolution. Now ma'am, what are the limits? Okay, generally, generally if you want to pay within the limits, then if there is a single managerial personnel in the company, okay, either there is one MD or there is one manager or there is one whole time director, any one of them is present there, then you can pay 5% of the net profit to that particular person. Okay, you can pay 5%. If you have more than one managerial personnel in your company, then to all of them together, you can pay 10% of the net profits. Okay, this payment, 5% or 10%, this was done to the managerial personnel. Okay, this was done to the managerial personnel. Ma'am, what about the other directors? If we do not have any managerial personnel in the company, we just have other directors, then these other directors will get 3% of the net profits. Okay, if we have MP and we have other directors also, then these other directors will get only 1% of the net profits as their remuneration. Okay, if any one of these limits, if any one of these limits are exceeded, then we'll have to pass a special resolution and you can pay more than these limits only if the company, only if, suppose if the company has defaulted in making the payment to four of them, either to the bank or to the PFI or to non-convertible debenture holders or to any other secured creditor. If the company has done any default with them, then we have to take their approval also. Okay, we'll have to take their approval also and then only you can pass the special resolution and you can get the limit increased. Right? Now, this is the remuneration for the work that they are doing in the company. Right? Apart from this, they would be attending the board meetings of the company. So, what extra are they going to get along with that? Along with this remuneration, they will get sitting fees also. Means, this sitting fees is not included above. This sitting fees will be over and above the remuneration. 
Okay, suppose if suppose if the company does not have sufficient profits, then we are going to deal with it separately. Then this provision, this one percent, three percent, five percent, ten percent, this won't be applicable. Then that will be dealt separately. As we must have already studied that in case of insufficient profits or no profits, we are going to pay on the basis of we are going to pay on the basis of effective capital. Right now, whenever, whenever, whenever. the remuneration suppose suppose if we are fixing the remuneration okay how do we fix the remuneration the remuneration clause will be there in the articles of association if it's not there in the articles of association then you can pass a uh, ordinary resolution if aoa wants you to pass a special resolution then you'll have to pass a special resolution and then you'll have to de determine the remuneration suppose if this particular managerial personnel or if this particular director is acting in some other capacity also okay like in the re re regular lectures i had given you the example of doctor director also acting as a doctor then can i say for treating the patients in a particular hospital company he would be charging some fees etc so he can get these professional fees also over and above his remuneration over and above his sitting fees Right, but provided it should be proved that he is acting in a professional capacity, and means the services that he is giving is of professional nature, and the NRC or the board should be should approve this particular payment. NRC means your nomination and remuneration committee, or if there is no NRC, then the board should approve this particular fact that yes, this director is providing the services in some other capacity, so he is eligible for this extra amount. Right? Then going on to the next one. Coming on to sitting fees. Okay, how much sitting fees? We we have already discussed that sitting fees can be extra paid, like over and above the remuneration. Sitting fees can be paid. How much sitting fees can be paid? Sitting fees, sitting fees, maximum up to rupees one lakh per meeting. Right, this is the sitting fees that can be paid to each director for the board meetings that they have attended. An independent director and woman director should not be paid anything less as paid to the other directors. Means even they should be paid at par with the other directors. right now this remuneration can be by way of a particular percentage that you pay every monthly or it can be on some periodically basis or it can be maybe if the director agrees and it can be on yearly basis also right the net profit that we are going to calculate the net profit that we are going to use for the purpose of section number 197 that is going to be mentioned uh, how are we going to calculate that net profit that calculation of net profit that thing is given in section number 190 Eight, right, which is the next section. The calculation of that particular net profit is given in section number one hundred and ninety-eight. Suppose if, if uh, say for example, while paying any remuneration, suppose if there was any calculation error, and if we have paid any extra remuneration to any particular person, then in that case we cannot, you you know, by default, by default you cannot waive off that. By default you cannot waive off that. First option is you will recover. Okay, first option is the that particular person who has received this extra remuneration, that person has to refund it back to the company within a period of two years. Okay, he has to refund it back to the company within a period of two years. Until that time, till that time, he has to hold it on behalf of the company. Okay, he is holding for the uh, till the time he refunds it back, he is holding it on behalf of the company. Okay, suppose if the company says, okay, no problem, keep this extra remuneration with you, keep this extra remuneration with you. Then in that case, the company can pass the SR and the company can waive off this amount. Okay, but for this, if the company has defaulted with outsiders, those bank, PFI, non-convertible debenture holders, or other secured creditors, if the company has done any default, then we'll have to take their approval before we waive off their amount and before we pass the special resolution. Okay, so two options are there. First option, first option is recover that amount within a period of two years. If you don't want to recover it, then simply you can waive it off by passing a SR. Within a period of two. Okay, suppose if the company does not have profit, then again I am repeating, we are going to pay as per on the basis of effective capital. Okay, section number one ninety seven, subsection twelve. Section number one ninety seven, subsection twelve. This just talks about your disclosure. Okay, listed company is required to do certain disclosure about the remuneration paid, about the uh, median remuneration paid to the employees in the company, median remuneration paid to the directors in the company. What is how many number of directors do we have? How many number of employees do we have? Uh, how many number of permanent employees do we have in the company? What is the remuneration paid to each of them? What is the qualification which is there with each of them? How much increase? as compared to past years remuneration has been given to these particular employees directors etc these di disclosures have to be made by the listed companies specifically and uh, two more important things that they have to disclose here is first of all a list of the top 10 employees as per the amount that they are receiving and then the name of those employees who are receiving 
more than or equal to 8 lakh 50 thousand per month of remuneration if they were employed for part of the year or if they were employed for the entire year and if they were receiving more than or equal to 1 crore 2 lakh rupees if they are receiving more than or equal to 1 crore 2 lakh rupees in a particular year then even those names the name of those employees directors etc have to be disclosed there and if there is any particular person who is holding at least 2% of the share capital of the company but he is drawing something more than the managerial personnel then we have to give his name disclosure also that boss who is this particular person who is drawing even more than the managerial person right then similarly if we have taken any insurance okay similarly if you have taken any insurance for the acts done by the managerial personnel okay that is if any particular act is done by the managerial personnel and if the company suffers any losses for that for that also the company can get itself insured okay for that the premium is paid by the company okay that is the cost for the company but as soon as as soon as as soon as uh, the person is held guilty from that particular time period the premium will form part of remuneration means the premium will will no more be the cost of the company but it will be recovered but it will be recovered from the remuneration okay this managerial personnel if he is there as a director etc in some other company also then he can receive it then he can receive remuneration from the other company also there is no restriction in that okay if the provisions of this particular section entire section is contravened okay if any of the provision of section number 197 is contravened then in that case then in that case punishment will be applicable on the company and on that particular person auditor of the company auditor of the company has to make the disclosures auditor of the company has to make the disclosures in his audit report that whatever remuneration was paid whatever remuneration was paid by the company was within the limits and if it was not in the limit then the company has required has fulfilled the requirements that is suppose if we have paid more than the limit then we have passed sr etc all those compliances have been done this has to be disclosed by the auditor in his audit report which you, you, you must have already studied in section number 143 right 197.17 was a transitional provision so I am ignoring it for the time being. This exception, this exception for the Nidhi company, this is this was an exception for the Nidhi company. You can just read it once which says that in case of Nidhi company, if there are no managerial personnel, then you can pay something more that instead of 3% that we were paying to the other directors, if there is no managerial personnel, you can pay some other amount that is 15 lakh rupees or 10% of the net profits whichever is lower and if you want to pay more than that then SR can be passed right now going on to the next case going on to the next case where going on to the next case where the com where the company is not having adequate profits okay either the company is having insufficient profits or the company is not at all having any profits then in that case the company can pay managerial the company can pay remuneration only to its managerial personnel only to its managerial personnel based on the effective capital okay there was cert there was some limit there was some limit of this effective capital that is if the effective capital is negative or if it is or if it is uh, less than rupees 5 crore then you can pay up to 60 lakhs for the entire year if it is if it is 5 crore and above but it is less than 100 crore then you can pay 84 lakhs right if it is 100 crore and above but less than 250 uh, crores if it is 100 crores and above and it is less than uh, 250 crore then you can pay 120 lakhs and if it is 250 crores and above then you can pay 120 lakhs plus 0.01 percent of the excessive effective capital over and above 250 crores. okay this is the amount that you can pay this is the amount you can pay after passing ordinary resolution passing ordinary resolution in case of these this is mandatory okay passing or in this case is mandatory and if you want to exceed the limits okay if the limits are getting exceeded then in that case you can pass a special resolution but even if you want to pay within the limit then also you have to pass the ordinary resolution if the limits are getting exceeded then you can pass a special resolution if any particular managerial personnel is appointed for part of the year then these limits anyway these limits are per annum so you can do pro rata that is you can do proportionate right then if you are paying any remuneration if you are paying any remuneration to a managerial person if you are paying any remuneration to a managerial person who is working in a professional capacity means he is not involved in day to day activities but he is working in a professional capacity as an advisor etc but he is a uh, managerial person he is a managerial person who is not having in any interest in the company okay he is not related to any promoters of the company in the last two years and he is having good expertise knowledge 
okay means he is a specific person whom we have kept in the company even during our bad times then if you want to pay any amount to him even within the limits if you want to since he is a managerial person you can pay okay if you want to pay any amount to him even within the limits then also you have to pass a special resolution because you have to give a justification to the shareholders that why such a person is still required in the company even when the company is into losses okay so you have to pass a special resolution even if you are paying any amount to him within the limits and if if the limits are exceeded then to anyway we were required to pass a special resolution okay then two more extra re requirements here two more extra requirements here is first of all uh, nrc or the board has to uh, satisfy that yes we are paying so and so amount in for both the cases for a point as well as b point nrc or the board has to give its approval uh, before making the payment of the remuneration and suppose if you have defaulted if you have defaulted with bank pfi uh, non convertible debenture holders or with the secured creditors then in that case we have to take their approval also okay we have to take their approval also then going on to the next one going on to the next one suppose if in then there are some special cases there are some special cases where you can pay there are some special cases where you can pay remuneration in excess of the limits which were given in the section 2 in the last one that is even more than the limits which were given and that too without passing special resolution okay that too without passing special resolution you can pay you can pay more than the limits in that in that there are specifically specifically there are three important pointers there first of all if the company is a newly incorporated company then for a period of 7 years okay then for a period if the company is into losses obviously if the company is into losses then if it is a new company then for the first 7 years it can pay any amount uh, more than the limits even without passing a sr okay or if the if it is a sick company and the bifr has just approved bifr has just approved the revival scheme then for a period of 5 years from that day you can pay any amount of remuneration more than the limits okay and the last one if a resolution plan has been approved by the nclt under ibc then from the date of approval for a period of 5 years for a period of 5 years you can pay any amount okay you can pay any amount without passing without passing the special resolution or if suppose the bifr has fix the limit of your remuneration then whatever amount the bifr that is the board for industrial and financial reconstruction whatever amount it has fixed that much amount we can pay okay now your now your the auditor and the ca auditor or the company secretary has to give has to give a certification that outsiders or that no default uh, that the outsiders do not have any objection and no default has been done with the outsiders so then only you can pay any amount more than the limit okay that was those were the important pointers which we have taken from section number 3 because as, as it's not very important so we have just covered the important pointers from there okay section 4 section 4 is very very simple section 4 simply says that these specific perquisites these specific allowances which are paid to a managerial person and this is over and above the remuneration okay this is over and above the remuneration that he is getting means he will get remuneration means he'll get perquisites allowances means he'll get sitting fees for attending the board meetings and then he is going to also get professional fees he, if he is rendering some other services in professional capacity just like we took the example of doctor right now effective capital the uh, the calculation of effective capital here is important as you can get a numerical question on that just try to understand here effective capital how do we calculate effective capital i have written a summary here on the right hand side effective capital will be your paid up share capital but excluding your share application money share application money ha money has to be subtracted okay then plus your all your reserves and surplus plus your securities premium plus your long term loans long term loans which are repayable obviously after a period of one year all those will be added first your investments will be subtracted your accumulated losses will be subtracted your preliminary expenses which are not written off those will be subtracted and whatever amount you get whatever amount you get that is nothing but your effective capital okay but if your company is an investment company if your company is an investment company then in that case you are not supposed to subtract in that case you are not supposed to subtract the investment because in that case investment forms your stock okay so this first point this first point was very very important in this important explanation and that is what we have covered up here going on to the next one that is section 5 section 5 is again very very simple suppose if there is a managerial personnel who is a managerial if there is a person who is a managerial personnel in two companies okay if there is a particular person who is a managerial personnel in two companies then he can receive remuneration from both the companies but the total amount that he can receive from both the companies that is higher of the amount eligible from any one of the company 
Suppose if he is eligible to receive 1 crore from one company and 2 crores from another company. Then he cannot receive 3 crore but he can receive maximum 2 crore total from both the companies. This is the restriction which has been imposed by section 3, uh, section 5 sorry, section 5. So as to ensure that a person is a managerial personnel in least possible companies. So that a person is a managerial personnel in least possible companies. Okay. Now listen, now listen, going on to the further parts which are very, very simple. Going on to the further parts. Uh, we have already completed part 1 of Schedule 5. Part 1 of Schedule 5 was the cases where we had to take CG's approval initially which we had done. Okay, then part 2. Part 2 of Schedule 5 is what we have been doing till now. Okay, now comes, now comes your part 3. Now comes your part 3. Part 3 is very simple. Part 3 says that whatever appointment and remuneration you are fixing for this particular uh, managerial personnel, that has to be approved by the shareholders in the general meeting that we already know we had taken the ratification from the shareholders in the general meeting and the auditor or the CA, auditor and the CS they have to certify they have to certify that all the requirements of remuneration clauses appointment clauses have been fulfilled and they have to file this certificate they have to file the certificate with the ROC stating that yes the company has fulfilled all the requirements okay so this was a procedural part basically Part 4, part 4 is again very simple, part 4 says that central government as usual as we have been doing in many chapters of allied laws that central government if it wants it can provide exemptions from any provisions to any particular company or to any class of companies. Okay, we have got a summary of this, we have got a summary of this if you can see it here. Part 1, part 1 was talking about those disqualification and the approval of CG which was required. Right, part 2 has 5 sections in that, part 2 has 5 sections, first section talks about the case where the company is having profits, okay, second section talks about the case where the company is having inadequate profits or losses, third section talks about the case where the person is receiving managerial remuneration uh, when we are paying remuneration in special cases, remember that in corporation 7 years, BIFR 5 years, IBC 5 years, those 3 cases. Right, section 4 talks about perquisites and allowances. Section 4 talks about perquisites and allowances that it will be over and above. And section 5 talks about rem receiving remuneration from uh, multiple companies. And in that case, you can receive the higher of the above. This is given in section 5. Then coming on to part 3. Part 3 was talking about the procedure. That is appointment and remuneration will be approved by the shareholders. And then the auditor and the CS are also going to certify that all the requirements have been fulfilled. And the last part, last part says that exemption can be provided. Exemption can be provided by the central government. Exemption can be provided by the central government to any specific company or to specific classes of companies. Right? Going on to section number 198, as we have already referred section number 198 once, which was talking about whenever in section number 197, 1, 197 subsection 1, when we were calculating that remuneration as a percentage of net profit, 5%, 10%, 1%, 3%, 3%, that net profit will be calculated as per section number 198. Okay, one small conclusion that I can give you for section number 198. Okay, one small conclusion which I can give you for section number 198 is that all the revenue expenses will be allowed from the net profit. All the capital expenses or the, you know, uh, non-business expenses, those will be added back. Basically, those will be uh, disallowed. Okay, all the revenue incomes will be taxable and all the capital incomes will be excluded. After doing all those listed adjustments, you need not buy hard this. After doing all those listed adjustments, whatever net profit you get, whatever net profit you get, that net profit is your net profit under section number 198, which you are going to use for the purpose of section number 197. Okay, going on to the next one, that is section number 199. Going on to the next section, that is section number 199. 199 says that suppose if the company has done any fraud okay or if the company has not complied with any provisions if the company has not complied with any provisions and if someone has told the company or if some regulator has told the company to restate its financial statements to restate its financial statements this you have studied in your audit if you are supposed to restate your financial statements then in that case suppose if any excessive remuneration was paid earlier if any excessive remuneration was paid earlier, then we are going to recover such excessive remuneration. Okay, time period is not specified here, but we are going to recover that excessive remuneration from that particular man from that particular director or that managerial person. Right now, next section, section number two hundred. Section number two hundred is very simple, which says that which says that 
company can fix suppose if the company is not having profits or if the company is having inadequate profits then the company can fix the remuneration that how much remuneration should be paid to so and so person okay how much remuneration should be paid to so and so person which depends on financial position of the company that depends on the qualifications of that managerial personnel or qualifications of that particular individual his experience what kind of experience is he having okay it depends it depends how much uh, is he a uh, managerial personnel in some other company then we can pay him something less is he acting in some other capacity in our company then we can pay him something less so depending upon these factors depending upon these factors company is going to fix the limit of remuneration in case the company is having uh, insufficient profits or if the company is into loss okay these are the factors which the company is considering while fixing the amount of remuneration going on to the next section that is section number 201 201 is referring to mr2 201 section number 201 refers to section uh, to form number mr2 remember in a form number mr2 we were going and making an application we were going and making an application to the central government within a period within a period of 90 days from the date when the board had approved the appointment of that particular managerial person so they are telling that before you go and make an application to the central government before that make sure before that make sure that you have intimated the shareholders before that you have intimated the shareholders that we are going to go and make an application to the cg and plus you have to give a public notice in two newspapers two newspapers you are very much aware about it one is your english language newspaper and the other one is your vernacular language newspaper we have to give the notice in those newspapers that we are going to go and make an application to the cg and only after that only after that we can go and make an application to the cg in form number mr2 within a period of 90 days right next section next section section number 202 okay next section section number 202 which is an important section okay now 202 talks about last few sections left okay now 202 talks about 202 talks about compensation for loss of office okay it talks about compensation for loss of office in case of managerial personnel it talks about compensation in case of loss of office in case of manage only to the managerial person if the managerial personnels are losing their office okay if the managerial personnels are losing their office for any particular reason because of any particular reason then in that case then in that case they are eligible for compensation for loss of office except for six reasons except for six reasons and those six reasons are actually nothing but whenever the managerial personnel has done some default <coughs> whenever the <coughs> whenever the managerial personnel has done some default then in that case he will not be eligible for compensation for loss of office okay example example if suppose the company has been taken over by some other company the company has been taken over by some other company and we have been given the same position in the new company but i say no i don't want to go then in that case i will not be eligible for any compensation for loss of office if my company has been wounded up because of my mistake okay if uh, i have to vacate my office because i have done some default as per section number 167 if if say for example i voluntarily i only resign i say i don't want to be in your company then the company will say go i will not pay you any compensation okay if i have done some fraud or if there is a breach of trust then in that case no compensation or if i have done something because of which because of my mistake only my office has gone or my job has gone or my position has gone then in that case did you observe in all the cases in all the cases there was a default of the managerial person alone if there is a default done by the managerial person then he will not be eligible for compensation for loss of office otherwise in all the other cases he will be eligible ma'am how much compensation to be paid ma'am how much compensation to be paid whatever remuneration he could have earned if he was there in the office if he if he would have been in the office for the remaining tenure or 3 years whichever is shorter okay so for how much period you have to pay him the remuneration for the remaining tenure that he was that would have been there in the company or 3 years whichever is shorter for this much period whatever amount of remuneration he would have been eligible for that much amount of compensation can be paid how do we ca ca calculate this particular remuneration we have to take the average remuneration paid during the last 3 years okay average remuneration paid during the last 3 years into this particular period okay what period what period remaining tenure or 3 years whichever is shorter this is the maximum compensation for loss of office that can be paid as per the company's act 
Okay, if suppose the compensation is still, suppose now listen, this compensation has to be paid, no doubt in that. Now suppose if this compensation is payable, the company said that, okay, I will pay you in some time. But within a period of 12 months, the day when he left his office, within a period of 12 months, if winding up happened in the company, and if the company is not having sufficient amount, then in that case, the company can say, Tata Baba, I am not going to pay you the compensation. But provided winding up happens within a period of 12 months from the date when he left his office. Right now, suppose if, suppose if, suppose if uh, the director or this managerial personnel, he has not done a fraud. It is not yet proved that he has done a fraud, but there is an allegation on him that maybe this particular managerial personnel was involved in this. Okay, maybe this managerial personnel was involved in this. Then in that case, it is at the discretion of the company whether to pay him the compensation or not. Okay, if, if, Basically, see, this is not a conviction. This is an allegation. Okay, on the basis of allegation, we can pay. Okay, if the company is, you know, so confident, then, then the company can pay. But later on, if it is proved that this particular managerial personnel was involved in the fraud, then boss, this compensation cannot be recovered back. Okay, this compensation cannot be recovered back. This was decided in Bell versus Level Brothers case laws that if later on it is proved that this particular managerial personnel was liable, then the paid compensation cannot be recovered back from him. So be better is, better is if there is any such allegation, then better is do not pay the compensation till the case is clear, right? Okay, but it, if at all, if at all the company has paid, then that compensation cannot be recovered. Also, now they have, we have taken some point from the rules, relevant rules here, that if the company has done any default with the outsiders, maybe non-repayment of public, non-redemption of public deposit, non-redemption of debentures, or if there is any statutory dues pending, if there is any government dues pending, if any employee dues are pending, if you have done any default with the outsiders, then boss, you cannot pay any compensation for loss of office. Okay, first clear the dues of the outsiders, then only you will be eligible to pay the compensation for loss of office okay and just remember 202 that section section number 202 was applicable only for managerial personnel not for other directors it was applicable only for the managerial person okay going on to the next section next section again section number 203 some points are really very very important let's cover the most important pointers okay from exam point of view let's cover the most important pointers for the purpose of section number 203 Section number 203 talks about appointment of KMP. Okay, it talks about appointment of KMP, key managerial personnel. First of all, who all comes under the, under the term called as KMP? First of all, MP comes. MP means MD, Managing Director or CEO. If there is no MD, then manager will come. And if MD, manager, none of them are there, then in that case, then in that case, a whole time director. Okay, at least this person is going to be there in the KMP. And... Company secretary, in-house company secretary has to be there in the company whole time. All these are to be whole time and a CFO should be there in the company. Then in that case, we will say that yes, the company is having a whole time KMP. Okay, now which companies, which companies are required, which companies are required to appoint a, uh, or to uh, keep a whole time KMP? Every listed company is going to come up here. Every listed company is going to come up here. And every other unlisted public company whose paid up share capital, whose paid up share capital is at least rupees 10 crore as per the latest audited financial statements. Every other public company, every other public company whose paid up share capital is at least rupees 10 crore. These companies, okay, either if that company is a listed company, then it is it has to follow. Or if it's not a listed company, but it's, uh, but it's a public company and its paid up share capital is at least rupees 10 crore, then it has to appoint a whole time KMP mandatory okay then there was an amendment here then there was an amendment here that see here in the above your uh, requirement for CS was applicable requirement for CS was applicable because that was included in your whole time KMP now similarly similarly every private company every private company whose paid up share capital whose paid up share capital is at least rupees 10 crore Every private company, even that company has to keep a whole time CS. Okay, full KMP is not required, but it has to keep a whole time CS in the company. Okay, that was the amendment which had happened here. The limit was increased there. Now, if there is, if there is a particular company, just try to understand these small, small pointers now. If there is a particular company, in a particular company, a 
सेम पर्सन कैन नॉट बी अपॉइंटेड सेम पर्सन कैन नॉट बी अपॉइंटेड एज एम डी एज वेल एज चेयर पर्सन ओके बिकॉज अदरवाइज टू मेनी रोल्स टू मेनी रिस्पॉन्सिबिलिटीज कम ऑन द सेम पर्सन एम डी एंड चेयर पर्सन कैन नॉट बी द सेम पर्सन एक्सेप्ट एक्सेप्ट इफ एओ एस इज ओके नो प्रॉब्लम और इफ द कंपनी इज इन टू सिंगल लाइन ऑफ ऑपरेशन देन द रिस्पॉन्सिबिलिटीज रोल्स एक्सेट्रा वुड बी लेस इन दैट केस इट वुड बी अलाउड अदरवाइज एम डी एंड चेयर पर्सन कैन नॉट बी द सेम पर्सन okay another case where md and chairperson can be the same person is if it is a big public company okay if it is a big public company if it is a big public company and for every business for every business if it has got a different different ceo then in that case then in that case md md and chairperson can be the same person okay then whenever whenever whole time kmp is appointed he is appointed by the board resolution he is appointed by the board resolution if there is a vacancy if there is a vacancy in the place if there is a vacancy in the place of whole time kmp then that vacancy will be filled by the board of directors within a period of 6 months within a period of 6 months from the date of vacancy right this is what we have studied here in the fourth subsection if there is a whole time kmp if there is a particular person who is a whole time kmp in a company then he cannot be a whole time kmp in any other company except a subsidiary company he can be other director in another company there's no problem in that but he cannot be a whole time person in the other company okay he cannot be a whole time director in whole time kmp in some other company except for its subsidiary company right okay then going on to the next one going on to the next one coming on to md point a particular person can be a md in maximum two companies okay i can be a md in maximum two companies that is in one company and one more another company okay but when i am going to be appointed in the second company then we have to pass a board resolution by physically calling a meeting not by circulation okay not by circulation the directors cannot sit at home and vote they, we have to physically call for a board meeting and uh, whoever are present okay all the directors who are present all of them should say yes then only i can be appointed as a md in the second company right all these pointers all these pointers about the kmp all these pointers about the mp in the kmp part these are not applicable to a government company don't forget that this subsection 4a is very very important okay this exception is very very important that is this uh, managerial personnel part for government company uh, is not applicable yeah. going on to the next section section number 204 section number 204 talks about secretarial audit secretarial audit done by a company secretary some company some prescribed companies again some prescribed company some prescribed companies are required to get secretarial audit done from a company secretary in practice not this in house cs but by a company secretary in practice we have to we have to get the secretarial audit done from that particular person and that person is going to submit the report in form number mr3 okay that particular person is going to submit the report in form number mr3 he is going to basically submit a report in a particular format mainly about the compliances mainly about the compliances whenever he is doing this particular audit at that time he will require certain information from the company the company is required to provide this information the company is required to provide this particular information to the cs mandatorily whatever cs writes in his report whatever cs writes whatever qualifications etc he gives in his report on that the board has to give his comment okay the board has to give its comment on that that is again mandatory and if there is any default which is done either by the cs any default which is done by the company any default which is done by the officer then there is a range of punishment that is applicable ranging between ranging between rupees 1 lakh to five okay now who is required to get the secretarial audit done we have an amendment also coming up here first of all first of all every listed company that is going to come anyway okay every listed company is going to come up there then in case of prescribed companies then in case of other public companies unlisted companies if its paid up share capital is at least rupees 50 crore or its turnover is at least rupees 250 crore or any other company any other company any other company whose outstanding loans borrowings etc from banks pfi is at least rupees 100 crore then in that case even such a company such huge loans it is having such a company is also required to get such a company is also required to get a secretarial audit done from a uh, from a company secretary in practice in form number mr3 okay means the report will be submitted in form number mr3 
205 is a one time read section which was mainly talking about the functions of the company secretary in general what are his functions okay example uh, conducting meetings convening meetings okay then uh, preparing the minutes preparing the minutes uh, making sure that all the compliance has been followed okay he acts as a compliance officer for the listed companies as studied in the lodr provisions he advises the board about all the compliances that the company should follow he has to follow all the secretarial standards he has to follow all the secretarial standard he has to advise the board he whenever any approvals are supposed to be taken from the cg just like we saw mr2 form okay whenever any approvals are supposed to be taken by board resolution whenever any approvals are supposed to be taken from any government authority all these works all these works are done by the company secretary okay for that purpose only we appoint a company secretary and most important point suppose if you know if at all if you have to write this point somewhere about this functions of company secretary one thing is very very important there is whenever the company secretary is acting he has to comply with the secretarial standards these secretarial standards are issued by the icsi that is the institute of company secretaries of india and it will be uh, approved and it will be uh, and these standards are approved by the central no right these these were the most important functions these were the most important functions of the company secretary and at the end we have a case law at the end we have a case law that is the bell versus lever brothers which we have already considered now one conclusion from this we have considered is if suppose compensation on the basis of allegation okay compensation on the basis of allegations if it has been paid to any person then that cannot be recovered back in any circumstance that particular compensation cannot be recovered back and one more thing that they are telling here is if suppose any particular person has done some breach okay if suppose any particular person has done some breach of any of his obligation he has done some mistake and he knows that he has done some obligation he has done some mistake then it is he is not legally bound to suo moto go and disclose that i have done so and so mistake okay he is not legally bound to disclose that okay this is what was concluded in bell versus lever brothers and this was all about this was all about all the important pointers from exam point of view which we have covered in this revision i hope you are very very clear with the provisions let's start with the super quick revision of appointment and qualifications of directors that is your directors chapter let's start with it the chapter ranges between section number 149 the chapter ranges between section number 149 to section number 172 first of all first of all what do you mean by director director is such a person director is such a person who is appointed to the board of the company director is such a person who is appointed to the board of the company in which we have two types of directors one is your executive director and the other one is your non executive directors executive directors are the one who are into the employment of the company non executive are the ones who are not in the employment of the company right this was the basic bifurcation apart from this also we are going to study apart from this also we are going to study many other type of directors in the chapter first of all the most important section section number 149 which talks about company to have company to have board of directors company to have board of directors first of all first of all directors can be in form of directors can be in form of individuals only a company firm llp etc they cannot be the directors normally directors generally uh, and as per the law also the directors are individual persons only right after that now we have now we have uh, the count of the minimum number of directors and maximum number of directors okay just go on recollecting along with me minimum number of directors opc should have one private company should have two public company should have three and the maximum number of directors which a company can have that is 15 right if a company wants to appoint more than 15 directors then in that case it will have to pass then it will have to pass a special resolution the company can pass a special resolution and it can appoint more than 15 directors also but in case of a government company and in case of a section 8 company which has not done any default of section 92 and section uh, and section 137 means no default should happen of 92 also no default should happen of 137 also if these companies government company and section 8 company if it wants to appoint more than 15 number of directors then in that case it uh, does not even need to pass a special resolution it does not even need to pass a special resolution even if it wants to appoint more than 15 number of directors okay this was a very important point there this was a very important point there 
next going on to the next point that is your women director okay now there are there are a particular class of companies there are a particular class of companies which should appoint at least at least at least one woman director in the company now which are those companies first of all every listed company every listed company should have one woman director on its board and for other uh unlisted public companies for other unlisted public companies if its paid up share capital is more than or equal to 100 crore or if its turnover is more than or equal to 300 crore 300 crore then in that case even such unlisted public companies are required to appoint a woman director on its board right now if there is this is very important point if there is any vacancy in the place of director if there is any vacancy in the place of woman director then that will be filled by the board of directors okay there, this is a specific filling of vacancy this will be filled by the board of directors immediately okay but ma'am can you explain what is immediately then that has to be filled then that has to be filled before the next board meeting before the next board meeting or three months from the date of vacancy whichever is later either before the next board meeting or three months from the date of vacancy whichever is later this should be filled okay this uh, the vacancy in case of women director should be filled and at any point of time these particular companies these particular companies should have at least one woman director in the company right then going on to the next one that is resident director just like we had seen for women director specific companies are required to have women director but that is not the case for resident director okay every company listed unlisted public private any particular company every company should have at least one resident director in the company ma'am what do you mean by resident director resident director is such a person uh, resident director is such a director who stays in india in the current year in the current year he should stay in india for more than or equal to 182 days okay that person can be any person not necessarily arpita not necessarily mr x not necessarily y any particular person any director who has stayed in india for more than or equal to 182 days in the current year that particular director will be treated as a resident director and it will be deemed as if the company has fulfilled the requirement of having a resident director okay if the company has been incorporated not for the entire year but it has been incorporated say for example during the year or part of the year then in that case then in that case the resident director this 182 days condition will be done pro rata or that will be done proportionate okay that will be done proportionate proportionate means say for example if the company was incorporated during half of the year then in that case resident director uh, should stay in india or that particular director should stay in india for a period of, period of at least 91 days so as to be called as a resident right then after that after that the next thing is your independent directors which is very very important independent directors independent directors section number 149 subsection 4 section number 149 subsection 4 they say that again required companies or prescribed companies should have independent directors in that first of all every listed public company every listed public company should have an independent should have independent directors apart from that unlisted public companies if certain conditions are fulfilled ma'am which conditions ma'am what conditions paid up share capital of at least rupees 10 crore or turnover of at least rupees 100 crore or outstanding loans deposits debentures of more than greater than rupees 50 crore if any one of these three conditions are fulfilled then even an unlisted public company is required to appoint independent director okay now listed company ma'am listed com listed public company should have how many independent directors so whatever are the total number of directors in your company okay whatever are your total number of directors in the company one third of those directors one third of those directors should be independent directors if you get any fraction then th then that will be rounded off to one okay and in case of unlisted public companies in case of unlisted public companies at least two independent directors should be there in the company right but now in case of unlisted public company if you have any if you have any joint ventures if you have any dormant company if you have any wholly owned subsidiary company then even though these companies meet the limit okay even though these companies meet the limit of paid up share capital or turnover or, or outstanding loans then too they are not required to appoint an independent director because they are excluded from rule 4 companies okay they are excluded from rule 4 rule 4 means these unlisted public companies and they are totally excluded from them so they are not required to appoint any independent directors okay suppose if there is a clash in the appointment of number of directors as per independent directors and as per audit committee then we had discussed this we have discussed this in regular lectures that independent 
uh, your audit committee your audit committee section 177 is going to override the requirements of section 149.4 and you'll have to appoint more number of independent directors if required by an audit committee right then in case suppose suppose if there is a vacancy if suppose there is a vacancy which arises in the place if there is a vacancy which arises in the place of an independent director then that has to be filled similarly like your board uh, similarly like a woman director that is that has to be filled immediately but before the next board meeting or three months from the date of vacancy whichever is later within this much time the uh, vacancy of the independent director must be Okay, if, if say for example, if say for example, in case of unlisted public companies, if the company uh, is not fulfilling, if the company is not fulfilling the requirement for three consecutive years, that paid up share capital, turnover thing, etc. If that is not fulfilled for three consecutive years, then it is not required to appoint independent directors till the time it fulfills, till the time it fulfills any of the conditions in the near future. Okay. Then section number 149 subsection 6, section number 149 subsection 6 talks about the qualifications. This talks about the qualifications of the independent director. This talks about the qualifications of the independent director in which mainly there are 6 points. Okay, in which there are mainly 6 points. First of all, the basic rule here is independent director can be any director. Independent director can be any director other than MD, other than whole time director, other than a nominee director. Okay, this is a by default rule. Another thing that they tell us here is first of all, as per the board, this person should be of integrity, this person should have uh, professional uh, experience, knowledge, etc. Expertise, knowledge, experience, etc. This person should be having that. Next one, next one, this independent director should not be the current promoter or he should not be the past promoter of the company or its group company. This particular independent, the proposed independent director or the person who is going to be appointed as an independent director, he should not be related, he should not be related to the promoters or directors of the company or its group company. Then boss, there is a relationship, right? There is a relationship. So in that case, that particular person cannot be appointed. Then this particular person who was getting appointed as an independent director, he should not have any financial he should not have any financial transaction relationship with the company or its group company or with their directors or with their promoters. Okay, there should be no such financial relationship with the company, its group company, its uh, promoters or its directors during the last two years or during the current year also. But two transactions are allowed here. Okay, two transactions are allowed here. One is the remuneration transaction will all obviously be allowed and any other transaction restricted up to, restricted up to, <clears throat> restricted of less than of less than less than 10 percent of this independent director's income up to that amount it will be allowed okay restricted up to 10 percent basically more than or equal to 10 percent more than or equal to more than 10 percent more than 10 percent won't be allowed less than or equal to 10 percent is allowed then there is no restriction there right next one next one d point is putting a restriction on the relatives there are four pointers in that Okay, say for example, if I want to get appointed as an independent director, then my relative should not be holding any security or interest in the company or in its group company of exceeding rupees 50 lakhs or 2% of the paid up share capital of the company. My relative should not be indebted to the company, its group company, its directors, promoters, etc. of more than or equal to rupees 50 lakhs means they can be indebted of less than rupees 50 lakhs. My relatives, my relatives should not give guarantee to the company or its group company or to promoters or directors of more than or equal to rupees 50 lakhs means again less than rupees 50 lakhs is allowed no problem in that and if any if you add up all these provisions if you add up all the three provisions or if you take it individually there is a cap limit that these transactions any other transaction or these transactions either taken individually or combined then that should not exceed that should not exceed 2% basically that should be anyhow less than 2% ma'am less than 2% of what less than 2% of the gross turnover or it should be less than 2% of the total income right this is the restriction on the relative this is the restriction on the relatives which is applicable if my relative come under this particular restriction and I am not eligible to be appointed as an independent director Similarly, now there is a restriction on me as well as my relative. 
okay me as well as my relative we cannot be the kmp and we cannot be the employee of such company or its group company during the last 3 years okay we cannot be the uh, kmp or employee of this company or its group company during the last 3 years but there was an exception here there was an exception here that if my relative if my relative is an employee if my relative is an employee then there is no problem then i can still be appointed as an independent director okay similarly similarly i or my relatives should not be an employee proprietor or partner i or my relative should not be an employee proprietor or partner of any ca firm of any cs firm of any cost auditor firm who is the ca or who is the cs or who is the cost auditor of the company in which i am going to become an independent director or its group company similarly similarly i should not be an employee proprietor or partner of a legal firm of a legal firm which is having transaction with this company or its group company of more than or equal to 10% of the total turnover of the firm okay more than or equal to 10% or more of the total turnover of the firm so here you have to check the turnover of the legal firm into 10% if the transaction between uh, the company and this legal firm is more than or equal to 10% then in that case these two become related and if i am an employee proprietor or partner in this legal firm then i am not eligible to become an independent director of this company right similarly i as well as my relatives taken together we should we can hold less than 2% of the voting power of the company i along with my relatives i can hold 2% i can hold less than 2% of the voting power of the company because here whatever it's written this is not allowed so more than or equal to 2% is not allowed so we can hold together we can hold less than 2% of the voting power of the company okay similarly if i similarly if i or my relatives we are the chief executive or director of a npo and that npo is substantially funded by this company or its group company or by promoters or by directors substantially funded means more than or equal to 25% of the receipts are received from this particular company group company promoters etc then since i am the ceo or director of this npo i become related to them this npo is receiving funding from the company so npo becomes related to the company so automatically even i become related to the company and i cannot be appointed as an independent director in that company okay similarly if i am the chief executive or if i am the director of this npo and this npo holds at least if this npo holds more than or equal to 2% of voting power in the company so that is not allowed because then npo becomes substantially interested in the company's capital or in the company's uh, in the company then in that case in that case also i cannot be appointed as an independent director right and similarly last point that they are telling us here last point that they are telling us here is that independent director should possess proper qualifications as required according to the company's business may be relating to marketing may be relating to sales may be relating to information technology it can be anything but whatever pertains to the business of the company that particular independent director should have that specific knowledge right going on to the next one that is section number 149 of section 7 which is important section which says that every independent director is required to every time basically has to prove himself that he fulfills all the requirements of section 149 sub section 6 and he has been complying with all these conditions <clears throat> this declaration has to be given three times as uh, we can say three times that is at the first board meeting where he participates as an independent director that is his first board meeting he has to give a declaration then every year's first boarding board meeting he has to give a declaration that he fulfills the requirement of 149 6 and whenever there is any changes in these circumstances okay whenever there is any changes in these circumstances in the above points that we had studied then in that case then in that case suppose if we were holding we were holding uh, 0% voting power in the company and now we are holding 1% voting power in the company we are still qualified but then too we have to disclose that sir there is so and so change right this uh, this we have to disclose to the board three times first of all at my first board meeting then every year's first board meeting and whenever there is any change in the circumstances at that time we have to disclose okay many more points about the independent directors like uh, the conduct code of conduct rules regulations duties of the independent directors these are given in schedule 4 these are given in schedule 4 of the companies act so just like we studied schedule 5 in the managerial remuneration chapter similarly schedule 4 contains maximum details about the independent directors anyway we do not have the content of it then what things are allowed what things are are allowed to the independent directors what things are allowed to the independent directors in form of remuneration 
okay first of all it is eligible for sitting fees no doubt in that it can it can get reimbursement of the expenses right it can get profit related commission if it is approved if it is approved by the members okay this is a special thing this is a special thing if any members approve it then they will be eligible then they will be eligible for this particular profit related commission but one thing that is not allowed one thing that is not allowed is esop right see anyway we were restricting their voting rights we were restricting their voting powers so esop is not eligible uh, basically independent directors are not eligible for esop right going on to the next point going on to the next point first of all they are telling that whenever an independent director comes into picture whenever an independent director comes into picture he can be appointed for a single term maximum up to 5 years okay single term up to maximum 5 years and if you, if we want then we can even reappoint him reappointment if he is coming back in the company then he can come back in the company only after passing a special resolution and again if he is coming back in the company means first he came for a term up to 5 years again if he can come then he can come for a maximum period of one term only which can go up to 5 years okay it's not necessary that the term has to be of equal to 5 years it can be of any period up to 5 years and he can come for maximum two terms together okay he can come for two consecutive terms together and again if he wants to come after these two terms if he wants to again come in the company then in that case then in that case there has to be a cooling period served for a period of 3 years where he should not be related or associated with the company or its group company during this period of 3 years okay that is a cooling period point which is applicable for the independent director so basically one term up to 5 years again one term up to 5 years again if he wants to come in the company then he has to serve what then he has to serve the cooling period in the company right going on to the next one going on to the next one that is liability of independent directors okay liability of the independent directors and independent director will be liable for whatever act he is doing okay for whatever act he is doing if he knows if he knows that this particular wrong act was done with his knowledge with his connivance with his connivance or consent we can say connivance is nothing but consent or where we know that he has not acted uh, diligently or he has not exercised due diligence then in that case that independent director will be liable okay he will be liable for the wrongful act that he has done in the company and the retirement by rotation that is when the one which you are going to study in 152 sub section 6 and 152 sub section 7 where some number of directors two third one third number of directors retire that provision is not applicable for the independent directors because anyway the uh, the tenure is already prescribed for these independent directors right so whenever we are calculating in 152 sub section 6 we are going to exclude these independent directors right then next how do we ma'am how do we select these independent directors from where do we get these independent directors independent director independent directors either you can choose suo moto if you have any you know any particular person then you can choose that particular person or alternatively independent directors can be chosen from the data bank right independent directors can be chosen from the data bank this data bank is maintained by the nca that is ministry of corporate affairs which contains the details of every person who is eligible basically any person who has cleared the independent director examination their name is placed in the data bank if and if any company wants to appoint them as an independent director the company can appoint them but yes you are choosing a particular person this this uh, you know this due diligence stays with the company itself means whom to select and later on if that person is not a good person we cannot blame the mca for that we ourselves are responsible for this particular choice okay we ourselves are responsible for this particular choice and once you have selected once you have selected a particular person once you have selected a particular person we are going to you know present that person's name before the company in the general meeting we are going to give the justification that why we have chosen this person only right and then after that that person's appointment will be approved in the general meeting okay just remember when it comes to reappointment only at that time we require sr otherwise at the time of normal appointment we are just going to require an ordinary resolution right am i very very clear till here then going on to the next point going on to the next point which is talking about which is talking about ssd okay this is very very important small shareholder directors now this point is basically applicable only to a listed company okay either a listed company can sue or to appoint a small shareholder director or a listed company or a listed company can appoint or a listed company can appoint and in a uh, uh, listed company can appoint a ssd when a request has been made by some number of small shareholders ma'am what do you mean by small shareholders small shareholders are those shareholders who are holding shares whose nominal value does not exceed face value don't forget this whose face value does not exceed rupees 20000 as of now the limit prescribed is 20000 whose face value does not exceed rupees 
ट्वेंटी थाउजेंड दो शेयर होल्डर्स आर कॉल्ड एज स्मॉल शेयर होल्डर्स सो इफ सो इफ से फॉर एग्जाम्पल थाउजेंड स्मॉल शेयर होल्डर्स एटलीस्ट एटलीस्ट थाउजेंड स्मॉल शेयर होल्डर्स और टेन परसेंट वन टेंथ ऑफ द स्मॉल शेयर होल्डर्स इफ दे गो एंड मेक एन एप्लीकेशन टू द कंपनी दैट दे आउट ऑफ दीज टू विच एवर इज लोअर थाउजेंड स्मॉल शेयर होल्डर्स और टेन परसेंट ऑफ द स्मॉल शेयर होल्डर्स विच एवर इज लोअर इफ दे गो एंड मेक एन एप्लीकेशन टू द कंपनी दैट वी वॉन्ट टू वी वॉन्ट यू टू अपॉइंट अ स्मॉल शेयर होल्डर डिरेक्टर फॉर अस देन इन दैट केस द कंपनी विल हैव टू अपॉइंट अ स्मॉल शेयर होल्डर डिरेक्टर ओके नाउ वेन एवर दी स्मॉल 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 शेयर होल्डर्स गो टू द कंपनी Uh, whenever they go to the company at that particular time they will go, uh, take the candidature of the person also means they are proposing the name of a person who can be appointed as a small shareholder we will take his details we will take his din we will take his consent we will take his signature all these things we are going to submit to the company right all these things we are going to submit to the company at least 14 days before the general meeting okay if that ssd is holding if that proposed ssd is holding any shares in the company then how much shares is he holding etc all these things all these things we are going to submit to the company at least 14 days before the general meeting so that this person if he is appropriate then he can be appointed in the general meeting of the company right the most important thing here is the most important thing here is this particular ssd this particular ssd will have to vacate his office will have to vacate his office if section 164 is attracted that is disqualification he will have to vacate his office under section 167 or he will have to vacate his office if conditions of 1496 is not fulfilled ma'am conditions of 1496 is not fulfilled means means he is not fulfilling the conditions of an independent director then in that case he will have to vacate his office which means that uh, ssd also has to fulfill he has to fulfill all the conditions as required to be fulfilled by an independent director right as required to be fulfilled by an independent director even ssd has to fulfill these conditions if it does not fulfill these conditions then he will have to vacate his office and if 1496 is applicable to him then he will also have to file the declaration he will also have to file the declaration under 149 sub section 7 three times remember those three times okay then tenure of the ssd tenure of the ssd will be one term up to five years he can count for one term up to up to 3 years not 5 years 5 years for was for the independent directors ssd can come for one term up to a period of 3 years no reappointment is possible here if he wants to come back again in the company then he can come back after fulfilling a cooling period after fulfilling a cooling period of 3 years only after that he can come back and in that also whenever he is coming back na it is called as fresh appointment it is not called as reappointment right and he can be a ssd he can be a ssd in maximum two companies provided these two companies are not there in conflicting business or they are not there in competing business so he can be a ssd in two companies there is no problem in that i hope i am very very clear with ssd provisions which was contained which was contained in section number 151 right now going on to the next section going on to the next section which is section number 152 which talks about appointment of director Ma'am, how do we appoint the director? So for that, for that particular purpose, first directors, first directors will be appointed as per the AOA. Okay, if suppose if suppose something is written in the AOA, then obviously we'll have to go as per the AOA. If the AOA is silent, if the AOA is silent, then in that case, whoever are the subscribers to the MOA, okay, whoever are the subscribers to the MOA, those people will be the first directors till the new directors or till the fresh directors are appointed by the company in the general meeting. And in case of one person company. that one member can be the first director okay that one member can be the first director if you are not appointing any other person or if nothing else is written in the a right now subsequent directors first directors were appointed by this, this way subsequent directors will obviously normally directors are appointed in the general meeting only right these directors these directors should have these directors should have din or any other number as may be prescribed okay if the government prescribes any other number as din in the future then in that case these people should be holding that particular number right if i uh, suppose if any particular person is going to be appointed as a director then he should give his consent also okay he should give his consent also first of all he should give his din plus he should give his consent that yes i agree i agree that i wish to get appointed as a director right the director is going to give his consent director is going to give his consent to the company in form number dir2 within 30 days of appointment and then the company is going to file this consent with the roc with the uh, with the roc in form number dir12 in form number dir12 the company is going to file it with the roc within 30 days of appointment uh, the, uh, the company is supposed to the director is supposed to give it to the company 
on or before the appointment the company the director is supposed to give it to the company on or before the date of appointment obviously consent has to be given in advance but when we go and file it with the roc then it has to be done within 30 days from the date of appointment and two different points two different points two different forms will be used there that is dir2 when i am giving it to the company and dir12 dir12 when the company is giving it to the roc okay now most important pointer coming up here or most important subsection coming up here that is 152 subsection 6 okay that is 152 subsection 6 which talks about retirement by rotation okay if aoa says that all the directors will retire if aoa says that all the directors will retire then in that case then in that case all of them will retire okay except for the non retiring ones that is except for the independent directors etc apart from that all of them are going to retire but if AOA does not say anything like that, then we'll have to go as per section 152 subsection 6. If we go as per 152 subsection 6, if we go as per 152 subsection 6, then in that case, see what are we supposed to do. Understand and just try to recollect this. You will take the total number of directors. Out of total number of directors, you will subtract, you will subtract independent directors, you will subtract SSD, and you will subtract some specific nominee directors. Okay, because these people, because these people are totally, because these people are totally not eligible to retire by rotation, right? So, these people will be subtracted right from the beginning. After that, whatever number of directors you are left with, okay, first do two-third of that. Okay, first do two-third of that. If you get any decimal, please round it off. Okay, then on the right-hand side, take the balancing one, that is one-third of the directors. Balancing figure, okay, balancing figure, take one-third to the right-hand side of it. Okay, these two third are those directors who are who are liable to retire by rotation, who are liable to retire by rotation, and one third are those who will who are either either they are having a fixed tenure or they are not going to retire. Okay, they are non-retiring directors. Example, your additional directors, those one third will get eliminated in that. Okay, now in this two third of this particular two third also, we are going to do one third. Okay, of this two third also, we are going to do this one third. And while doing this one third, we have to round it off to the nearest number. We have to round it off to the de nearest decimal. And these one third, whatever is the final answer, these one third are the people who are actually, who are actually going to retire, who are actually going to retire, who are actually going to go out of the company. Right? And these are the retiring directors. They are going to go out of the company on FIFO basis. Means the director who was holding the office from the, uh, from the earliest date, that particular director will go out now. Or if suppose if all the directors are appointed on the same day etc then in that case we are going to do it by way of draw of lots and accordingly that particular director is going to go out of the company right okay now 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 listen now the director has gone out retirement by rotation is already done okay one point that i would like to mention here is i had told you in the beginning we will subtract independent directors we will subtract ssd and we will subtract specified nominee directors Ma'am, with specified nominee directors, those specified nominee directors who have come on behalf of an institution. Okay, these nominee directors have come on behalf of an uh, institution which is regulated by a specific act. Okay, example, if a nominee director has come on behalf of LIC, then LIC is regulated. LIC is regulated by the LIC Act. Then those nominee directors will be subtracted there. Okay, now listen, now listen. Suppose if, suppose if, you have come to know that some number of directors are actually going to retire. Okay, you have come to know that some number of directors have actually retired. Then in that case, there can be possibilities that are we supposed to keep, do we want to keep that place vacant? Okay, see, suppose if some of the directors have gone out, then that their place have become vacant at least. Then you can either decide whether you want to fill it or you don't want to fill it. Okay, if you don't want to fill it, then that's absolutely all right. You can keep that place vacant because you do not require those many number of directors in the company. Or if you want to fill, if you want to fill, then in that case, if you want to fill, then you can either fill in the same general meeting in which these people were going out. Okay, if you are not getting any new director in this meeting, then no problem, adjourn the meeting. Okay, adjourn the meeting to the next week. When you adjourn the meeting to the next week, when you adjourn the meeting to the next week, in the next meeting also, if you are not getting new directors, but if you want to fill it, then you can reappoint the same directors. The, the the directors who had gone out, the directors who had who had gone out, those directors can be reappointed. Okay, but but there are five cases. There are five cases when these directors cannot be reappointed. First of all, first of all, we had presented a resolution for approval, but we did not get the voting. Okay, or say for example, the retiring directors themselves said we don't want to come in your company. They expressed their unwillingness. 
or if or if these these retiring directors these re re retiring directors have attracted some disqualifications then they cannot come in the company if these if these uh, for appointment of these retiring directors a resolution was required but we did not even pass a resolution we did not even pass a resolution so this becomes an invalid appointment and the last one if section 162 is applicable that is if you did not pass if you did not pass multiple resolutions for appointment of multiple directors then it becomes invalid that is if section 162 gets attracted okay then in that case that those directors cannot be reappointed then in that case uh, then in that case if later on if later on if you want to appoint the board can fill board can appoint an additional director or if you want a new face coming in the company then you can go as per section number 100 60 right and you can appoint a new face later on in the next general meet okay then section number 153 to section number 159 section 153 to 159 is self study which basically talks about the din provisions right which basically talks about the din provision now in section number uh, going on to the next section that is section number 160 160 is a very nice section suppose if you want to bring new directors in the company if you want to it, it, we are not bringing the retiring directors back in the company i am not talking about them those retiring directors had come back in the company right in section number 152 subsection 7 right now i want to bring any new face in the company new director in the company then what is the process for that okay suppose if you want to appoint any new director in the company then in that case then in that case or if you want to become a new director in the company then in that case you have to give a uh, notice of your candidature you have to give a notice of your candidature to the company at least 14 days before the general meeting say for example after becoming ca if you say that i want to become i want to become a director in the company then in that case you have to give your candidature okay you have to give your candidature uh, you have to leave your candidature with the company at least 14 days before the general meeting along with that you have to give a deposit of at least rupees you have to give a deposit of rupees 1 lakh 1 lakh to the company showing that yes your uh, application is a genuine one your application is a genuine one you have to give this deposit of rupees 1 lakh to the company and then and then uh, later on in the company by passing the resolutions you can be selected or you can be rejected okay if you are selected then well and good you will be appointed as a director and you will get your deposit refunded back if you are not selected if you are not selected but you have got more than 25% of the valid votes okay then in that case even though you are not selected then too you will get the refund and if you have uh lost the elections if you have lost the elections but and you have got and you have got less than 25% of the valid votes cast or up to 25% of the valid votes cast then in that case you will not get your money back and your deposit gets forfeit all right in case of nidhi company instead of 1 lakh we can give a deposit up to rupees 10000 no issues in that and suppose if suppose if you are standing for the position of independent director suppose if your name has been recommended by the nrc or the board then in that case also you can be exempted you can be exempted from the uh, for from payment of deposit because see if you are standing for the position of independent director anyway you would have fulfilled 1496 and if suppose your name is recommended by the nrc or the board then someone has some faith in you okay then in that case also you are not required to give any deposit right and accordingly 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 your accordingly your appointment will be done either it will be done or it will be rejected in the general meeting right when it comes to section 8 company section 8 companies can determine whether they want to refund back even if we have got less than 25% of valid votes cast then to in section 8 company if it de determines then it can refund back that 1 lakh rupees to the applicant okay means in section 8 company basically it is at the discretion of the company right going on to the next section going on to the next section that is section number 161 going on to the next section that is section number 161 which talks about section 161 which talks about four different things additional director alternate director uh, nominee director as well as filling of the casual vacancy okay just try to understand in case of additional directors additional directors generally the powers are given generally the powers are conferred by the aoa okay it should be written in the aoa it is generally written in the aoa that the appointment of the uh, additional directors can be done if the company faces any workload then in that case appointment of the additional directors can be done by the board and that person can be appointed who is an eligible person means it should not happen that he was not appointed earlier we did not get votes for him earlier and now he is standing for the position of additional director no 
a qualified person basically a, a qualified person can be appointed as an additional director and this additional director is going to hold his office till the next agm he is going to hold the office till the next agm or the last day when the agm should have been held okay uh, last day of the agm or the date of the agm or the last day when the agm should have been held whichever is earlier till this particular date that uh, additional director will hold office suppose if the agm is not held at all suppose if the agm is not held at all then the last date when the agm should have been held till that particular date this additional director is going to hold his office okay and as already studied this additional director since his tenure is fixed he is a non retiring director okay he will come in that total number of directors but in that two third one third he will come in that one third wala in that one third category right generally for additional uh, for additional director the appointment is done by the board if the appointment is done by the board if the appointment is done by the board then in that case we'll have to pass a board resolution for appointing of this additional director okay and the additional director anyhow he is going to go he is going to go from our company he is going to go from our company at the time of general meeting if he wants to come back in the company okay if he wants to come back in the company as an ordinary director then he will have to fulfill the requirements of section number 160 being an ordinary director right then after this ordinary after this additional director is done okay after this additional director is done the next one that we have is the alternate director okay if the original director is going outside india for more than or equal to 3 months okay then the board of the company or uh, board of the company or the shareholders in the general meeting they can appoint an alternate director in place of the original director if they want if they want that yes we actually need a substitute then in that case for the time being we can appoint a person called as alternate director okay alternate director for an independent director also has to be an uh, independent director okay if suppose we have only one woman director in the company then alternate director for that one woman director in the company should also be a woman director similar thing applies for a resident director also right and alternate director now he is going to do everything on behalf of whom alternate director is going to do everything on behalf of the original director and therefore the tenure of the alternate director will be till the time the original re director returns back Okay, till the time the original uh, director comes back, till that particular time, the tenure of the alternate director will be there. Okay, and alternate director, alternate director can basically vote in the meeting. Okay, if it is such a matter, if it is such a matter which cannot be discussed in video conferencing, audio visual conferencing, then in that case, then in that case, alternate director is going to vote. Okay, suppose if suppose if, if this is such a meeting where the uh, uh, things can be discussed by audio visual things and the voting can be done online, then in that case, original director can vote. Original director can vote. He can attend the meeting, and even the alternate director, he cannot vote, but at least he can attend the meeting as an attendee. Right? These are the pointers. These were the pointers which were applicable. These were the pointers which were applicable for an alternate director. similarly similarly we have got nominee director what is the point applicable for nominee director the point applicable for nominee director was suppose if suppose if the aoi of the company provides that if in your company some shareholding is there by the some shareholding is there of uh, say government some uh, big amount of loan has been given by any particular bank lic etc then in that case then in that case to represent their interest we can appoint a person called as nominee director from their organization okay that can be done only if it is provided only if it is provided in the aoa then it can be done right next one next one that is your casual vacancies suppose if any vacancy arises in the place of director okay uh, in place of a director who was appointed in the general meeting okay don't forget this if the original director was appointed in the general meeting if we want to if there is a vacancy in this person's place he has passed away or something like that or something like that then in that case then in that case the board the board of directors can fill this vacancy okay suppose if it's written in aoa how to fill then we'll do that way or otherwise generally it is filled by the board of directors in the board meeting okay this is filled by the directors by the board of directors in the board meeting and later on it is ratified by the shareholders okay whose which directors vacancy are we fulfilling the directors who were appointed by the company in the general meeting their vacancy was is filled by the board okay now can i say can i say these directors the directors who came in the previous person's place these are appointed by the board so now if there is a vacancy in this person's place then this does not result in a casual vacancy because these second directors were appointed these were appointed by the board and casual vacancy happens only of those directors who were appointed in the general meeting 
okay so so in that case what can happen is see first of all when the first casual vacancy arises either you can fill it or you can leave it vacant also suppose if you do not have that much work if you do not want a new director you can simply keep the place vacant and later if you require any new director either you can go with the option of additional director that is the board can appoint an additional director or you can bring a new face as per section number 160 right all these pointers all these pointers are written here and listen one important thing here is suppose when the original director goes and if the casual vacancy is filled by the board then the director who comes the director whose place is filled by way of casual vacancy the new director who comes his tenure will be till the tenure of the original director means suppose if the original director would have been in the office till that particular date the tenure will be there, there for the new director also that is for the director who is coming in the casual vacancy right so basically one most important thing here is casual vacancy under section 161 subsection 4 can be filled off only those directors who were appointed by the company in the general meeting and not by the board in the board meeting right that is the most important point that is the most important point that you have to remember in section number 161 subsection 4 now two small small sections two very very small small sections section number 162 and section number 163 Section number one sixty two and section number one sixty three. One sixty two says one sixty two says that these directors, these directors, uh, the directors has to be the directors. Whenever the directors are to be appointed, then they will be appointed by the company in the general meeting. They will be appointed by the company in the general meeting by individual resolutions. Suppose if we want to appoint five directors. Suppose if we want to appoint five directors, then those five directors for those five directors will have to pass. five different different resolutions for those five directors will have to pass different different resolutions but if you want to appoint all of them if you want to appoint all of them by a single one if you want to appoint all of them by a single one then before passing this resolution you have to pass you have to get it agreed from the shareholders that they are okay that they are you, uh, you have to get it agree, agreed from the shareholders that they are okay with one resolution also and when they are agreeing for this one resolution now whenever they are agreeing for this one resolution at that time no one should come and say no okay no one should come and say no means everyone see either you don't cast a vote either you just keep quiet or you say yes okay if any one also if any one of the shareholder also says no then in that case you cannot appoint all of them by a single resolution then in that case you will have to appoint then in that case you will have to appoint all of them by different different resolution okay still if you have appointed all of them by a single resolution still if you have appointed all of them by a single resolution then in that case then in that case then in that case the appointment will be totally void okay the appointment will be totally void okay the last section here the last section here is section number 163 163 which says that which says that suppose if this is an optional section this is very very important section 163 is an optional section which says that suppose if suppose if the company wants to appoint the directors generally it is appointed by the company uh, in the uh, general meeting by way of an ordinary resolution okay by way of an ordinary resolution now in that case generally when we go by ordinary resolution the voting is done as per the value the voting is done as per the value okay now there is one more method there is one more method which the company can choose while appointing the directors that is the principle of proportional representation the principle of proportional representation where i had given one of the example where i had given one of the example that is of the head count okay i had given one of the example that is of the head count that is if you can do the appointment by way of head count where majority where minority shareholders get a good right to represent or you can do the appointment by way of that uh, election type of voting which i had told you election type of voting election type of voting that is uh, uh, just like your piecemeal distribution where the votes gets gets transferred okay so the appointment can be done by that method also that is simply see even that is done in a general meeting only but that is simply a different method of appointment that is nothing but a different method of appointment and if the company chooses okay okay we want to go by this proportional representation method then at least two third of the director should be chosen by this method and this method can be used once in 3 years okay this method can be chosen once in 3 years if at all you want to go by this up huh? if aoa provides for that then only you'll have to go if aoa is silent then you can normally go as per your normal method of appointment that is where you appoint the directors in ordinary resolution by voting
okay this this section is not at all applicable to a government company that is government companies they do not even have this option of following this proportional representation method okay so this was one basically a different method this was a different method of appointing directors either you can give the weightage to the minority shareholders or you can go by the election method you can go by the election method of appointing the directors where at least two third if you have chosen this method then at least two third of the directors will be appointed by this way and this appointment should be done once in every three years right so this was this was all about your section number this was all about your section number 163 chalo so then let's continue ahead let's continue ahead with the further sections of directors chapter uh, the last section that we had done was section number 163 which was talking about proportional representation appointment of directors by way of proportional representation which was an optional section which can be chosen by the company going on uh, to the next one going on to the next one that is section number 164 164 is an important section 164 talks about disqualifications for appointment of directors that is they have listed a few points they have listed a few points and then they are telling that if any of the below points if any of the below points are attracted if any of the below points are attracted then that particular director is disqualified from getting appointed as a director in a particular company mainly mainly here subsection 1 and subsection 2 are very very important Subsection 1 has some general points about the disqualifications. Example, example, if any person is of unsound mind, if any person is an undischarged insolvent, if any person has applied to be declared as an insolvent, if any particular person has been convicted of any offense and he has been sentenced to imprisonment for more than or equal to 6 months. Okay, offense means it can be anything whether involving moral turpitude or whether not involving moral turpitude and he has been imprisoned for more than or equal to 6 months and uh, he will be disqualified till the time uh, for a period of 5 years till from the end of his sentence means once he has gone to the jail after that from the time when he will come out from the jail even from that time for a period of 5 years he will still be disqualified so basically this is just like acting like your cooling period that even after he comes from the jail even after that there is going to be a gap of five years means he is still going to be disqualified for a period of five years then but if there is any particular person who has been sentenced to imprisonment for more than or equal to seven years okay for more than or equal to seven years then that person is permanently that person is permanently disqualified to become a director okay these were the four points first point was unsound mind second point was insolvent third point was insolvent fourth point was convicted of any offense whether involving moral turpitude or otherwise then fifth point fifth point is if the court or tribunal has specifically passed an order disqualifying any person to be appointed as a director specifically any order has been passed by court or tribunal if you are a shareholder of this company also and if you have not paid the call money Okay, if you have not paid the call money, if you have not paid the calls in arrears for a period of 6 months. Okay, means basically from the due date when you were supposed to pay it, from that due date, 6 months have already elapsed and you have not yet paid the call money. So, you become disqualified to be appointed as a director there. Or if you are convicted under section 188, 188 stands for your related party transactions which we are going to see in the board meetings chapter. If you are convicted under section 188 during the last five years 188 means you are convicted for doing any related party transaction means you have not done something properly and you are convicted under section 188 or if you have not complied with the din requirements uh, director identification number requirements or if you have not complied with section number 165 165 talks about the number of directorship means if you are purposely holding more than the specified number of directorships Okay, these are the pointers. These are some of the pointers given up here. As you can see, total 9 points have been given up here. If any one of the pointers attracted, then in that case, you are disqualified. You are disqualified from becoming a director, from getting appointed as a director in the company. Okay, this was section number 164, subsection 1. Now, going on to the next one, that is 164, subsection 2. Okay, 164 subsection 2 says that if you are a director of a defaulting company, okay, just try to understand, if you are a director of a defaulting company, 
we'll see what is the meaning of defaulting company but if you are a director of a defaulting company then you cannot be reappointed in the same company for a period of 5 years and you cannot be appointed in a new company for a period of 5 years okay provided what provided you are a director in a defaulting company ma'am what do you mean by the term defaulting company defaulting company means such a company which has not filed its financial statements or which has not filed its annual returns for a continuous period of three financial years okay it has not filed fs or it has not filed its annual return any one or both it can be anything for three continuous years then that company becomes a defaulting company or if the company has failed to repay the public deposits and the interest on it or it has failed to redeem any debentures or failed to pay interest on it or it has failed to pay the declared dividend okay five points are there here basically first one is it has not paid the deposits it has not paid the interest on that okay next it has not paid or not redeemed the debentures plus it has not paid the interest on it okay or it has not paid the declared dividend and one year has already gone okay means the, the default is going on for a period of at least one year then in that case the company becomes a defaulting company and if you are a director in such defaulting company then in that case then in that case you cannot be reappointed in the company for a period of 5 years or you cannot be appointed in any new company for a period of 5 years. okay this is this is what is given under section 164 subsection okay but now see there was a provi there was a proviso inserted here this was a nice proviso we had interpreted this if a new director comes in this defaulting company okay if a new director if a new person comes in this defaulting company then immediately he does not become a defaulting one but if he does not rectify his default within if he does not rectify the company's default within a period of 6 months okay we give him 6 months time if he does not rectify it within a period of 6 months then only disqualification will be attracted to him so basically since he is a new person we are giving him a time, we are giving him a time period of 6 months to rectify his default right now 164 subsection 3 164 subsection 3 first point says that a private company okay a private company if it wants it can put more restrictions just like we studied 9 points in 164 subsection 1 we studied two defaulting points in 164 subsection 2. Okay, so now here they are telling for a private company, if it wants to put more restrictions, it can put those more restrictions and the private company will have to fulfill those AOA pointers. Right? Now listen, now listen. For the pointers, for the pointers D, E, G, for the pointers D, E, G, D, E, G means D point was any specific order has been passed by any court or tribunal. In section 164, 1, E point, E point, uh, e point was e point was your uh, specific order passed by a court or tribunal d point was convicted of that fourth point was convicted of any offense whether involving moral turpitude or otherwise and g point was uh, convicted of an offense under section 188 okay in all these cases the court has come into picture and the court has convicted you right so here they are telling here they are telling that even if you want to go and file an appeal Okay, the court has passed an order against you. Even if you want to go and file an appeal, then also, then also, no problem. Go and file an appeal, but you will still be called as a disqualified person only. Okay, even though you want to go and file an appeal, etc., then also, then also, you will be called as a disqualified person only. Right? Okay, so these were, these were some of the important pointers here. And yes, one of the most important point here is, say for example, if in case of section 164, subsection 2, if in case of section 164 subsection 2, uh, suppose if the old directors, if the old directors have rectified the default, does not mean they are that uh, does not mean that they are not guilty. Okay, means even if the old directors have rectified the default, then also they are not yet eligible for reappointment. They cannot be reappointed for a period of five years. So once default done, then it is assumed that the default is done. Right? This was, this was all about your section number 164. Okay, going on to the next one, that is section number 165, which talks about the number of directorship. Number of directorship means, number of directorship means a particular person, okay, a particular person can be a director. A particular person can be a director in maximum how many companies? So, we have already studied this. A particular person can be a director in maximum 20 companies and in which the bifurcation of public company should not be more than 10. Okay, so basically he can be a director. He can be a director in maximum total 
total 20 companies total 20 companies out of it it can be uh, 10 public companies okay this includes your additional director holding an office it includes alternative if you are holding office as an alternate director if you are holding office as an additional director everything everything is included there okay except if anything is specifically excluded here now just try to understand just try to understand first of all they are telling first of all they are telling that public companies for public companies we have a maximum limit of we have a maximum limit of 10 right now say for example say for example if there is any private company okay if there is any private company which is a holding or subsidiary of a public company okay if there is a private company which is a holding or subsidiary of a public company then even that will be deemed for the purpose of this section even that will be deemed to be a public company okay and if it is deemed to be a public company then in that case it comes under that counting of 10 right but now listen if you are a director in dormant company then that is excluded from the overall limit if you are a director in a section 8 company a non-defaulting section 8 company then it is totally excluded and if you are a director if you are a director in a foreign company if you are a director in a foreign company these three are totally excluded first one is dormant company second one is section 8 company and third one third one is a foreign company if you are a director in these companies then it is not included in that limit of 20 means you can be a director in these companies over and above okay over and above you can be a director in these companies okay if any company wants to put a restriction if any company wants to reduce this limit of 20 20 is given by the law if any company wants to reduce this limit of 20 then in that case the company can simply pass a sr and that new limit will be applicable on them. okay if any provisions are contravened if any provisions are contravened then there is a penalty of minimum rupees 5000 per day penalty of rupees minimum 5000 per day Section number 166 was a one-time read section which I had marked for you. 166 was talking about the duties of the director that what all things the uh, directors are supposed to do. Okay, now listen. Can I see he has to exercise his duties? Whatever work has been given to him, basically he has to exercise all of those. Okay, he has to exercise his powers. He has to act as per the articles of association. Right, then we have to make sure or the director has to make sure that he does not get involved he does not get involved in any conflicting matters he does not take any undue advantage or he does not take any undue gain out of the company for his own personal benefit he is working for promoting the objectives of the company he is working in good faith for the company right he should not assign his office to any other person we have done this he should not assign his office to any other person means he cannot say okay from tomorrow you come and sit in my place no not allowed he should exercise proper care he should exercise proper due diligence while exercising his duties right these were these were some of the pointers these were some of the pointers which were coming in the duties of the director but yes let me tell you these are not the only duties huh? these are not the only duties we are just studying an illustrative list these are the duties these are some of the duties of the right now going on to the next section section number 167 three big uh, three important sections left basically 167 168 and 169 okay now in that in that let's start with 167 167 talks about vacation of office okay 167 talks about vacation of office of the director means in which circumstances the director is supposed to vacate his office okay in that also subsection 1 subsection 1 clause a subsection 1 clause a is a different one rest everything are the standalone pointers okay uh, subsection 1 clause a says that subsection 1 clause a says that if say for example the director becomes disqualified under section 164 okay 164 the one which we studied now okay now just try to understand here in 164 also point number 1 point number 1 clause 164 subsection 1 was talking about those general nine pointers unsound mind insolvent etc and subsection 2 was talking about that defaulting company thing so now just try to understand just try to understand if 164 subsection 1 is attracted later on after he gets appointed if 164 subsection 1 gets attracted after he gets appointed see suppose if, he, if it gets appointed earlier then 164 was applicable if before appointment that person is insolvent then that person cannot be appointed at all because of section number 164 but after he is appointed if after that he becomes of unsound mind or something like that then he will have to vacate his office 
okay then he will have to vacate his office immediately from all the companies wherever he is a director that is told by clause a okay now listen now listen say for example say for example if any director becomes disqualified under section 164 sub section 2 okay if any director becomes disqualified under section 1642 means basically now he is known as a director of a defaulting company then in that case this particular director will have to vacate his office in all the other companies he will have to vacate his office in all the other companies in which he is a director except for in the defaulting company in the defaulting company he is going to continue till the end of the uh, general meeting he will not be reappointed as we have already studied but he is not required to vacate his office immediately but from all the other companies from all the other companies he will have to vacate his office immediately right this was a pointer this was a pointer basically which was relating to section number 164 that is when 164 gets attracted how are we supposed to vacate our office okay so i'll repeat it again in section 164 1 if 164 1 is attracted then vacate office immediately from all the companies If one sixty four two is attracted, vacate vacate office from all the companies in which you are a director, except for the company which is a defaulting company. Right now, next uh, some standalone pointers coming up here. Some standalone pointers coming up here. If he is not attending the board meeting, if he absents himself from board meeting, either with the permission of the board or without the permission of the board, doesn't matter. In the last twelve months, he has not attended a single board meeting. Okay, if we contravene, there were two pointers. There were two pointers which was talking about section number one hundred and eighty-four. One is contravention of section number one hundred and eighty-four, and the other one is non-disclosure of his interest. If he is an interested director, he is not disclosed his interest as required under section one hundred and eighty-four. Okay, or if say for example, or if now there are two pointers coming up here. if he is disqualified by a specific order passed by court or tribunal if the court or tribunal passes a specific order then i'll have to vacate my office immediately from all the companies if he has been convicted by the court and sentenced to imprisonment for more than or equal to 6 months just like we had studied in section number 164 in these cases in these cases whenever this order is passed you have to vacate your office okay this was a by default rule that you have to vacate your office but now for these two points but now for these two points that is when a specific order of disqualification has been passed by court or tribunal or whenever any conviction order has been passed by court court etc in these two cases they are telling see yes we are disqualified as per section 164 that we have already studied that we were disqualified as per section number 164 no doubt in that okay but now the question arises are we supposed to vacate our office if we go for appeal Okay, if we go for appeal, are we supposed to vacate our office? Okay, so see what are they telling us here? That the day when the order was passed, from that day, when the day when the conviction order was passed, from that day, within a period of thirty days, within a period of thirty days, you need not vacate your office because for these thirty days, we are giving you an option that you can go and file an appeal. Okay, if I have filed an appeal within this period of thirty days, then I should not vacate my office. I should not vacate my office. till the time till the time the final decision comes and plus 7 days seven buffer days is given you that basically from uh, you are not required to vacate your office till seven days till seven days from the date when you receive your uh, final decisions of the court uh, that is in case of appeal okay say for example the final decision comes on the final decision comes at the month end at the month end then from that day within a period of 7 days you are till a period of 7 days you are not required to vacate your office okay again within this period of 7 days itself this buffer period of 7 days if you again go and file an appeal if you again go and file an appeal then in that case again you are not required to vacate your office till till the time the uh, second appeal till the time the second appeal is disposed of okay so basically they are telling that if your first appeal was filed within a period of 30 days then basically you need not vacate your office till the time till the time your first appeal is disposed of plus 7 days and if you have gone and filed the second appeal then till the time your second appeal is disposed of you are not required to vacate your office you are disqualified no doubt in that you are disqualified okay you are disqualified you cannot be reappointed in the company for a period of 5 years you cannot be uh appointed in a new company for a period of 5 years but in the existing company you are not required to vacate your office immediately okay then the next point the next point is suppose if you are removed suppose if you are removed as per section number 169 
suppose if you are removed as per section number 169 then in that case vacancy arises you'll have to vacate immediately suppose if suppose if you were appointed in a particular company because of another company say for example i was appointed in first of all i was appointed in the holding company because i was ho holding an office in the holding company even the subsidiary company appointed me as a director okay so first holding company i was holding office next subsidiary company i was holding office now if some disqualification arises or if some problem arises and if i am removed say for example if i am removed from the holding company say for example if i am removed from the holding company then automatically my office has also to be vacated from the subsidiary company because i was appointed in the subsidiary company due to the due to or virtue of holding the office in the holding company so these were these were some of the i think eight pointers eight pointers we have done here uh eight pointers that we have done here these if any of these eight pointers are attracted then we are supposed to vacate our office right in all the cases see in appeal cases the vacation is different that is you have to vacate your office after a certain point of time okay if 1642 is attracted if 1642 is attracted then you will have to vacate your office in all the other companies except for the defaulting company in rest all the cases you are supposed to vacate your office immediately okay in rest all the cases you are supposed to vacate your office immediately okay if purposely you have not vacated if purposely you have not vacated your office when you were supposed to vacate it under section 167 okay when you were supposed to vacate it under section 167 then in that case then in that case a punishment would be applicable there the punishment would be applicable there that is fine or imprisonment or both fine ranging between rupees 1 lakh to 5 lakh imprisonment imprisonment which can go up to 1 year or both right these are the pointers which are applicable there suppose if suppose if all the directors place becomes vacant okay suppose if all the directors place becomes vacant then the central government will come into picture or if the promoter is there if he has not vacated his office then promoter will come into picture and they are going to appoint the new director okay and if a private company wants if a private company wants then in that case it can provide for some more grounds just like we had seen in section number 164 for 167 also the private company can provide for more grounds for vacation of office that is apart from these eight pointers it can put it can give a few more pointers it can give a few more pointers where the vacation of office can be attracted Okay so this was this was all about this was all about your section number 167 which is talking about vacation of office that is where you'll have to vacate your office immediately or after a certain point of time depending upon the pointers right going on to the next one going on to the next one that is section number that is section number 168 168 is very very simple 168 talks about the resignation of director and 169 is going to talk about the removal of director Okay, one sixty eight talks about resignation of director. Means, say for example, if a director wants to resign from his office, if a director wants to resign from his office, no problem. He can just give a notice in writing. Okay, he can just give a resignation notice in writing, basically to the company. And as soon as the company receives it, basically when the board receives it on behalf of the company, the board will take the note of the same. Okay, board will observe that okay, so and so director wants to resign from the office, and after that, after that. we are going to accept okay just remember one point here you are the md of the company or maybe any other director cannot say that no your resignation is disqual uh, your resignation is not allowed or disallowed etc no nothing like that if the director says i want to resign from my office then he can resign from the office by giving a notice in writing to the company okay in such cases what happens is see when we give the resignation notice to the company company will have to go and file this with the roc in form number dir12 within 30 days Okay, whenever the company receives the resignation notice from us, from that day within a period of thirty days, the company has to go and file it with the ROC in form number DIR twelve. Okay, and along with that, if we also want, okay, if the director wants, if even if the even the director can, okay, it's not mandatory, but even the director can go and file his uh, resignation notice copy etc. in form number DIR eleven to the ROC. see ideally we have to give it to the company and company is going to give it to the roc but if you also want to give it to the roc then it is an, there is an option available for you that even you can give it to the roc within uh, you, even you can give it to the roc within a period of 30 days in form number dir 11 okay now listen now listen from which date from which date this resignation will be effective from which date this resignation will be effective 
okay the date on the date which is either the date which is written in the notice you would have written in the notice that i am going to resign from so and so date either that date or the date when the notice is received by the company whichever is later okay say for example the you have delivered the notice to the company today okay but you have written in the notice that you are going to resign after from after 5 days so then the resignation will be valid from after a period of 5 days that is the date of the resignation okay and whatever acts he had done at the time when he was a director whatever acts he had done at the time when he was a director he will be liable for all those acts even later on okay even later on he will be liable for the acts that he had done when he was acting as a director and suppose if suppose if again if suppose all the directors resign if suppose all the directors resign then the, all the places have become vacant so now you know the answer if all the places have become vacant then either the central government will come into picture either the central government will come into picture or the promoters all the or the promoters are going to appoint the directors right okay now going on to the next one going on to the next section that is section number 169 going on to the next section that is section number 169 which talks about which talks about removal of director section number 169 which talks about removal of director just try to understand removal of directors now now first of all what are they telling us here what are they telling us here which directors can first of all the question arises can the directors can the directors be removed okay the first question arises here can the directors be removed so the answer is yes the directors can be removed okay it's not necessary that some default should be done okay it's not necessary that the default should be done but normally a director can be removed say for example if we think that this particular director does not have proper qualifications etc he has no longer got that expertise etc then we can remove that particular director it's not necessary that the director should be a defaulting director only okay so now so now basically you can you can remove any particular director okay you can give remove any particular director but first give him a reasonable opportunity of being heard give him a notice that boss now you are going to be removed okay which director cannot be removed this is important which director cannot be removed first of all first of all any director which has been appointed any director which has been appointed by the tribunal okay any director which has been appointed by the tribunal under section 242 any director which has been appointed by the tribunal under section 242 that director cannot be removed okay next one next one any director who has been appointed by your proportional representation proportional representation method those directors cannot be removed okay nominee director specified nominee directors which are regulated by the agreements those directors generally cannot be removed because they are regulated by the agreements okay apart from that apart from that if there is any independent director just try to recollect independent directors can be appointed for two consecutive terms first they can be appointed for one term and then they can be reappointed for the second term after passing a special resolution so if you want to remove a director who was reappointed for the second term so now for his removal also we require for his removal also we require a special resolution to be passed there. okay now in such cases in such cases what happens is when the company decides okay when the company decides that a particular director is to be removed we give a notice of this removal to that particular director and we ask that okay concentrate here we ask that particular director to make representation that if he wants to speak something before the company before he is removed then we give him a give him an opportunity okay once the director receives this particular opportunity then the director can make a representation in writing and he can give it to the company so that the company can circulate so that the company can circulate this particular representation amongst all the members suppose if we have given the representation on time suppose if the director has given his representation on time whatever he wants to communicate with everyone he has written everything on time and given it to the company then this is circulated amongst all the members okay suppose if it is given late or suppose if the company could not circulate it for some or the other reasons if he gives it late then in that case in in such case of insufficient time then in this case this representation will be read out in the meeting okay since we could not circulate it since we could not circulate it this representation will be read out in the meeting just like your auditor thing okay just like your auditor auditor thing this representation will be read out in the meeting okay but now but now say for example if you think that if the company thinks or if the chairperson thinks or if any other person thinks that 
the things which are returned the things which are returned in this particular representation is defamatory means it is not good for the company this talks against the company etc then in that case we have to go and apply to the tribunal and if the tribunal is satisfied that yes this is actually defamatory unnecessary publicity he is seeking etc then the tribunal will say that okay this is defamatory and this need not be read out but yes just like your auditors you are also we have to go and take the approval of the tribunal Okay, now listen. Now listen. Suppose if a particular director is removed. Suppose if a particular director is removed as per the section number one hundred and sixty-nine, and for his removal, can I say removal will be done in a general meeting only by way of an resolution, ordinary resolution? But for this particular removal, when you were calling the shareholders to attend the meeting, see, ordinary resolution means general meeting. General meeting means all the shareholders are going to sit there. When you are calling your shareholders, you have to give them the notice. But here, if the notice that you have given is a special notice, okay, if the notice that you have given here, if that notice is a special notice, then in that case, that uh, the meeting in which the director is getting removed, in that meeting itself, you can appoint a new director also, okay, provided, provided, if for the general meeting, if you had given a special notice, special notice term is very very important. I am not talking here about special resolution. No, the notice that you are giving to the shareholders, if that notice was a special notice, and if it was mentioned in that, then in that case, the director who is going out in that particular place, if required, if required, you can appoint a new director in the same meeting. Right? Now listen. Now listen. Suppose if suppose if you appoint a new person in this place. Okay, in the same meeting, if you appoint a new person in this particular place, that replacement person, okay, that replaced person is going to hold the office. If that new person is going to hold the office till the tenure of the removed person. Means, suppose if the removed person would have been in the office till that particular date, till, till that particular date, this replaced person is going to uh, hold his office. Okay, suppose if suppose if if you are not able to fill this vacancy. Okay, I am not talking about the term casual vacancy. Listen, listen. As of now, I have not used the word casual vacancy. Suppose if a particular director has been removed, and if new director could not be appointed, if a new director could not be appointed in that place, then in that case, then in that case, you can call it as a casual vacancy. Then in that case, you can call it as a casual vacancy, provided this original director was appointed in the general meeting. It then only we can call it as a casual vacancy, na. And if it is a casual vacancy, then the casual vacancy will be filled by the board, right? It will be filled by the board later on in the board meeting, as per section number one sixty one, subsection four, right? And now just try to understand. Just try to understand your uh, the director who was removed. Okay, the director who was removed. That person cannot be reappointed. Okay, just like we were bringing people. Remember, we were bringing the same people under section one fifty two six and seven. But here, since we have voluntarily removed this particular person, then those people cannot be reappointed. Okay, so first option is the replace. Uh, 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 you can bring the replacement in the same meeting. Another thing is, if you are not able to bring the replacement in the same meeting, then in that case, one sixty four, one sixty one, subsection four can be applicable. That is casual vacancy. It can be treated as a casual vacancy, and board can fill this casual vacancy. Or alternatively, if you want to keep this place vacant, okay, you don't need more directors for you know for some work etc. Or the workload in the company, you can absolutely keep this place vacant. Or alternatively, one more last option, if you want to totally bring a new face in the company, if you want to totally bring a new face in the company, you can call for a new general meeting, and there you can apply section number one sixty. There you can apply section number one sixty, and you can appoint a new director, new face in the company. Okay, if the director, if the director has been removed under section one hundred and sixty nine above, then in that case, then in that case, if he is a non defaulting one, if he is a non defaulting one, then he will be eligible for compensation for loss of office. Okay, if he is a managerial personnel, he will receive the compensation for loss of office under section two zero two, as we have already studied in the managerial personnel chapter. Right. Next, going on to the last three sections. Going on to the last three sections. Uh. Section number one seventy, one seventy one, and one seventy two. All the three sections are one time read section. One seventy talks about maintenance of register. Okay, every company will have to maintain a register of directors. Okay, which contains their details, their name, address, spouse name, parents name, etc. All these details, their address, their nationality, how many shares are they holding in the company, from which day are they appointed as a director. All this, this director register is to be maintained. Director K M P and their shareholding register is to be maintained by the. Company at its registered office. 
ओके एंड वेन एवर वेन एवर वेन एवर एनी एंट्री न्यू एंट्री इज डन इन दिस रजिस्टर और वेन एवर एनी चेंजेस इज डन इन दिस पर्टिकुलर रजिस्टर देन वी हैव टू गो एंड इंटीमेट इट टू द आर ओ सी ओके फॉर द फर्स्ट टाइम वेन एवर एनी न्यू अपॉइंटमेंट इज डन देन यू हैव टू इंटीमेट इट टू द आर ओ सी विद इन थर्टी डेज ओके एंड वेन एवर एनी चेंज इज डन इन दिस पर्टिकुलर डिटेल्स देन यू हैव टू गो एंड देन यू हैव टू गो एंड इंटीमेट अगेन विद इन थर्टी डेज फ्रॉम द डेट ऑफ द चेंज ओके थर्टी डेज इन केस ऑफ न्यू अपॉइंटमेंट थर्टी डेज फ्रॉम द डेट ऑफ अपॉइंटमेंट in case of change 30 days from the date of change okay but in case of ifsc company year instead of 30 days instead of 30 days year it is 60 next one next one is section number 171 this is very very simple the register which is maintained above okay the register which is maintained above can that be inspected by the members of the company the answer is yes those can be inspected by the members of the company those can be inspected by the members of the company during business hours okay during business hours they can be inspected at the registered office they can either take extracts okay they can either take extracts from this register or they can even ask for copies of this okay and if they ask for copies of this then the uh, company will have to provide this copies free of cost here it was free of cost within 30 days of request within 30 days of request the company will have to provide those copies okay one is it will be open for inspection at the registered office of the company and second thing it will be open for inspection at the agm of the company also means uh, at every agm it will be open and the members or the people who attend the agm those people can inspect this particular register okay suppose now suppose now if i had asked for the copy i did not get it okay i wanted to do the inspection of the register i was not allowed to do by the company etc no problem then go and make a complaint go and make a complaint to the roc ROC will come into picture. ROC will make sure that you get the access to this uh, register, right? Then going on to the next one. Acha, this this uh, maintenance of register under section one hundred and seventy. Okay, and uh, inspection of this register under section one seventy one. This point is not applicable to a government company. Okay, they are not required to maintain it also, and they are not required to keep it open at the registered office also for the purpose of inspection. And one hundred and seventy two, one hundred and seventy two provides for the punishment where the values that they have given for the punishment or the figures that they have given for the punishment. This is this is for what purpose? This is suppose if in any particular section, if in any particular section there is no punishment written, then that is going to be applicable, right? Now some important case laws here. Some important case laws here. Say for example, say for example. Say for example, if suppose, if suppose, just like we studied in section number one hundred and sixty nine, what we studied in section number one hundred and sixty nine was suppose if you are removing a particular director and place of remove and uh, after removing that particular director, okay, after removing that particular director, after removing that particular director, if you appoint a new person in that place, the replacement, remember by way of that special notice, if you are appointing a new person there, then in that case, then in that case. then in that case this is not called as assignment of office because this is done legally okay you have removed a particular person and instead of that particular person you have appointed a new one okay so that is not treated as uh, what do you call this is not treated as assignment of office okay similarly similarly listen now what are they telling whenever we call a general meeting okay whenever we call a general meeting as we have studied from our ipcc itself that we are supposed to give uh 21 clear days notice right we are supposed to give 21 clear days notice now it was held in this particular case law that that 21 days is not mandatory okay that meeting can be called even at a shorter notice even at a shorter notice if the shareholders are comfortable okay if the shareholders are comfortable then the meeting can meeting can be called at a shorter notice the meeting can be called at a shorter notice also okay and in that particular meeting in that particular meeting we can appoint the directors just like in every general meeting we appoint the directors in that meeting also we can appoint the directors provided if the shareholders are agreeable because here the meeting was called at a shorter notice so if the shareholders are agreeable then we can appoint the directors in this meeting also even though it was called at a shorter notice okay now listen uh, 152 subsection 6 152 subsection 6 which was talking about retirement of directors by rotation or retirement by rotation of directors this retirement was happening at every general meeting this retirement was happening at every general meeting suppose if the general meeting could not be held okay then also the retiring directors will have to retire from the office they cannot wait for the agm to be held so say for example if the agm was not at all held then in that case they have to vacate their office on the last day when the agm should have been held 
right and the same point is applicable for additional directors also same point is applicable for additional directors remember additional directors tenure was till when additional director directors tenure was till the date of agm suppose if the agm is not held then they have to hold their office then they, uh, they have to hold their office and then they are supposed to vacate their office on the last day when the agm should have been okay now listen generally the additional directors are appointed by the board generally the additional directors are appointed by the board but suppose if there is a deadlock in the management okay if there are no directors in the company or if all the directors are defaulting etc there is a deadlock in the management then even the shareholders can come into picture and even they can appoint the additional directors okay this is happening only in exceptional circumstances this is happening only in the exceptional circumstance that the shareholders are coming into picture and they are appointing the additional directors right next next one next one says that see whenever you are removing the directors just like we removed the directors under section 169 under this particular section when you remove the directors okay when you remove the directors then in that case you, the shareholders okay the shareholders are not required to give any reasons the shareholders are not required to disclose any reasons that why are we removing okay why are we removing this particular director that is the responsibility of the board okay the board is going to mention that in the board's report the board is going to give the reason to that director who is getting removed but it, there is no there, uh, say, say for example if the shareholders have voted in the ordinary resolution that yes remove this particular director then while passing the ordinary resolution the shareholders the shareholders are not required to give any reason that why did they say yes for removing this person why did they say no for removing this person no we never give reason for giving any vote right now similarly similarly now listen uh, only which directors cannot be removed the director the director who was appointed by the tribunal under section 242 the nominee director if written in the agreement okay uh, any director who has been appointed by way of proportional representation these directors cannot be removed but any other director can i say any other director suppose if there is an ordinary director and it's written in the aoa that he is going to be a director for life He is going to be director for life. Okay, then in that case, even such director can be removed. Okay, there is no restriction. Basically, one sixty nine is going to override any such provision. Okay, means you can remove such type of director also, even though he was appointed for life. Okay, and and if say for example, if say for example, if you want to remove a particular director, okay, if you want to remove a particular director, then you have to follow section number one sixty nine only. Compulsorily, you have to follow section number one sixty nine only. You cannot. uh go in between to any civil court remember we used to study civil court not to have jurisdiction right we cannot go to the civil court and plus even the civil court cannot come into the picture and it cannot say okay that removal should be done this way removal should be done that way basically in companies act already the hierarchy as we have studied in the first chapter of the company law that is nclt etc that hierarchy has already been given if you if you are aggrieved by any particular thing then what are we supposed to do so accordingly here also the civil court even here the civil court cannot interfere in between we cannot go to the civil court and plus even the civil court cannot come into the picture right this was this was all about your this was all about your super quick revision of directors chapter if you take one provision at a time if you take one provision at a time and if you read and if you understand it then it will be very very easy for you trust me start let's start with the super quick revision of meetings of board and its powers uh which ranges from section number 173 to section number 195 section number 173 to 195 and out of which section number 194 and 195 194 and 195 these two sections were omitted so basically we are going to study basically we are going to study from section number 173 to section number 193 these are the sections that we are going to study there the first section section number 173 the first section section number 173 that talks about the board meetings or we can call it as the meetings of the board right so first of all first of all there are two things in that the first board meeting will be held within how many days just try to recollect things the first board meeting will be held within 30 days from the date of incorporation and subsequent board meeting forget about the first one normally after that the subsequent board meetings will be the total count of the subsequent board meetings minimum total count of the subsequent board meetings would be four meetings in a year four meetings in a year with a maximum gap of with a maximum gap of 120 days 
with a maximum gap of 120 days between two meetings okay between any two meetings the gap should not be more than 120 days okay so we had a covid related amendment here we had a covid related amendment we have not yet done it because we are waiting for the november 20 rtp to be released now uh, along with that now see the basic rule is the first board meeting should be held within uh, 30 days from the date of incorporation subsequently there should be four meetings in a year but central government central government can grant you an exemption central government can grant your company or a particular class of company a list of exemptions that okay uh, maybe maybe i'm just giving an example that instead of four board meetings you are required to conduct only three meetings in a year or maybe they can give you some restriction in terms of gap between two meetings etc but central government if it thinks fit then can grant you any exemption either to a particular company or to a class of companies right then the second subsection the second subsection talks about the participation in the board meeting who are going to participate how are we going to participate etc so first of all since we are talking about the board meeting since we are talking about the board meeting only the board of directors or we can say only the directors only the directors would participate in this particular board meeting the participation can be physically the participation can be physically or it can be by audio visual means or the video conferencing means these are the methods right whenever whenever the meeting is uh, you know called whenever the meeting is called or whenever the meeting is done by this audio visual or video conferencing mode then the company has to make sure that it has made proper uh, 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 what do you say uh, uh, what do you say proper uh, it has uh, done all the proper preparation it has done all the proper preparation it has make, made all the proper arrangements it has made all the proper arrangements for uh, participation so that the directors can participate in an effective manner and plus this particular meeting this particular meeting can be recorded stored etc for future purpose then there are certain matters there are certain matters which already the law has provided which already the law has provided that these matters so and so matters cannot be dealt by audio visual or video conferencing means we are going to do the list for that but i hope you remember there are certain important matters there are certain important matters which cannot be dealt by audio visual or video conferencing means Right, but there was an exception in that there was an exception in that that say for example if you have got the quorum in the physical meeting okay suppose if you have got the quorum in the physical meeting then even this even these important matters which cannot be discussed by audio visual or video conferencing means you can allow the directors to participate you can allow the other directors who are not able to who are not able to attend the meeting in physical mode who are not able to attend the meeting in physical mode then you can allow those directors to attend uh, these important matter meetings also by way of audio visual or video conferencing provided the most important condition here is provided the most important condition here is you have got a quorum in the physical meeting okay if you have got the minimum number of directors required in the physical meeting who can conduct the meeting in a valid manner then you can allow the other directors who are not allowed to or who are not able to attend the meeting by physical mode you can give them the access of attending the meeting by audio visual or video conferencing mode right this was all about your section number 173 subsection 2 ne next comes in section number 173 subsection 3 now 173 subsection 3 is very very important which talks about the notice of the board meeting that how many days notice should be given right so the notice at least 7 days notice at least 7 days notice of board at least 7 days notice uh, of the board meeting should be given to all the directors to all the directors whether alternate director whether ordinary director whether independent director whether interested director whether non interested director whether he is such a director who has already told that i won't be attending the meeting meet any kind of director the notice has to be given to all of them and at least 7 days notice in advance must be given and this notice must be sent it can be sent either by uh, it can be given either by hand delivery or it can be sent by post or it can be done by the email these are the modes which are already allowed by the law of uh, the uh, which are nothing but the modes of sending the notice Okay, if you want to call a meeting at a shorter notice, okay, if you want to call a meeting at a shorter notice, then we have a few provisos for that. That if you want to call a meeting at a shorter notice, that is by giving lesser than seven days notice, then you have to make sure that at least one independent director, if you have in the company, okay, at least one independent director, if you have in the company, then that particular independent director must be present in the meeting. Okay, that independent director must be present in the company if your company has an independent director. If a company does not have an independent director, then anyway you can call a meeting at a shorter notice. And if that independent director is not able to attend the meeting, okay, if that independent director is not able to attend the meeting or he, is, he has not come for that particular meeting, then once the meeting is done, you call the meeting, no problem in that, you call the meeting at a shorter notice, no issues in that. 
but once the meeting is done then you have to make sure that uh, the decisions which were taken at this particular meeting those get circulated to all the directors normally we circulated to all the directors but you should get a compulsory ratification from at least one independent director okay means what are they trying to do is they are just trying to involve they are just trying to involve the independent director if he can come in the company well and good if he is not able to come in the company no problem you take the decisions and get it ratified from him and in that case even the even the meeting which was called by you at a shorter notice even that meeting will be treated as valid okay even that meeting will be treated as valid then again the law does not say whether are we supposed to give the notice to original director or are we supposed to give the notice to the alternate director the law does not clarify about it right so in that case so in that case what are we supposed to do so they are telling that just as a matter of prudence okay just like we say in a conservatism so just as a matter of prudence it is good it is advisable to give notice to both of them that is to the original director as well as the alternate director so these were the pointers about the notice and if suppose there is a particular officer of the company who was required to give this notice okay if there was a particular officer of the company who was required to give the notice he he was charged with the duty to give the notice and that and if he fails to do if he does not give that notice then he will be liable to a penalty flat penalty flat penalty of rupees 25000 which is important okay flat penalty of 25000 that is very very important now we have certain exceptions modifications provisos etc coming up here just try to understand we just now saw that normally for a company in subsequent board meetings there must be four board meetings which must be conducted in a year right four board meetings must be conducted in a particular year now there are certain exceptions here there are certain exceptions here say for example if there is a opc okay if there is a opc if there is a dormant company or if there is a small company right if there is a opc if there is a small company or if it is a dormant company or if it is a non defaulting startup private company okay opc small company dormant company or non defaulting startup private company then even though even though even if these companies even if these companies conduct one meeting okay one meeting in each half of a calendar year that is in each half of a calendar year if they conduct at least one meeting means total two meetings in a calendar year at least with a gap of at least with a gap of at least 90 days that is minimum gap should be there of 90 days then in that case it will be assumed that they have complied with the provisions means instead of four meetings basically they can conduct even if they conduct two meetings in a year that is absolutely honest right similarly similarly for section 8 companies similarly for section 8 companies if in each half of a calendar year if they conduct one one meeting okay if in each half of a calendar year if they uh, conduct one one meeting even that is absolutely okay and here there is no provision about the gap okay here they are totally silent about it here there are no provisions about the gap okay this private company point this private company point i have already incorporated above that is a uh, a non defaulting startup private company it can conduct one one meeting in each half of a calendar year and the gap should be at least gap should be at least 90 days right i hope uh, i am clear till here i hope i am clear till here with section number 173 now now we have certain rules coming up now we have certain rules coming up a few rules here are very very important let's let's recollect let's recollect these rules now suppose if the meeting is conducted suppose if the meeting is conducted by audio visual means or by video conferencing means then in that case there are certain provisions there are certain rules that we have to comply first of all first of all see the company has to make adequate arrangement okay first of all the company has to make adequate arrangement so that there is no network issues there is no network failure during this meeting okay when the meeting is conducted by way of audio visual or video conferencing there is no network issues there are no security issues the integrity is maintained because this is not this is not a general meeting which can be made public right this is a private meeting board meeting is always a private meeting so we have to make sure that the meeting is secured no unauthorized access is given to any other person then for preparing the minutes for preparing the minutes we have to ma make sure that this particular session or this particular meeting is recorded so that we can preserve it for future purpose also so that we can make minutes also from it or we can use the same we can use the same recording as minutes also we have to keep backups of that we have to uh, you know the, since there will be so many meetings like in a year at least four meetings would be there and similarly for every year we would be having so many meetings etc so we have to name it properly that this is the recording this is the recording of so and so quarter so and so board meeting etc you have to name it properly we have to make sure that no other person no other person other than the director is given the access 
right because this is a board meeting so only the directors can access this particular meeting but yes one exception was there one exception was there if there is any particular director who is who is differently abled okay if there is any particular director who is differently abled then we can allow then we can allow one person to accompany such differently abled person okay that is the only exception otherwise no access of the board meeting can be given to any other person right now whenever we give the notice whenever we give the notice for this particular board meeting whenever we give the notice for this particular board meeting uh, at least 7 days notice that we were giving under section 173 subsection 3 then you have to make sure you have to make sure that uh, suppose if your company is suppose if your company is giving the option suppose if your company is giving the option of participating uh, through the video conferencing or the audio visual mode then it should be mentioned in the notice see first of all giving the option of audio visual or video conferencing is not mandatory huh? it is not mandatory right it is not at all mandatory but if at all the company is giving this particular option then it has to be specified in the notice it has to be specified in the notice that you can participate in this particular meeting either physically or by audio visual or video conferencing mode okay so that and now listen one more thing that they are telling us here is suppose if in the year if in the entire calendar year if you know that you are not going to attend the meeting physically any one meeting or maybe all the meetings if you will not be able to if you will not be able to um, attend the meeting physically then obviously you would like to attend the meeting by physical mode uh, by audio visual or video conferencing mode so at the beginning of the calendar year itself you have to give a declaration okay at the beginning of the calendar year itself you have to give a declaration that for this particular year i might attend the meetings by audio visual mode so please make suitable arrangements for me so this declaration has to be given at the beginning of the year okay for the entire year it has to be given at the beginning of the year if you have not given if you have not given this particular declaration then that means you do not want to attend by audio visual mode and you want to attend you are going to attend the meeting physically only right okay so now suppose if you have not given the declaration and later at the end moment if you come and say that you want to attend the meeting by audio visual mode no, so no that is not possible because they compulsorily say they compulsorily say that you have to attend you have to attend if you want to attend the meeting by audio visual or video, video conferencing mode then you have to give the declaration in advance but vice versa can happen okay to be on a safer side i can give the declaration at the beginning of the year and later on i can decide to attend the meeting physically no issues in that you just have to intimate the company sufficiently in advance that you are not going to attend the meeting by audio visual or video conferencing mode rather you are going to come and sit in the meeting physically okay so because so basically they are hinting basically they are hinting us here that the arrangement for audio visual video conferencing would take more time so that declaration has to be given in advance but physically any time if you want to come and attend you can definitely come and attend right now listen just like just like uh, a normal just like um, uh, a normal meeting here also the roll call will be taken the name of each and every director the place from where he is attending the meeting that will be confirmed from that will be confirmed okay that will be confirmed from each and every director suppose if in that particular board meeting now just try to understand okay if any particular board meet if in a particular board meeting some statutory registers are to be signed okay so the directors who are attending the meeting physically they can manually sign there no issues in that but the directors who are attending the meeting by audio visual mode then if they give their consent okay if over this conference itself if they give the consent that okay we are okay with this particular uh, statutory register then in that case it will be deemed it will be deemed as if they have signed this particular register okay then whenever any particular director whenever any particular director is going to talk on any particular topic okay if any director is talking is going to talk about, uh, talk about any particular topic in the meeting then first he has to identify himself okay that i am so and so person and i want to speak okay otherwise there would be a overlapping suppose if i also speak you also speak at the same moment then otherwise it creates a chaos at least for the audio visual and video conferencing mode okay in physical at least one person can stop but in audio visual we have to stop one particular person that let the other person speak first and then one by one we are going to we can suppose if there is any confusion suppose if there is any overlapping suppose if i also say you also say together okay so maybe the third person won't be able to understand anything so maybe the chairperson can ask you to repeat any uh, matter which you had already spoke right then say for example if in the particular meeting if in the particular meeting if you want to take a decision okay if you want to take any particular decision then in that case then in that case the chairperson the chairperson is going to call for the votes right say for example if you want to pass any board resolution okay so for board resolution generally we require a normal majority so for normal majority if the chairperson thinks that yes we need to take this particular majority then the chairperson will ask, ask all the directors to vote on that particular matter
right now listen in the board meeting suppose in the board meeting uh, when wherever the board meeting is conducted the company has to make sure the company has to make sure okay that no other person is present except for the directors except for the company secretary company secretary can be there except for the chairperson except for these people no other person is present because otherwise that would lead to an unauthorized access okay just one exception was there do you remember that differently able person only for that differently able person one person would be allowed one person would be allowed to ac accompany that particular person apart from that apart from that no other person would be allowed okay now listen once once a particular matter has been discussed on okay then the chairperson generally notes down that particular matter that who said what okay who said what are there any dissenting directors how many major how much majority have we got etc all these things are written by the chairperson okay that is actually recorded in the minutes that is actually recorded in the minutes of the meeting so basically first the chairperson or the cs as the case may be they prepare okay they prepare the draft minutes they prepare the draft minutes okay draft minutes these are not the final ones okay so they prepare the draft minute once the draft minute is prepared then it is circulated okay then the draft minutes are circulated to all the directors to all the directors within 15 days from the date of the meeting right then after that once the directors start receiving these draft minutes at their addresses then within a period of then within a period of 7 days okay then within a period of 7 days that director has to confirm that yes these uh, the minutes is absolutely perfect the matters which we had discussed in the meeting all those matters have been written in this particular minutes okay and once once the minutes are finalized once the minutes are finalized then they are placed in the minutes book okay minutes book the one same concept which you had studied in your ipcc that is in the bound book not in the le loose leaf format etc you have to maintain the minutes right so these were these were certain rules these were certain rules which were pertaining to your audio visual and video conferencing method okay now there are certain matters now there are certain matters which they say remember which we had discussed that that these matters cannot be discussed by way of audio visual or video conferencing mode but anyway we have been provided an exemption during covid that during covid uh, even if these matters are discussed even if these matters are discussed through audio visual mode there is no issues in that it's absolutely allowed okay so what are what are those five matters first of all approval of a uh, financial statement then approval of the board's report then whenever the company is going to issue any prospectus so approval of the prospectus then audit committee meetings where we are going to discuss and we are going to adopt the financial statements etc and then when the matter pertains to amalgamation demerger takeovers etc so these are the five most important matters which they have identified and they say that these matters cannot be discussed by audio visual mode but remember the exception which i had told you if you have got the quorum in the physical meeting if you have got the quorum in the physical meeting then you can give the access then you can give the access uh, to the non attending directors means the directors who are not attending physically you can give them the access and even they can even they can participate in that particular meeting right now listen generally generally what they say is generally what they say is this is a general point which has come up here actually it pertains to 173 subsection 3 that is about the notice okay that is about the notice that whenever whenever we give, we remember we gave the notice to all the directors under section 173 subsection 3 we gave the notice to all of them so along with the notice it is a good secretarial practice okay it would it, it would be a good secretarial practice if along with the notice we attach the agenda also agenda is nothing but the to do that what things are we going to discuss in this particular meeting if we circulate the agenda then there would be more cl clarity in the mind that yes actually the meeting is called for so and so so and so purposes and it would lead to a faster resolution in the meet right so that was the note which was written on the previous page which was talking about that agenda agenda should be accompanied agenda should be accompanied as a matter of good secretarial practice companies act does not make it mandatory huh? companies act does not make it mandatory that agenda should be given or not but it ideally it should be given we can say that way okay now we have certain examples we have certain examples on the things that we have just discussed you can just go through these two examples which are given up here and with this the most large section the most biggest section of the chapter has been done here now let's go to the next section let's go to the next section section number 174 174 talks about the quorum okay 174 talks about this is uh, comparatively a very small and a very simple section just try to understand here now here they are talking about the quorum for the board meeting what are they trying to tell us here normally for a company normally for a company quorum means what first of all quorum means the uh, minimum number of directors minimum number of directors who should be present in a meeting so as to make the meeting valid okay so that we can conduct the meeting for that particular purpose some minimum number of directors must be present 
ओके फॉर अ नॉर्मल कंपनी फॉर अ नॉर्मल कंपनी फॉर अ नॉर्मल कंपनी द कोरम वुड बी वन थर्ड ऑफ द टोटल नंबर ऑफ डायरेक्टर्स और टू डायरेक्टर्स विच एवर इज हायर ओके वन थर्ड और टू विच एवर इज हायर दिस इज द टोटल नंबर ऑफ दिस इज द एक्चुअली दिस इज द मिनिमम कोरम दैट इज रिक्वायर्ड फॉर दिस पर्टिकुलर बोर्ड मीटिंग सपोज इफ वाइल डूइंग वन थर्ड सपोज इफ वाइल डूइंग वन थर्ड और टू विच एवर इज हायर इफ यू गेट अ नंबर इन डेसिमल ओके इफ यू गेट अ डेसिमल देन इन दैट केस यू हैव टू राउंड इट ऑफ ऑन द हायर साइड एज ऑलवेज right and in case of section 8 companies in case of non defaulting section 8 companies at least 8 directors at least 8 directors or 25% of the total number of directors whichever is lower 8 or 25% of the total number of directors whichever is lower with at least two directors present in the meeting okay this is your minimum quorum which should be there okay this is the minimum quorum which should be there now while calculating this one third or while calculating the 25% in case of section 8 companies you have to make sure that you are not taking the places of the directors uh, or the position of the directors whose place is vacant okay if the place is vacant then there is no one sitting there then you don't have to consider those places of the directors okay suppose if you are calculating one third of the total directors means total directors means the total directors who are there in the company not the directors whose place is vacant we are not going to consider that right this is one particular point now they are telling that now they are telling that say for example say for example if say for example if the number of directors have fallen below right if the number of directors are less if the number of directors are less then what are they telling what are they telling us here what are they telling us here that the rest number of directors or the rest of the directors say for example if it's a public company okay if it's a public company we have already studied this in 149 subsection 1 that in a public company there should be at least three directors right minimum three directors should be there in a public company suppose if at any point of time due to some reasons the number of direct minimum directors has fallen to uh, fall into two instead of three right the minimum was three but it has fallen to two then in that case the remaining directors that is these two directors they are not supposed to vacate their office okay they have to make sure that they increase the minimum number of directors that is since now there are two of them they have to make sure that they appoint some more directors so that the provisions of the law are fulfilled right so they can continue in the company even though they are less even though they are less uh, if you compare it with 149 one uh, numbers but they have to continue in the company so and they have to appoint more number of directors so that the law is fulfilled either they can appoint an additional director as per section number 161 sub section 1 they can appoint an additional director or maybe they can conduct they can call for a general meeting maybe they can call for a general meeting and they can appoint a new face new face under section 160 right so basically even if the number this was just a clarification that even if the number falls below the minimum number of directors then the remaining number of directors will continue in the company okay it's not that they have to vacate their office it's not that they have to vacate their office they will continue in the company and they will appoint the other number of directors there okay now listen what are they trying to tell us here we have got another subsection coming up here section 174 174 sub section 3 174 sub section 3 where they say that if in a company if in a company if in the total number of directors if more than or equal to 2/3 of the total directors okay at least 2/3 of the total directors if at least 2/3 of the total directors are interested directors means most of them are interested directors then they are telling that okay no problem you need not follow the quorum of 174/1 but you can follow the new quorum as given under section 174 Three. Okay, if most of them are interested one, then they are telling that quorum for this particular board meeting will be the rest. That is the non-interested directors, and out of that also, at least two of them should be present in the meeting. Okay, so say for example, say for example, if out of fifteen, okay, if out of fifteen, say for example, if eleven directors are interested, okay, if eleven directors are interested, means can I say at least two third of them are interested? So the core for quorum for quorum, the rest four non-interested directors. Okay, if all four of them are present, then yes, the quorum is fulfilled. Or if all four of them are not present, but at least two of them are present, then it will be assumed as if your quorum has been fulfilled. Okay, so can I say this acts as a proviso? Actually, this becomes as an exception to section number one seventy four subsection one. But uh, yes, they have not given it as an exception, but they have given it as a separate provision. Then. say for example if you are not able to call the board meeting because you have not got the quorum then no issues adjourn the board meeting to the next week same time same day same place etc and if that day if that adjourned day if that particular day is a national holiday okay if that particular day is a national holiday then it is going to go to the next succeeding day okay it is going to the it is going to go to the next succeeding day okay the meetings can be called on sundays no issues in that and one more clarification 
was there that original meetings can be called on national holidays there is no issue in that okay original meetings original meetings can <clears throat> original meetings can be called on national holidays there is no issue in that provided all the directors provided all the directors agree to this particular fact that they are okay with calling the meeting on the national holiday okay now listen say for example if it's a private company okay this is very very important say for example if it's a non defaulting private company non defaulting means means it has not done the default of 92 or section number 137 if there is a non defaulting private company then in such cases then in such cases the interested directors the interested directors can disclose their interest interested directors can disclose their interest and they can be counted for the purpose of quorum no issues in that right then again we have got again we have got a few exam we have got uh, one or two examples here as you can see a point and b point which talks about which talks about or which is going to discuss about the provisions of 174 only you can just go through it it was a illustration on quorum okay calculation of quorum so just me let just let me uh, uh, what do you say revise 174 one the numbers for you in section 174 one the quorum the quorum would be for normal company it would be one third of the total number of directors or two directors whichever is higher and in case of non defaulting section 8 company it would be either eight members or eight directors you can say or 25% of the total number of directors whichever is lower with at least two directors present in the meeting okay so that was the most important point in section number 170 Okay, now let's come to a few small small sections. Let's come to a few small small sections. Now coming on to the next section, that is section number one hundred and seventy-five. Section number one hundred and seventy-five. Section number one hundred and seventy-five talks about section number one seventy-five talks about passing of resolution by circulation. Here, 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 here. You do not call here. You do not call a board meeting, right? Here, you do not call a board meeting. What you do is what you do is. you uh, send the draft resolution and all the necessary attachments okay and all the necessary attachments you send all these things you send all these things to the directors at their uh, at their addresses okay the addresses that you have in your company you are going to send all these papers to the directors and you are going to ask them to vote on this particular matter means you are not calling a board meeting you are not doing anything by audio visual etc no this is not at all a board meeting but you are sending the draft resolution and you are sending the attachment papers uh, to all the directors at their addresses and you are requesting them to vote and send their uh, opinions to the company right this can be done this can be done by hand delivery again it can be done by post courier or by any electronic means that is by email etc it can be done the directors by sitting at home okay the directors by sitting at home they can give their opinion or they can give their vote on a particular matter means they need not go to the company the company need not call a board meeting etc no nothing is required okay but if at least one third of the directors okay if at least one third of the total directors if there is an objection if there is an objection that no this matter cannot be discussed by way of circulation this matter cannot be discussed by way of circulation then in that case then in that case we will have to call a meeting then in that case we will have to call a physical board meeting or a audio visual board meeting and accordingly and accordingly and accordingly we will have to discuss that particular matter matter okay and accordingly we will have to discuss that particular matter if if at least how many of them raise an objection if at least one third of them if at least one third of them raise an objection that no this matter cannot be discussed by way of circulation if this matter cannot be discussed by way of circulation then we are going to call this particular board meeting no issues in that and suppose suppose if positively suppose if positively it if it was done by way of circulation suppose if positively if it was done by way of circulation then we are going to record then we are going to record this particular matter in the next board meeting minutes right so for this for this particular for this particular matter for this particular matter for this particular uh, matter since there was no board meeting held since there was no board meeting held so in the next in the next board meetings minute we are going to record this particular matter which was discussed by way of circulation okay which was discussed by way of circulation okay now see listen say for example if normally if say for example normally uh you conducted a particular board meeting okay you called for a particular board meeting but you did not get the quorum okay uh and just relating it to section number 174 suppose if you called a particular board meeting under section 174 and that meeting could not be held that meeting could not be held by way, because of because of lack of quorum then you adjourn the meeting right then you adjourn the meeting then that meeting will be counted as one meeting only okay the original meeting since it was not at all conducted so it cannot be called as a board meeting even though you wanted to conduct it 
so the adjourned one so the adjourned one will be called as the first meeting okay so original meeting and the adjourned meeting together together will be called as one meeting only okay and resolution by circulation resolution by circulation that is section number 175 the resolution that we are or the matter that we are discussing by way of resolution by circulation this particular this is not called as a board meeting at all okay this is not called as a board meeting at all because here you are not giving any notice you are not calling any board meeting you are not doing anything by audio visual mode etc so no this will not be counted as a board meeting and indirectly indirectly the directors are not going to get any sitting fees for this also right the directors are not going to get any sitting fees for this also right going on to the next going on to the next section section number 176 where they say that say for example any particular director say for example if any particular director was appointed in the company and later on later on we uh, we noticed some defect okay later on if we notice some defect in his appointment later on if we notice any defect in his appointment then the act which that particular director had done till the day we came to know about the defect till that day okay everything is okay no issues in that all those acts will be treated as valid but if but if but if suppose uh, later on also if that director is continuing then all his acts will be treated as invalid okay so the acts will be valid till which date the acts will be valid till the day we come to know till the day we come to know about his defects okay later on also if he is acting in the company and still he is doing some acts then that won't be treated as valid okay we have got an example on that you can just uh, read it once we have tried we have tried that for every section for every section we incorporate an example for every important section we incorporate an example so that you can just go through the example and the concepts will be uh, crystal clear for you going on to the next section going on to the next section that is section number that is section number 177 okay going on to the next section that is section number 177 which talks about the audit committee then we are going to study about vigil mechanism in this then we are going to go to section 178 which is also going to talk about the committees that is the nrc nomination and remuneration committee and stakeholders relationship committee right so now first of all first of all section number 177 section 177 which talks about section 177 which talks about the audit committee first of all let's try to understand which companies are required to constitute audit committee so this is nothing new for us okay this is nothing new for us 177 is nothing new for us the companies which were required to appoint the companies which were required to appoint an independent director as per section 149 subsection 4 okay the companies which were required to appoint uh independent directors as per section 149 subsection 4 the same companies are required to constitute an audit committee that is a listed public company every listed public company that it it needs to have an audit committee and every other uh, class of public uh, every other class of public companies which were given in rule 4 that is paid up share capital of at least rupees having paid up share capital of at least rupees 10 crore or turnover of at least rupees 100 crore or total loans outstanding deposits of more than rupees 50 crore if any one of these conditions have been fulfilled then in that case the company is required to have an audit committee in this unlisted companies joint uh, your joint venture your dominant company and the wholly owned subsidiary these companies are not at all included okay so basically the companies which were required to appoint an independent director same companies are also required to constitute an audit committee audit committee is going to have minimum three directors audit committee is going to have minimum three directors where independent director is going to form a majority okay where independent director is going to form a majority and we have to make sure we have to make sure we have to make sure that majority of the members okay majority of the members of the audit committee plus its chairperson plus the chairperson of the audit committee they should have the ability they should have the ability to read and understand the financial statements okay this is the basic this is the basic requirement which is given for section number 177 then then there we, uh, there we had certain we had certain responsibilities of the audit committee which you would have already studied which you would have already studied in your audit that is uh, about considering the financial statements recommending the appointment of an auditor ratifying the related party transactions etc these are these are some of the responsibilities these are some of the responsibilities of the audit committee plus in the audit committee meetings plus in the audit committee meetings uh, see basically in the audit committee meetings the directors would be there majority of whom would be the independent directors they would be there 
even the auditors and the KMPs, even the auditors and the KMPs would be allowed to attend the audit committee meeting. They won't have any right to vote. Okay, they won't have any right to vote, but yes, they can come to the meeting. They have a right to be heard. Suppose if, say, for example, if in this particular meeting we are going to adopt the financial statement, then in that case, obviously, the auditor should be given an opportunity to to uh, opportunity of being heard, right? basically he has an he has a right he has a right to say something he does not have the right to vote but he has the right to say something okay just try to understand that just try to understand and last thing last thing is in the board's report in the board's report we are going to write we are going to mention about the audit committee that our company has an audit committee so and so people so and so directors are sitting in the audit committee basically we are going to give the composition basically we are going to give the composition of the audit committee and suppose if suppose if the audit committee gives any recommendation and the board hasn't accepted it audit committee has given a recommendation but the board hasn't accepted it even that has to be disclosed in the board's report this you would have studied in section number 139 which talks about your appointment of auditors then the last part, last part here, the last part here is about the vigil mechanism. Okay, the last part here is about the vigil mechanism. Vigil mechanism, vigil mechanism was nothing but a, a safeguard measure. Okay, it was nothing but a safeguard measure which allows the directors, which allows the employees to file some genuine complaints. Okay, when they come to know something about a defaulting person in the company, if they come to know about that, then the directors and the employees have got the direct access that they can go and file a complaint with the chairperson of the audit committee they can directly go and report it they can directly go and report it to the chairperson of the audit committee ma'am why directly the chairperson of the audit committee because 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 this audit committee because this audit committee con contains that majority of them majority of them are independent directors so the chances of getting the problem solved is very very high right so the directors and the employees etc they have got the powers here they have got the powers here that they have they can directly uh, they have a direct uh, access they, they have a direct access that they can go and that they can go and file the complaint with the chairperson of the audit committee okay now certain companies certain companies this vigil mechanism is also not applicable to each and every company but it is applicable to certain companies that is every every listed company first of all it is applicable to every listed company every listed company needs to have a vigil mechanism or any other company any other company which has either accepted deposit from the public or it has taken a loan or it or it has taken a loan or it has borrowed money from the banks and the pfi of more than of more than uh, rupees 50 crores okay if any one of these two conditions are fulfilled that is it, if it has taken public deposits or if its borrowing is more than rupees 50 crore then such companies are required to then such companies are required to establish a vigil mechanism okay it can so happen it can so happen that these companies are actually not having an independent director okay suppose if these companies are not having an independent director then in that case then in that case the board of directors is going to uh, assign this job to a particular person okay the board of directors are going to assign this job to a particular person who is going to act like a, uh, who is going to act uh, like an independent director or who is going to act as an audit committee see if it is such a company if it is such a company which is not required to appoint independent director then can i say it is also the same company which is not required to constitute an audit committee but vigil mechanism is mandatory for that then in such cases then in such cases the board of directors is going to assign one particular person that now you are going to act as an audit committee and you can uh, accept the complaints under vigil mechanism from the directors and the employees okay the company which has an audit committee the company which has an audit committee there there is no problem because we will be actually having an audit committee but the company which does not have an audit committee then we are going to assign this job to a particular person that you will play the role of an audit committee for the purpose of vigil mechanism okay now suppose if he is doing any complaints for time pass that is frivolous complaints then we are going to take action against that particular director employee etc and that our company has vigil mechanism that our company has vigil mechanism this will be this will be disclosed on the website of the company plus this will be mentioned in the board's report also otherwise how will the directors even come to know that we have this option of going and filing this complaint so this will be written on the this will be mentioned on the website also and plus plus this will be written in the board's report also okay going on to the next one going on to the next one which talks about your uh, SR, NRC and the SRC first of all again again here again here first of all you can do a correction in the book here instead of audit committee instead of audit committee it would be NRC okay it would be NRC so the same company so the same companies are required same companies are required the companies which were there in 149.4 the companies which were there in section number 177 same companies are required to constitute this NRC also 
in this particular nrc the composition goes like this you should be having at least three non executive directors okay you should be having at least three non executive directors with independent directors forming majority okay the chairperson of the company the chairperson of the company can be a member in the nrc but he cannot be the chairperson of the nrc okay they have just tried to establish the independence here the person who is the chairperson of the company okay he can come and sit in the nrc no issues in that but he cannot be the chairperson of the nrc as well right now what is the work of this particular nrc what is the work of this particular nrc nrc is going to recommend the remuneration it is going to identify who is the proper person as a director who is the proper person for our company it is going to evaluate its performance and how is that particular person performing he will he will evaluate he will evaluate how much remuneration he will evaluate he will evaluate how much remuneration should be paid against the performance that he is giving to the company right uh, is he responsible for the acts that he has done how much uh, what should be the composition of his pay that how much should be fixed how much should be uh, variable right it should not happen that there is a vast difference between his uh work done and the remuneration it should not happen happen that he is doing too less work and is paid something very high or even vice versa thing should not happen all these things have to be taken care of by the nrc itself okay everything about uh, about the appointment of directors everything about the remuneration of the directors everything about the uh, removal of directors etc if any of the provisions are attracted then that has to be made sure by the nrc that what is the next step to be taken now and whatever is the policy of the company in regards to remuneration or in regards to appointment that has to be placed on the company's website mandatorily or it has to be placed in and it has to be placed in the board's report also okay about the nrc uh, about the nrc about the remuneration policy etc either it should be first of all it should be placed on the website and what you can do is that web link that web link can be placed in the board's report also then going on to the next one which talks about your src src is very very simple basically if there is any company if there is any company which has more than 1000 security holders at any point of time okay any company is there which is having more than 1000 uh, security holders huh? i am not telling stakeholders even though the src full form is even though the src full form is a uh, stakeholders relationship committee but this applicability will be there if the company has more than 1000 security holders in the company then in that case security holders means your shareholders your debenture holders your preference shareholders your deposit holders etc if you have more than 1000 if you have more than 1000 then you have to constitute this stakeholders relationship committee and and in this stakeholders relationship committee the main purpose the main purpose of this particular committee will be to address the grievances right to address the grievances of all the security holders the exact composition of the src has not been prescribed by the law but they say that but they say that it is going to have the non executive directors and out of these non executive director uh, this uh, no, one of the non executive director is going to act as the chairperson of this src if the src is not able to solve the queries in good faith if the src is not able to solve the queries in good faith then in that case it is not treated as a contravention okay it won't be treated as if the uh, audit uh, it won't be treated as if the src does not want to solve the grievances no if it proves that we tried hard to solve this particular problem but we were not able to do it then that's okay then src uh, then src will not be held guilty of not solving a particular grievance right this was this was a particular part of the chapter this was a particular part of the chapter now going on to the next part altogether going on to the next part which talks about section number 179 okay section number 179 179 which talks about the powers of the board okay 179 which talks about the powers of the board now just try to understand just try to understand first of all here they have first of all told us they have just given us a background that they have just given us a background that whatever things whatever things the company is required to do okay whatever things the company is required to do normally if you are a company then what all things should be done by the company all those things are actually exercised by the board only right all those things are exercised by the board only because board is the custodian right board takes care of the company board are the we can say board are the agents who act on behalf of the company so board acts as an agent board acts as a custodian right now suppose if suppose if suppose if some particular matter some particular matter was treated as invalid okay suppose if a particular matter was treated as invalid suppose if a particular matter was treated as invalid in a particular board meeting which was valid otherwise earlier okay this particular thing was valid earlier but now in this particular board meeting we have uh, told that okay from this particular board meeting uh, there is going to be a restriction say for example then they are trying to tell us here that here 
whatever decisions you have taken in the meeting that will have a prospective effect and that is not going to have a retrospective effect example if you have decided in a board meeting if you have decided in today's board meeting that so and so matter henceforth so and so matter henceforth will be discussed by way of physical uh, uh, meeting only then if in past if you have discussed if you have not discussed it by physical mode then also the past thing is not going to get affected whatever decision you are taking in a meeting whatever decision you are taking in a meeting that is going to have a prospective effect and not a retrospective effect right similarly now they have given you some matters okay they have listed a few matters they have listed a few matters that these matters these matters have to be discussed by the board first of all these matters have to be discussed by the board and that too that too by uh that to by convening a board meeting okay means you have to call a board meeting means you have to call a board meeting and then only you can discuss these particular matters and resolution by circulation resolution by circulation in these matters won't be allowed because as i had mentioned earlier also resolution by circulation resolution by circulation is not a board meeting right resolution by circulation is not a board meeting there the directors only sit at home and they vote so it is not a board meeting so some matters some matters have been some matters have been given in the section number 179 for which they are telling that you have to properly call a board meeting and in those meeting only those matters will be considered okay some examples are there some examples are there like some examples are there like whenever the company wants to uh, give any loans whenever the company wants to take any loans whenever the company wants to do any investments etc okay whenever the company wants to buy back the shares whenever the company wants to take the approval for amalgamation merger etc whenever the company wants to get the fs or the board report approved whenever the company wants to do the uh, call call for uh, this calls in arrears etc at all these cases and some more points are written here obviously obviously political party contributions etc are there then um, appointing or removing any kmp is there for these matters for these matters these matters cannot be dealt by way of uh, uh, your resolution by circulation for these matters you have to compulsorily you have to compulsorily call a board meeting okay you have to compulsorily call a board meeting and by calling a board meeting only you can discuss about those particular matters okay then three specific points three specific points three specific points that is uh, giving loan taking loan or doing investments etc for these three matters you can delegate the work okay the board the board can delegate this work either to i uh, it can delegate to any four of them it can either delegate it to a committee of directors or it can delegate it to the managing director of the company it can delegate it to the manager of the company or it can delegate it to any other principal officer any other principal officer either of the company or principal officer of the branch okay specifically point number def that was written here def that is taking loan giving loan or uh doing some investments etc these matters uh, discussion for these particular matters these can be delegated by the board of directors to any of those people okay now listen say for example taking loan giving loan or taking deposits giving loans etc if this is done by a banking company if it is done by a banking company then in that case uh, no such board resolution is required for that because these are done in ordinary course of business similarly similarly if suppose any particular bank has taken a loan from rbi banks also take loan from rbi right if that is taken uh, something something like that has been taken from the rbi etc then even that is deemed to be done in the ordinary course of business and since it is uh, assumed to be done in ordinary course of business then no resolution would be required for that okay now suppose if there is any transaction suppose if there is any transaction between me and the bank okay suppose if there is any transaction between my company and the bank and if that is done and if uh, that particular transaction pertains to temporary that is your regular day to day overdraft or cc facility etc then for that also for that also even though even though it is a liability for us even though it is a liability for us but for that the board resolution is not required because again again this is a very short term finance which is done in ordinary course of business so od or cc which are done for your day to day operations etc for that also we do not require any approval by way of board meetings etc right otherwise otherwise you, you won't be ever able to do the business if for every such petty matter if you go and take the approval of the board you won't be able to do the business at all okay now one one important note that they have told us here one important note that they have told us here that is that is say for example if in a particular company we know that these matters we know that these matters are to be discussed we know that these matters are to be discussed by way of board meeting okay duly convened board meeting these matters have to be discussed so the decisions etc have to be primarily taken by the board 
right the decisions have to be primarily taken by the board the shareholders cannot interfere in the day to day activities okay so now just imagine if you are having shares of a particular company practically you would be having shares of a particular company can you interfere in the day to day operations do they allow you to interfere in the day to day operations the answer is no right so the shareholders do not have any right to interfere in the day to day operations except except when you know when the director when there is a deadlock in the management when the directors are acting in a fraudulent manner etc only in such cases the shareholders can interfere generally that also is not allowed because a tribunal takes the charge of it etc but uh, otherwise otherwise the interference is allowed but 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 when the company is going on normally okay when the company is going on normally then boss no shareholders do not have any right okay only when we ask them to vote they are supposed to vote okay they are going to get their returns if decided by the company and whenever we ask them to vote on a particular matter they can vote otherwise they cannot interfere in any day to day decisions which have been taken by the board then uh, this was this was section number 179 which is talking about the powers of the board that is for the listed pointers okay that is for the listed pointers the company has to call the company has to call for a proper board meeting and only in the board meeting only in the board meeting those matters will be discussed upon right now going on to the next section now going on to the next section that is the opposite section section number 180 section number 180 which talks about the restrictions on the powers of the board restrictions on the powers of the board means basically they have given four points here okay in one section 180 subsection 1 clause a b c d are there clause a b c d are there where they are telling where they are telling us that that for these particular four matters even though board approval is required earlier but after that you have to get it approved from the shareholders after that you have to get it approved from the shareholders by way of a special resolution by way of a special resolution as it is written here okay you have to get it approved from the shareholders by way of a special resolution ma'am what are those four matters for which special resolution is mandatorily required so just listen to me just listen to me the first point the first point is whenever the company is trying to sell off lease off or dispose of the whole or substantially the whole of the undertaking right we had discussed about in our regular lectures we have discussed about this particular undertaking term so whenever you are selling off leasing off disposing of your undertaking of the company then in that case then in such cases in such cases what happens you know first we uh, conduct a board meeting we take the approval in case of in uh, in the board meeting and then we present the matter before the shareholders and then we take their special resolution then only this particular matter is finalized okay then going on to the next one if you are investing if you are investing the purchase consideration otherwise than in uh, trust security otherwise than in trust securities okay ideally you have to invest it in trust securities only if you are investing it in other than trust securities then you have to take the approval of the shareholders by way of sr okay third third clause c clause is very very important which says that whenever you are taking any loan okay you are taking you are taking whenever you are taking any loan then in such cases then in such cases the amount that you have already borrowed plus the amount that you are going to borrow amount already borrowed plus the amount to be borrowed if that exceeds the paid up share capital plus free reserves plus the securities premium plus the securities premium then in that case if this limit is exceeded if this limit is exceeded then in that case then in that case Uh, uh whenever the borrowings are exceeded then we have to take the approval from the shareholders by way of special resolution okay we have to pass a special resolution in the special resolution the shareholders are going to write that up to this amount now they can take the loan without any further approval okay but for that first thing that they have to do for that the first thing that they have to do is they have to pass a special resolution and while calculating these limits that is money to be borrowed money already borrowed etc we are going to exclude we are going to exclude the temporary loans we are going to exclude the temporary loans which have been uh, obtained from the banks okay we are going to exclude the temporary loans which have been obtained from the banks in ordinary course of business that will be excluded ma'am what do you mean by temporary loans temporary loans here is which are repayable which are repayable within a period of 6 months and which is not for a capital nature expenditure okay which is not for a capital expenditure if it is a capital if it is for a capital expenditure it is no more temporary okay if that loan is for capital expenditure it is no more a temporary loan right then after that after that going on to the next one after that going on to the next one the last clause the last clause the last clause says that the last clause says that uh if if the company wants to give some more time if the company wants to give some more time to the director for repayment okay if the company wants to give some more time to the director for repayment of his dues for repayment of his debt etc then in such cases then in such cases uh, we have to pass a special resolution otherwise the board among itself only it is along allowing uh, it is giving more time to any director for repayment of his 
loan so no so the directors cannot do that for this you have to go to the shareholders and we have to pass a special resolution okay so just to revise it once again just to revise it once again four pointers are there four pointers are there here first of all first of all to sell lease dispose of any of the undertaking a uh, whole or part of the undertaking etc second point second point was second point was talking about to invest otherwise than in trust securities the compensation that you had received at the time of amalgamation then where the money already borrowed plus the money to be borrowed if that exceeds pusc plus sp or plus the fr Right, that is securities premium plus the free reserve. Then in that case, we have to go to the uh, shareholders and get the SR passed. And the last one, if you want to give more time for loan repayment to the directors, then for that also we have to go and pass the special resolution. Right now, say for example, say for example, if suppose uh, if we have sold our undertaking, okay, if we have sold our whole or part of the undertaking, and we did not pass a special resolution. Okay, then they say that the buyer who has bought this particular undertaking, if he has done this in good faith, if he was not aware about all these things, then in that case he is going to get a clear title to it. Okay, he is going to get a clear title to it, right? Similarly, similarly they are telling one more thing. Similarly, they are telling one more thing for that loan point. That is for the C clause. That is for the C clause. They are trying to tell us here that. Uh, if suppose if suppose the bank has lent some amount if suppose the lender has lent some amount to this particular company and the sr was not passed that is the limits were exceeded but the sr was not passed then in that case then in that case if the lender proves that he was not aware about it etc if he says that no 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 i missed it it was done in good faith etc then in that case okay no issues but if it is not proved then in ca that case the debt will not be treated as valid Okay, the debt will not be treated as valid means the lender will not be able to recover the money from us. Okay, if it is in good faith, no issues in that, no problem in that. All right, these were these were some of the pointers. These were some of the pointers which are applicable to Section 180, but Section 180 is not applicable to a non-defaulting private company. That is for these matters also. For these matters also, they need not take a special resolution. Okay, they need not pass a special resolution. Now. These were the pointers here. They have given you some explanation about the undertaking, substantially the whole of the undertaking, etc. All these things have been given up there. And the uh, numerical example, the numerical example has been given up here so that you can just try. This is for that clause C, where the amount to be borrowed plus the amount already borrowed. This is for that point C. So 179, 179 was such a case where you have to take the approval from the board. Okay, whenever you have to uh, discuss on certain matters, you have to take the approval from the board. That was your section number 179. Section number 180. Section number 180 says that. Section number 180 says that for these particular matters, for these particular four matters, the powers is not solely with the board, but for that we have to pass a special resolution and then only you can enter into those type of transaction. And in that also, please specifically remember, specifically remember clause C. Okay, that is a question, that is a, you know, sub, uh, that is a clause basically which gets tested each and every time okay or we can say uh, quite often that particular uh, concept gets tested now going on to the next three concepts now going on to the next three concepts we are nearing the end slowly and steadily we are nearing the end don't worry now uh, there are three sections section number 181 section number 182 and section number 183 all the three sections are going to talk about the contributions okay all the three sections are going to talk about the contributions section number 181 first of all talks about contribution to charitable funds or contribution to bona fide funds genuine funds etc so can the company the question arises here is can the company do the contributions so ma'am obviously now the company can do the contributions the company can do the donations yes it can do but in that case in that case there should be an authorization from the board right so the powers vest the powers vest with whom the powers vest with the board of directors the board of directors have the option the board of directors have the option that whether they want to do this contribution or not okay if they want to do exceeding a certain limit okay if they want to do exceeding a certain limit that is if the aggregate amount if the aggregate amount of donation exceeds the average net profit for the last five percent of the average net profits of the last three years okay if the amount of con uh, donation during the current year if that exceeds five percent of the average net profits of the last three years then in that case you're crossing a particular limit okay and if you're crossing a particular limit no issues you can cross okay no issues you can cross but one thing is important here is then you'll have to take the approval of the shareholders in the general meeting 
if you want to do within the limits if you want to do within the limits no issues why why any issues then in that case only board authorization is required but if you want to contribute more than the limits then first the board approval will be required and then the shareholders approval in the uh, general meeting would be required okay we had a question we had an example on that you can just go through that particular example which is going to talk about section number 181 similarly for section number 182 section 182 182 talks about contribution to the political parties okay now any company any company can do contribution to the political parties except for two companies okay except for two companies except for which two companies first of all a government company is totally excluded from there that is that is that that is that is that is a government company cannot do contributions political party contributions and second one any company which has been into existence for less than 3 years means comparatively can we say this is a new company which has been into existence for less than 3 years means it is a new company so this government company and this new company are not allowed to do this political party contributions okay otherwise any other company any other company can do this particular uh, political party contributions but only after passing a board resolution okay if i am using the word board resolution means we'll have to duly convene a board meeting we'll have to duly convene a board meeting and we'll have to pass a resolution for that now the contribution can be to the political party the contribution can be to the electoral trust the contribution can be by way of uh advertisement in any newspaper pamphlet etc which is funded by a political party etc even that will be treated to be a political party contribution only and for that also section number 182 is only going to be applicable right now whenever you are doing any contribution to the political party you have to make you have to be sure that this figure is disclosed okay that this particular figure is disclosed in the pnl specifically that you have done the contribution to the political party but when it is electoral trust it is it is not necessarily uh, required that you have to show it as a separate line item maybe you can include it with along with any other expenses also right and this contribution this contribution has to be done this contribution has to be done by account pay check draft or ecs only that is cash bearer check etc these are not allowed okay and just remember one thing for section number 182 for section number 182 first of all there is no limit there is no limit and plus there is no requirement of any general meeting resolution okay there is no requirement of any general meeting resolution only there is no requirement of any general meeting resolution only board resolution only board resolution only board resolution would be required there okay like in uh, your charitable funds and uh, your uh, bona fide funds etc you required your board resolution you required the approval of the board and if the limit was exceeded then you required the uh, shareholders resolution right then you required the shareholders resolution but in case of 182 shareholders resolution is nowhere required going on to the next section going on to the next section that is section number 183 section 183 is talking about section 183 is talking about a uh, contribution to the national defense fund okay now here the powers the section is too wide okay the section is too wide which says that the powers is there with the board of directors the powers is there with the shareholders the powers is there with any other person in the company that they can authorize that they can authorize let's do contribution to the national defense fund okay either it can be done to the ndf or it can be done to any other fund where the money is going to be utilized for the national defense and there is no limit here okay there is no limit here there is no specific resolution required here you just have to disclose okay you just have to disclose in the pnl that so and so amount was contributed to the national defense fund so this was this was all about this was all about your section number 181 to section 183 which is talking about which is talking about your contributions about your different different type of contributions out of this out of this your 181 and 182 gets repeated quite often okay 181 that is your limit thing that 5% of the average net profit for the last 3 years that get repeated many a times okay that get repeated many a times and political party just remember one thing few years back somewhere in the year 2017 or 2018 we had an amendment in political parties and where there 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 they had removed this limit uh, earlier we had a limit that how much amount can be contributed to the political party now there is no limit whatever amount you want to contribute you can contribute absolutely there is no issues in that okay then going on to the next one going on to the next one that is section number 184 section number 184 talks about section number 184 talks about disclosure of interest mainly there are two subsections very very important here 184 subsection 1 184 subsection 2 184 sub subsection 1 talks about the general disclosure that is once a, a particular person is appointed as a director in the company once he comes in the company once he comes in the company we are going to see this later on 
that within 30 days of his appointment within 30 days of his appointment he has to disclose okay he has to disclose basically he has to write all his interested firms companies etc in a particular register okay we are going to study that later on we are going to study that in section number 189 that he has to record within 30 days in a register called as mbp4 he will record his interest wherever he is interested maybe he is interested in any other company maybe he is interested in any other firm maybe he is interested in any other association he is going to write about this interest in this particular register called as mbp4 first of all he going he is going to record it in the register and then again it has to be disclosed three times just like it was applicable for the independent directors that is at the first board meeting of the comp at his first board meeting every year's first board meeting and whenever there is any changes in the uh, disclosure then after that whatever is the first board meeting which is held in that he is going to disclose about his particular interest okay whenever he is disclosing it to the uh, directors or whenever he is disclosing it in the board meeting etc that will be done by mbp1 that will be done by mbp1 that will be done by mbp1 uh, achha, before that before that the one which I told you one which I told you that is MBP4 MBP4 in MBP4 we record about the specific disclosure which we are going to do which we are going to do now uh, and uh, for your general disclosure general disclosure was to be disclosed in form number MBP1 okay general disclosure means what general disclosure means what suppose if I am appointed as a director of Reliance say for example and if I am interested in some other company as a director maybe or if I am interested as a shareholder in another company or if I am as I am a partner in some partnership firm etc then in that case wherever wherever I am interested I am supposed to disclose that as per section number 184 subsection 1 that I have to disclose it as per section number 184 subsection 1 right this disclosure this I have to disclose it this I have to disclose it uh, in my particular company so that my company becomes aware about my interest in the other companies and whenever I disclose this to the company the company is going to maintain that the company is going to maintain it for a period of eight years okay the company is going to maintain this particular disclosure of mine for a period of eight years now once we have done the general disclosure then after that there comes something called a specific disclosure under section 184 subsection 2 okay then there's there comes something called a section number 184 subsection 2 which talks about the specific disclosure which says that say for example say for example i am a director say for example i am a director in a particular company okay i am a director in a particular company and i am a partner in some partnership firm for example and now the, my company and that partnership firm is entering into a transaction can i say i become interested in the company also and i become interested in that firm also therefore i become interested in this transaction also then in that case in the the board meeting where we are going to discuss about this transaction the board meeting where we are going to discuss about this particular transaction where there i am going to disclose there i am going to basically remind my company again that the com the firm with whom you are doing this transaction i am interested in that okay this specific disclosure will be done this specific disclosure will be done by the director in that particular board meeting whenever the matter is going to get disclosed and yes this 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 has to be uh, maintained in a register okay this has to be maintained in a register now say for example initially you were a non-interested director so your company entered into the contract with that particular firm imagine you were not interested in that firm your company normally entered into the transaction and then later on you became interested later on if you became interested then now now you have to disclose your interest and you cannot participate in that particular meeting anymore Right, then next one, ma'am, how do we become interested as per section number 184? When do we say that, you know, when do we say that we are interested in such other company or when when do we say that we are interested in that particular firm? Just try to understand here. Suppose if, suppose if you are a director in our company, okay, you are a director in your own company and later on if you are holding, if you are holding more than 2% of the shareholding, okay, if you are holding more than 2% of the shareholding in some other company, Okay, or if you are a promoter, manager or CEO of such other company, either you are, uh, either you are a shareholder of more than 2% of such other company or if you are the promoter, manager, CEO of such other company, then it will be deemed, then it will be deemed as if you are interested in such other company. Okay, or say for example, if you are a partner, if you are a partner or if you are a owner or if you are a member of such other entity, say for example if you are a partner in a in a partnership firm if you are a owner of a proprietorship concern if you are a member of a aopbi etc then in that case it will be deemed that you are interested in that particular entity 
right so these are the parameters to determine these are the parameters to determine whether we are interested or not and depending upon that depending upon that we are going to depending upon that we are going to give the disclosure that is your general disclosure under section 1841 and specific disclosure under section 184 subsection 2 okay now just try to understand just try to understand here just try to understand here say for example say for example suppose if you have entered into the transaction okay your company has entered into the transaction without without you giving the general disclosure or without you giving the uh, specific disclosure etc then in that case then in that case the contract does not become void immediately the contract becomes voidable okay the contract becomes voidable means this is now voidable at the option of the shareholders means if the shareholders want they can ratify this particular contract okay they can ratify this particular contract but that interested director cannot back off the shareholders can decide whether to enter or not to enter but that particular interested director who did not give the specific disclosure that particular director cannot back off now okay he cannot take a step back now okay now listen one explanation that they are giving us here one explanation that they are giving us here is section number 184 section number 184 section number 184 is not a restricting section it does not say that you cannot have interest in any other company you cannot have interest in any other firm no it does not say like that it just says that this is a procedural section that if you are interested in any other company or any other entity etc just give a disclosure we are not putting a restriction on you that you cannot be interested in any other company right then this exception we had studied earlier itself that in case of a private company even the interested directors can participate even the interested directors can participate after giving their disclosure okay after they say that yes they are interested after they disclose that yes they are interested they will be counted for the purpose of quorum and plus plus they will be considered they will be considered and they can vote in that particular meeting this was this was your section number 184 just remember two subsections here first one is your general disclosure and the second one is your specific disclosure just remember general disclosure arises generally if you are a director in the company and where at which all places do you have interest you just have to disclose that okay and 184 2 talks about 184 2 talks about the specific disclosure that if your, your company is entering into any transaction with your interested party then in that case you'll have to disclose your interest right going on to the next one that is section number 185 which is very very simple as well as very very important 185 is main is uh, applicable is ideally not applicable to a private company if it is a specific private company rest rest all the companies rest uh, your major public companies rest major public companies yes it is definitely applicable so now just understand let's understand the provisions exceptions are given at the end of the section no issues in that first of all they are telling uh, 185 subsection 1 first of all it is telling that a particular company cannot give loan to whom okay a company cannot give loan a company cannot give loan a company cannot give guarantee a company cannot give security to whom it cannot give it to the directors of the company it cannot give it to the directors of our group company and it cannot give to their partners relatives etc not allowed means it can be it cannot be given to directors it cannot be given uh, uh, it cannot be given to the directors it cannot be given to the directors of the group company your group in group company only the holding company comes your only the holding company comes so it cannot be given to the director of our company it cannot be given to the director of our holding company it cannot be given to their partners to their relatives etc no it is not at all allowed okay and one more thing one more thing is it cannot be given to any firm okay here it was individuals then it cannot be given to any particular firm in which these directors or their relatives are a partner okay these directors the directors which we had studied on the left hand side these directors or their relatives are partners so we cannot give to such firm also so basically they are telling us here is it cannot be given to the directors or their relatives and it cannot be given to the partnership firm also where these directors are partners or the directors relatives are partner it cannot be given to such firm also so the subsection one so the subsection one was basically talking about the restriction only okay subsection one was basically talking about the restriction only that the loan cannot be given cannot be given cannot be given now going on to the next subsection which says that okay no problem give the loan to the corporates okay give the loan to the corporates inter just to facilitate intercorporate loan they had made this amendment in the year 2018 that any company in which our director is interested okay any company in which our director company uh, any company in which our director is interested you can give them the loan ma'am how do we identify whether the director is interested in a company or not for that there are three parameters 
ओके इफ देर इज अ प्राइवेट कंपनी इफ देर इज अ प्राइवेट कंपनी इन विच आर कंपनी इज डिरेक्टर इज ऑल्सो अ डिरेक्टर देर और आर कंपनी डिरेक्टर इज अ मेंबर देर देन वी कैन गिव लोन टू सच प्राइवेट कंपनी ओके ऑल्टरनेटिवली इफ देर इज एनी अदर बॉडी कॉर्पोरेट वेर आर डिरेक्टर्स आर हैविंग एटलीस्ट ट्वेंटी फाइव परसेंट ऑफ द वोटिंग पावर then can i say we are some some of way or the other we can see that we are controlling that particular company uh, to some extent at least since we are holding at least 25% of the voting power which is not less right and the last one if there is any such company where the where that company acts, acts as per our directions where the company's md manager board etc acts as per the directions given by our company then to such company that is that private company that body corporate where our directors have at least 25% of the voting powers and such other company which is working on our directions which is working on our directions right we can give loan to them no issues in that provided two conditions compulsory two conditions to be fulfilled first of all first of all you have to pass a special resolution plus you have to attach an explanatory statement to the notice of this particular meeting that why do you want to give them the loan and the next when the loan must be given only for the principal business activities okay the loan must be given plus the loan must be utilized only for the principal business activities otherwise it is not at all allowed okay then they are telling that what about the loan given what about the loan given to mdwtd no problem you can give as per the service conditions you can give as per the service conditions of, of them with the company if there is nothing written in the service condition then you can uh, take the approval of the shareholders by way of special resolution you can take the approval of the shareholders by way of a special resolution and then you can give the loan to the md wtd etc no issues in that okay whenever you are giving loans in ordinary course of business then you can give loan to any particular person okay any person who is there in the company any person who is related to the company you can give loan to them also because this is your ordinary course of business the only thing that you have to keep in mind is the interest rate the minimum interest rate that you have to charge that should be minimum that should be the minimum yield on the government securities the yield that you are getting on the government securities as per the tenure of the loan and tenure of the securities etc then loan can be given by loan can be given or guarantee can be given by company to its wholly owned subsidiary company no issues in that right the loan can be given by the holding company by the holding company to its wholly owned subsidiary no issues in that guarantee security can be given by the holding company to its wholly owned subsidiary no issues in that okay guarantee can be given by holding company to any subsidiary company but 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 for giving loan for giving loan for giving loan exception is not there for giving loan by holding company to its other subsidiary it does not come in the exception here it does not come in the exception here right it does not come in the exception here means can i say can i say it falls under section 185 sub section 2 that is because subsidiary will be controlled by us subsidiary will be controlled by us so can i say it falls under this point that is any company which is which works as per our directions we can take it under this particular point so if you want to give loan to any other subsidiary that is other than your wholly owned subsidiary then you'll have to pass sr plus it should be for principal business activities mandatory right so these were these were the most important pointers these were the most important pointers in the section first sub section said that loan given to so and so person is not allowed that is to the directors to the relatives of the directors partners of the directors or to the partnership firm right to them you cannot give the loan sub section 2 said that okay you can give inter corporate loans to the interested companies no issues in that but pass sr then they told that then they told that you can give loan to mdwtd if your ordinary business is giving loan you can give normal loans okay you can give loan to your wholly owned subsidiary you can give guarantee to your wholly owned subsidiary you can give guarantee to any other subsidiary right these were the pointers that we learned in sub section 3 there now your the exception exception of the private company is very very important exception of the private company is very very important that this particular section will not be applicable to the private company if it is such a private company where none of the shares are held by a body corporate okay there is no share, there is no body corporate or there is no company shareholder in the private company okay they have not invested any money in this particular private company then their outside borrowings their outside borrowings is less than twice of the paid up share capital or rupees 50 crore whichever is lower and such company should not have done any default in respect of the borrowings okay this company should not have done any default in respect of repayment of the borrowings or in uh, respect of repayment of of payment of interest etc no default should be there right then in that case then in that case this particular private company then in that case this particular private company will be totally exempted from the purview of section number 185 Okay, specifically subsection one, uh, subsection one and subsection two are very very important. 
okay subsection 1 subsection 1 which talks about the prohibitions and subsection 2 which says okay no problem pass the sr pass the sr and give the loan going on to the next one that is section number 186 section number 186 talks about the loans and investments okay first first subsection says that whenever a company wants to do investment it can do the investment through maximum two layers of investment companies okay maximum two layers of investment company we have taken examples on this in the uh, in our regular batch maximum two layers of companies are allowed more than two layers more than two layers are not allowed except except in two cases that is uh, one is uh, your foreign company and the second one is when it is allowed when it is to be done as per any uh, law regulation rules regulations etc if that is allowed then no issues in that basically why such restriction why only two layers of investment companies because they want to prohibit this diversion of funds they do not want the money to get spread in too many companies and that's the reason they have put this particular uh, restriction okay so now whenever whenever you want to you know give any loan whenever you want to give any guarantee whenever you want to give any security to any person except for the person who is in employment of the company okay employees are totally different they do not come in this particular limit always remember always remember employees never come in this particular limit whenever you want to give any loan guarantee security etc to any particular person exceeding a limit exceeding a limit exceeding a limit ma'am what's the limit the limit is 60%. The limit is 60% of paid up share capital plus FR plus the SP or 100% of the reserves. 100% of the reserves means 100% of the free reserves plus the securities premium. If you want to give more than this amount, if you want to give more than this amount, then you will have to pass a special resolution. If you want to, if your total loans, investment guarantees, here we are talking about the asset side loan. Huh? Asset side loans, we, have, we, are, we are giving the loans. If we are giving the loans guarantee security exceeding the limit then you'll have to pass the sr if it is within the limit then no requirement of sr then no requirement of sr there right now whenever sr is required this we have studied earlier wherever sr is required you can take the sr by way of postal ballot right but in case if it is the opc or if it is other company having maximum 200 members then in that case postal ballot is not required right so subsection one was talking about those two layers Subsection 2, subsection 2 was talking about the limit that when SR is required, when SR is not required, right? Whenever, whenever any, whenever any loan or guarantee, whenever any loan or guarantee is given to the wholly owned subsidiary company or wherever any investment has been done in wholly owned subsidiary company, then that will be counted for the limit. Okay, that will be counted for the limit, but for that SR is not required. Okay, for that SR is not at all required. Okay, then, 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 then you have to disclose, you have to disclose in your, you have to disclose in your financial statements, etc. That uh, to whom have you given this loan to, uh, in what company have you done your investment, for what purpose have you given the guarantees, etc. Full things, full details have to be disclosed in the financial statements. Now, the most important pointer coming up here, just try to understand. We just studied that whenever the limit is exceeded, okay, we just studied that whenever the limit is exceeded, we have to pass a SR. Okay, but just try to understand here before the SR you have to pass a board resolution also. Okay, irrespective of SR, irrespective of SR you have to pass a board resolution here mandatorily. Okay, and here the board resolution has to be passed with 100% consent. That whichever directors, whatever number of directors, whatever number of directors are present in the company, all of them, all of them should say a yes. All of them should say a yes and then only your company can give the loan, when, then, then only your company can do the investments, then only your company can give the guarantee etc. Right, so first of all the approval of all the directors who are present in the meeting that is mandatory and plus if any term loan is pending before any uh, PFI then we will have to op obtain the approval of that PFI also. Okay, then there was an exception, then there was an exception, then there was an exception that Approval of PFI will not be required if your loan etc is within the limits and you have never ever done any default with the PFI. Okay, so one thing, one thing which remains common here, one thing which remains, uh, you know, uh, standard here is that you have to compulsorily pass a board resolution and if the limits are exceeded, then you will have to pass a special resolution. And whenever you are passing a board resolution, whenever you are passing a board resolution, one thing to be kept here in mind, one thing to be kept here in mind is that uh, whenever you are passing a board resolution, one thing to be kept in mind here is that uh, all the directors who are present in the meeting, all the directors who are present in the meeting, they have to make sure, they have to make sure that they give a yes. Okay, then only this particular resolution will be passed, otherwise the resolution cannot be 
passed. So board resolution is mandatory. SR will be required only when the limits are exceeded. Okay, here also since you are giving loans, since you are doing investments, etc., you have to make sure that you are receiving the minimum government yield. Okay, whatever yield you are going to get on the government securities, minimum at least that much amount you should be receiving. Otherwise, what's the purpose of doing the investments or what's the purpose of giving the loan? There would be no point in that. Okay, if you have done any default in accepting public deposits, if you have done any default in accepting public deposits, then you'll have, then you cannot give any loan, you cannot give any guarantee, you cannot give any security till you rectify your mistake of public deposits default. Okay, then all the details about this loans given, investment done, etc. This has to be maintained in form number or in the register called as form MBP to all the details will be maintained in that. Then whenever, if any particular person wants to inspect then that can be done. Extracts can be taken from that. And if any person wants to copy, then he, he can pay the fees and he can obtain the copy of that. The entire section 186, except for 186.1, this does not apply to, uh, uh, you know, insurance company. It does not apply to the banking companies. It does not apply to the investment companies. It does not apply to the housing finance companies, etc. Because for them, giving loan, giving guarantee, etc. This is in ordinary course of business. So for them 186.2 to subsection 186.10 will not be applicable for them at all. Okay, the most important pointers, the most important pointers in the last section, the most important pointers in the last section 186 was, first of all, more than two layers of investment is not allowed. Next one, next one is the limit that beyond, what is the limit of doing the investments? If the limit is exceeded, SR is required. If limit not exceeded, then limit exceeded or not exceeded, anyway, board resolution is required where the consent of all the directors should be obtained. Okay, where the approval of all the directors should be obtained. These are the most crucial points. These are the most crucial points in section number 186. Then going on to the next one, section number 187, which says investments of the company to be held in its own name. First of all, they say that since company is having a separate identity or a se company is a separate legal entity, it can hold property, asset, securities in its own name. Okay, there is no restriction in that. It can hold in its own name. It can hold in its own name. But in some cases, but in some cases, the possession goes to some other person. Okay, the possession goes to some other person does not mean that even ownership goes to the other person. Now, example, example, if the securities are held in a DMAT form, okay, if it is held in the DMAT form, then there, then there, the shares would be in the name of the DMAT, the shares would be the possession of the DMAT, etc., but we are the beneficial owner, so that is allowed. Okay, if we have taken a loan from the bank by mortgaging our property, then the property papers are with the bank till we repay the loan, then too, then too, we are still the owner of that property till the time we do not do any default, right? Say for example, if we have if we have certain investments and if we want the company, if we want the comp if we want some person, if we want some person to act as an agent to collect the uh, to make sure that all the return on this investment is getting received on time or not. I have some I've done some various investment in multiple companies. I want someone to take care of those investments. So I have given my papers of the investment to that particular company. Does not mean I've given my ownership. Okay, I have appointed that particular person only to take care of my investments. Similarly, similarly, say for example, if I wanted to transfer, if I wanted to transfer my securities, if I want to sell it off now at the best possible rate, then I can give it to the SBI, I can give it to any other banker who can sell it for me or who can sell it on behalf of me at the best possible price. So now here, even though I have given the papers to that particular person to sell it off, to sell it off, does not mean the ownership has gone to that person. Okay, so there are some cases where the possession goes, but the ownership does not. Okay, and if the shares are held in the DMAT form, if the shares are held in the depository form, then in that case, we have to maintain all the details in form number MBP3 about the securities which are kept in the DMAT form. Okay, because in DMAT, what happens is, in DMAT, what happens is the owner of the shares is actually the depository. Okay, but we are the beneficial owners. But that is absolutely allowed because that is the entire concept of the depository. Imagine even if you are having any shares in the DMAT. Okay, even if you are having any shares in the DMAT, actually the owner of the shares, they call it, on the papers they call it that owner of the shares is the depository, but you are the ultimate beneficiary owner or you are the beneficial owner of those particular shares. This was, this was about your section number, this was about your section number 187. Going on to the last important section here, that is section number 188, which talks about, which talks about your related party transaction. Okay, which talks about your related party transactions. 
now in related in related party transaction they are telling you they are telling you that in all in all there in all there are seven transactions okay in all there are seven transactions if you are doing any related party transactions if you are doing any transaction with your related party okay if you are doing any transaction with your related party which is not at influence price which is not at arms length price which is not at arms length price means 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 the transaction is done means the transaction is done with related parties at influence prices then only that will be called as a related party transaction as per section number 188 ma'am what are those seven transactions ma'am what are those seven transactions so sale purchase of goods sale purchase of property leasing of any property availing or rendering of any services appointing that appointing related party as an agent or getting appointed as an agent for related party for dealing in goods for dealing in services for dealing in property etc appointing any uh, related person to the place of profit in the company that is in the company for a remuneration for a remuneration or the last one or the last one was acting as an underwriter or appointing the related party as an underwriter right if any of these transactions are done with our related party and which is not done at arms length price then that will be treated then that will be treated as a related party transaction then that will be treated as a related party transaction as per section number 188 okay now in section number 188 they have given now in section number 188 they have given certain limits if the transaction is done within the limits then you just require the uh, then you just need to pass a board resolution okay then you just need to pass a board resolution board resolution is any way required okay board resolution is any way required for entering into a related party transaction but if the limits are exceeded then you'll have to pass an ordinary resolution okay generally what happens you know whenever the limits are exceeded we require sr but in case of section number 188 we just require the ordinary resolution ma'am can you just tell us the limit what are the limits so yes the limits are as follows for point number a and point number e that is directly doing any goods uh, transactions or appointing as an appointing that person as an agent for goods etc then if the if the amount if the transaction value total transaction value in a year with all the related parties if that is more than or equal to 10% of the turnover of the company turnover means turnover of the last year obviously turnover of the company then in that case your limit is exceeded if it touches if it touches 10% of the turnover of the company then in that case you'll have to pass an ordinary resolution okay when it comes to the property when it comes to the property dealing in property or appointing that person as an agent for dealing in property that is for point b and e it would be at least 10% of the net worth of the company okay when it comes to leasing leasing is again 10% of the turnover of the company okay that is when the transaction value between both of us when the transaction value between both of us if that is more than or equal to 10% of the turnover of the company means the limit is exceeded for point d and e for point d means availing or rendering of any services or appointing that uh, related party as an agent for these particular services again it would be at least 10% of the turnover of the company when you are appointing any related party as an uh, as a person in your office and you are paying a remuneration of more than rupees 250000 per month when you are paying a monthly remuneration of more than rupees 250000 then the limit is exceeded or whenever you are doing any underwriting transaction and the commission amount commission transaction exceeds 1% of the net worth means if these limits are touched or when these limits are exceeded then in such cases then in such cases we are required then in such cases we are required to pass an ordinary resolution if the limit is not exceeded if the limit is not exceeded then no issues if the limit is not exceeded then no issues then you can simply pass a board resolution and you can proceed with this related party transaction and just remember one more thing if the transaction is done at arms length price then it cannot be called as a related party transaction at all as per 188 okay means what are they trying to tell us here they are just trying to check they are just trying to check they are just trying to check here they are just trying to check here that uh, whether the transactions are done at influence prices if done at influence prices then only this or etc will be or br or or etc would be required right now say for example if there is any related party if there is any related party to the transaction in the company then that related party cannot vote cannot vote otherwise it would be a direct interest okay but if there is any particular company where at least 90 percent of them where at least 90 percent of the members where at least 90 percent of the members are related then in that case we do not have any option in, and in that case all of them are going to vote for that particular contract or arrangement okay similarly 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 uh, whenever you are doing any transaction whenever you are doing any transaction whenever you are doing any transaction with your wholly owned subsidiary with your wholly owned subsidiary then in that case even if the limits are exceeded you need not pass an ordinary 
resolution okay this was same just like your section number 186 when remember when you were doing any investments whenever you were doing any investments in wholly owned subsidiary or whenever you you were giving loan to your wholly owned subsidiary there also sr was not required you are also whenever whenever you are doing any so your wholly owned subsidiary is your related company right it is your related party you can just refer it from the definition section it is your related party so whenever you are doing any transaction with them whenever you are doing any transaction with them even if it is more than the limit then also then also the ordinary resolution will not be required right so now listen whenever you are doing this transaction if it is within the limits then board resolution is required if it is more than the limits if the limits are touched or if the limits are exceeded whatever be the case be it more than or equal to or be it greater than whatever is whatever was given in the first proviso then then you have you have to make sure if limits are not exceeded then board resolution is required if the limits are exceeded then special uh, then ordinary resolution will be required if you have not taken this then the contract becomes voidable okay the contract becomes voidable and you have to get it ratified either from the board if board approval was required or you have to get it ratified from the shareholders if uh, ordinary resolution was required okay and if the company suffers any losses if the company suffers any losses and if the transaction was done with the related party of our director if the transaction was done with the related party of our director then our director would be responsible for indemnifying that loss okay so this is this was this was all about this was all about your section number 188 the most crucial points the most crucial points let let me just like we have been doing for so many sections till now let me just clarify let me just clarify the most important pointers for section number 188 was first of all those seven list of the related related party transaction if we enter into those related party transaction at influence prices then it will be called as a related party transaction and board approval will be required okay if the limits are exceeded if the limits as given in the first proviso are exceeded are exceeded in a year in a year then in that case we will require the ordinary resolution okay at least remember this much at least remember this much right then going on to the last few section section number 189 189 uh and onwards all these sections are your one time read sections 189 189 talks about the registers to be maintained now here you are going to maintain a register in mbp4 which is going to contain the details about first is your related party transactions and the second thing is about the uh second thing is about the specific disclosure which you had done in section number 184 subsection 2 right 1841 general disclosure was done in mbp1 specific disclosure under 1842 is done in mbp4 entries in the register will be done okay say for example about the uh, interest the entries will be done in the register entries will be done uh, about your general disclosure about your general disclosure like i had men mentioned at that particular point of time general disclosure will be done in mbp1 and that will be done within 30 days from the date of appointment okay basically basically when you come in the company within 30 days you have to uh, fill the register in mbp1 okay when you relinquish your office then within 30 days from your relinquishment you have to again make the changes in the mbp1 that now you are going out of the company this register mbp4 in which you are containing the details about 188 and 1842 this register has to be maintained with the company this register has to be maintained with the company at its registered office again normal it can be open for inspection no issues for that uh, extracts can be taken from that no issues in that and if you want any copies then you can pay the fees and you can get the copies from there then this register has to be also opened at the agm so that anyone who comes for the agm anyone who comes for the agm that person can have an access to it and then there were two exceptions here suppose if the transaction value if the transaction if uh, if the transaction say for example a related party transaction or say for example a specific disclosure transaction if the transaction value in respect of goods etc if it does not exceed rupees 5 lakh in a year means it is a very petty transaction then even if you don't put it in the register that's okay okay even if you don't put it in the register that's okay and if the bank is doing the uh, uh, bill collection service if the bank is providing the bill collection service which is done in ordinary course of business then also then also the mention in the uh, mbp4 register is not mandatory there okay these were just two random exceptions that they have given you in the section then going on to the next section section number 190 for section number 190 they say for section number 190 they say that suppose if whenever any md or wdd gets appointed in the company your company would be having an agreement with them your company would be having an agreement with the md wdd etc so either that agreement has to be in a proper format if you have maintained it or if you have not maintained it then it has to be in a memorandum format that is in a rough contract format but 
but maintaining it in the company's register office is mandatory the contract of employment between the mdwdd and the company and this can be inspected okay copies etc cannot be taken but this can be inspected this copy of employment can be inspected right then similarly similarly next one similarly next one next one what are they trying to tell us here section number 191 which is contrary section number 191 which is contrary to section number 202 okay section number 191 which is contrary to section number 202 202 we had studied about the compensation for loss of office to so the managerial personnel this we had studied in our last to last chapter right we, this we had studied in our last to last chapter that is compensation for loss of office now that was for the managerial personnel this is for all the other directors okay this is for all the other directors let's suppose if there is any transfer of property in our company if there is any transfer of securities in our company or if there is any transfer of undertaking in the company and because of that because of that suppose if there is any change in the management okay suppose if because of that there is any change in the management then the existing directors can lose their office right the existing directors can be removed etc so ma'am when will they when they will be removed or whenever they are retiring from the company will they be eligible for any loss of office so the answer here is very diplomatic the answer here is very diplomatic what is the diplomatic answer here what is the diplomatic answer here they are telling that if it is approved okay first you have to present that your companies that your company securities are taken over that your company's property is taken over or your company's undertaking has been taken over and then if you present this fact if you present this fact before the shareholders in the general meeting if you present this fact before the shareholders in the general meeting and if the shareholders approve it okay if the shareholders approve it then in that case whatever amount they approve that much amount of compensation for loss of office can be paid to the directors okay unlike uh, section 202 in 202 they had given the amount of compensation etc here they haven't given you the amount of compensation but here they have left everything here they have left everything here they have left everything at the discretion of the shareholders in the general meeting shareholders in the general meeting they are going to identify whether the director should receive any compensation for loss of office or not okay if for that particular in that particular general meeting first of all we are going to intimate we are going to intimate the shareholders we are going to intimate the shareholders that okay to which director are we paying him why are we paying him how much amount are we paying him on what basis have we calculated the amount etc etc everything will be disclosed to the shareholders and then only the shareholders will agree that okay this this person can be paid any amount of compensation okay then after that then after that suppose if suppose if that general meeting could not be called due to want of quorum or say for example uh, you know the share the shareholders did not approve that particular compensation that no compensation can be paid and if at all you have still paid the compensation then that will be refunded back okay here we cannot waive off etc just like we studied in bell versus lever brothers etc no here whatever wrongful compensation has been paid to that director that will be recovered back from him this is what this is what we studied in section number 191 and the last two sections the last two sections section number 192 and section number 193 section number 192 talks about the non cash transaction that the company can enter into a non cash by default they say that by default they say that a company cannot enter into a non cash transaction with a director of the company or its group company etc and even vice versa cannot happen okay but but they say say for example if the director is rendering his services he is rendering his services as a, as a director but he is taking something non cash in return or vice versa something like that is happening then they say first of all they say by default no this is not allowed but this would be allowed this would be allowed if it is approved <coughs> this would be allowed if it is approved by the shareholders in the general meeting by way of a resolution so by default it's not allowed but if the shareholders approve it by way of a resolution in the general meeting then no problem it will be allowed and this transaction will have to be valued by a registered valuer okay this transaction will have to be valued by a registered valuer because 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 here the prices here the prices can be influenced then going on to the last section going on to the last section of the chapter section number 193 193 where they say that say for example say for example uh, this is mainly applicable for that opc okay this is mainly applicable for that opc what are they trying to tell us here is suppose if there is a contract suppose if there is a contract between opc and the sole member okay suppose if there is a contract between the opc and the sole member this sole member is also one of the director of the company the uh, director of this particular opc means that own that single person he is the member of the company also he is a sole member of the company he is also the director of the company 
and plus the opc was floated by him then in that case if there is any particular contract between these people if there is any particular contract between these people then whatever is the contract a rough rough memorandum a rough memorandum has to be recorded in the minutes of the first board meeting okay a rough a rough uh, memorandum of this particular contract has to be recorded in this particular uh, minutes of the first board meeting and plus this has to be filed with the roc plus this has to be filed with the roc see because this is a opc okay he is a sole member of the company there are no other shareholders so who is going to keep a check so the check has to be kept by the roc so whenever you enter into whenever it is recorded in the minutes whenever see first you will enter into the contract then it is recorded in the minutes etc simultaneously it is recorded once it is approved by the board it is recorded in the minutes once it is recorded in the minutes then you have to go and intimate about this particular fact to the roc within a period of 15 days okay once it is put in the minutes just like in the first point they had told that you have to put it in the minutes of the board meeting right once it is put in the minutes of the board meeting after that within a period of 15 days you have to go and intimate it to the roc that so and so contract has been entered into between the opc and the sole member i had given you one example that a uh, sole member can sell his own personal asset to the opc even this is a contract even this is a contract between the opc and the sole member and if it is not in the ordinary course of business then yes this can become a questionable transaction by other directors so they say that please record it in the minutes of the board meeting and then go and intimate it to the ROC within a period of fifteen days. Right, this was section number one hundred and ninety-three and one ninety-four and one ninety-five, which was pertaining to your insider trading. These sections, these two sections were omitted, not from our syllabus, but from the Companies Act itself. Section number one ninety-four and section number one ninety-five, which pertains to your insider trading. These sections were omitted. These sections were omitted, and with this. with this we are done with this we are done with the revision of the entire board meetings chapter 